up for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile division. You get a call from a high school principal. A young boy has caused a near riot in his classroom. Your job? Investigate. Here's what the nation's press has had to say about king-size Chesterfields. U.S. Tobacco Journal says, Boston dealers and jobbers reported this new companion of the regular size is sweeping the market in sales, and stocks cannot be replaced fast enough. The Wall Street Journal said, A wholesaler says the problem isn't selling them. It's getting enough to meet the demand. Dealers all over the country tell us no product they ever handled has grown so fast in so short a time as king-size Chesterfields. King-size cigarettes give you quantity. But only Chesterfield king-size gives you quantity plus quality. Premium quality. Chesterfield king-size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. In fact, the only difference between Chesterfield king-size and Chesterfield regular is that the king-size is larger, contains more of these same tobaccos, enough to give you a 21% longer smoke, yet costs very little more. So remember, Chesterfield is the first to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. Buy them either way you like them. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, October 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile division. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Stein. My name is Friday. It was 1.47 p.m. when we got to Adams High School. Chemistry class. You the police? Yes, sir. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I'm John Lane. This is my class. What little there is left of it. Have you seen Mr. Barlow? Yes, sir. We talked to him when we came in. I think he's in the clinic now. He said you could give us the stories, all right? It was the Lambert boy. He came into class about five minutes late. Uh-huh. We were just starting the lecture on analysis. I told Douglas to take his seat. He said something I couldn't hear, but he went back to his place, and I went on with the lecture. Mm-hmm. I guess it was about ten minutes later that the commotion started. The first thing I knew about it, Larry McLean started to yell at Lambert, said something about keeping his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Then Lambert said something about McLean minding his own business. I started off the platform to quiet things down. By the time I got to Douglas, he'd hit McLean. Well, after that, it's all a little confused. Flying apparatus, chemicals being thrown all over the place, glass breaking. The whole class seemed to explode. Well, were the other members of the class fighting, or was it just the two boys? It seemed like the whole class was fighting. At the time, it seemed like the whole school was in the room, all throwing things. Mm-hmm. Finally, I got the Lambert boy aside, and then the fight seemed to stop. In the meantime, he'd thrown a bottle of sulfuric acid at McLean, burned his face and his chest... The ambulance took him to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and a nurse here gave him first aid. Well, do you have any idea what started the argument here? No, I'm not sure. As I got it later, it seems that Douglas made some remark about a young girl working next to him. I didn't hear it, but I gathered that it was a pretty filthy statement. McLean heard it, and that's when he told Douglas to keep his mouth closed. Mm-hmm. Lambert is known as a sort of troublemaker, then, is he? Yes, and it's so hard to understand. Sir? Well, up until just lately, I'd say the last two months or so, he was a model student. He had a straight-A average. I wonder if we could see the boy. I guess so. There isn't anything much I can do here. Oh, terrible. It'll be a couple of weeks before I can hold a class in here again. It's terrible. Yes, sir. The clinic's down here. Have you any idea what might have caused this change in the Lambert boy? Well, I have my own suspicions, but he's only 15. It's hard to believe. What's that? Sir? When he came into class today, I think he was drunk. Oh, why do you say that? 
I noticed that when he came into the room, he wasn't very steady on his feet. It had to be something like that to make him do this. Then, too, when I grabbed him when they were fighting, mm-hmm. I thought I smelled liquor on his... Oh, we go in here. All right. Here's the boy. Douglas? Yes, sir. These men would like to talk to you. Yes, sir. They're from the police. Mr. Friday and this is Mr. Smith. Hello? How are you? Sit down, sir. Yes, sir. How's Larry? I don't know. They took him to the hospital. If you don't mind, Mr. Friday, I'll check with the nurse, see how badly Larry was hurt. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Now, son, you want to tell us what this is all about? There's not much to tell. Larry and me got in a fight. Mm -hmm. Well, what started the fight, son? I don't know. He just wanted to cause trouble. Him and me never have gotten along. Always had trouble. You been drinking, Doug? Why do you ask that? Because I want to know. Have you been drinking? How about it, boy? No. Where would I get something to drink? Well, now, something's a little wrong here, son. According to what Mr. Lane tells us, looks like you might have been drunk when the fight started. He tells us that you said something to a young girl in the class. That's what started the whole thing. You know he's lying? Is he? Sure. He's on Larry's side. The two of them are real thick. That's not what he told us, Doug. From what he said, he's pretty fond of you. Said he couldn't figure out what happened to you lately. Well, he's okay, but why does he say I was loaded? That's a stupid thing to say. Yeah, especially if you weren't. I'll tell you what, Doug. Hmm? Let's get a traffic investigation car over here and take a toxometer test, huh, just to be sure. Why? What'll that prove? It'll straighten it out once and for all, whether you're drunk or not. How about it, boy? Shall I call the car? Doug? No, you don't have to do that. I had a couple of drinks. Nothing serious, though. Just a couple of drinks. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Where'd you get the liquor, son? I don't remember. No, this won't work, boy. We'll find out. You know that. Well, I don't see what difference it's going to make where I got it. I've been drinking a couple of years. I know how to handle it. I know what I'm doing. Mr. Friday? Yes, sir? You see him in a minute. Well, sure. What's going on? Something wrong with Larry? I don't know, son. I thought he was okay when they took him to the hospital. Mm-hmm. The nurse said she took care of it. They said he was going to be okay. All right, boy. Let's go. Where are you taking me? We want to talk to you downtown. Something has gone wrong, hasn't it? Something's wrong with Larry. He's dead. No, son. Larry's all right. He's burned, but he's going to be all right. You're lying. I know. You want to take me to jail. No, that's not true, son. We just want to find out where you got the liquor. Yeah. Well, I haven't done anything. A couple of drinks, that's all. What's the harm in that? Come on, son. You've got a lot to explain. Okay, take me in. Put me in jail. I don't care what happens. Yeah, you've already proved that. 2.26 p.m. Frank and I talked to Charles Barlow, the vice principal of the school. He told us the same story that we'd gotten from John Lane. He said that until a few months before, Douglas Lambert had been a model student. He was above average in his classwork and took part in all school activities. Suddenly, and without apparent reason, he had become the number one troublemaker in his class. His attendance record became one of the worst, and his attitude toward his teachers was arrogant and discourteous. The principal told us the same attitude was being displayed by other students in the school. We notified Mrs. Lambert that we were taking him to Georgia Street Juvenile for questioning. We filled in Captain Stein on the developments, and then Frank and I questioned the Lambert boy. He was sullen and uncooperative. I don't know what you want with me. A little fight, that's all it was. Why are you guys trying to make something big out of it? You've already done that, Doug. Maybe you don't know what you've really done. Maybe we ought to fill you in on a few things. That might not be such a bad idea. Tell me how I'm a criminal. Tell me I was a bad boy. Go ahead, tell me. Don't get smart, son. What do you want me to do? Sit here and listen to you guys yak at me? You expect me just to sit here and let you guys tie a rap on me that I haven't got coming? You got one thing on me. I had a couple of drinks, that's all. A couple of drinks. No harm in that. I don't feel so good. Why don't you guys leave me alone? I got a headache. Larry McLean's got more than a headache. So the kid shouldn't have started anything he couldn't finish. He wanted to be a big man in front of the class. He was. Now he's hurt and he's trying to blame me. It won't work, cop, and you know it. That's enough of that. I'm a minor. You can't touch me. That's the trouble with you, kid. You think because you're under 18, the laws don't mean you. You can't touch me and you know it. Don't worry, Doug. Nobody's going to touch you, but let me tell you a couple of things. You sit here and figure you're a big man, a real tough kid. You don't have to tell me. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm getting sick and tired of having kids like you waltz around the streets, your minds and hands filthy, bragging about what big men you are. You do what you want. You don't care about what it means to the people around you. How you hurt them doesn't matter. Everything's fine until you do something wrong and we nail you. Right away you start screaming minor that you're a juvenile, just a kid acting normal. You steal a car for a joyride. An officer starts after you. You don't care who gets in front of the car as long as you get away. You don't let anybody stand in your way. Men, women, kids, they're all the same to you. Run them down. Show them that you're just a healthy kid out for some fun. After all, you're just a kid. The laws weren't meant for you. You're different. Well, there's another kid lying in a hospital right now. He's got real trouble. He got in your way. He didn't feel that you had any special rights. Be a big man, Doug. You go tell him that you knew what you were doing when you threw that acid at him. You tell him that you were just having a little carefree fun. Tell him that you know how to handle liquor. 
Tell him that he's going to spend a long time with a plastic surgeon because you're just a kid. You tell him that his face is going to be like that because you're just a normal, healthy, growing boy. I hope you're real proud of yourself. I hope you feel good. You've burned it right into your brain. There isn't any place you can go to get away from it. All right, boy, let's go. Wait a minute, Mr. Friday. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I acted like that. All right, you want to try to make things right with Larry? You want to help us out on this thing? Yeah, I guess so. Where do I start? Where'd you get the liquor? A place near school. Kids call it Sam's Club. What's the address? I don't know. I'll show you the place. You say it's a club? Well, sort of. You have to know the ropes before you can get in the place. What do you mean, the ropes? Well, they only let kids in. You ring the bell to the house, and then when they answer, you stand there with a $5 bill in your hand. Mm -hmm. That way they know you're okay. Who is this Sam? I don't know his last name. The kids just call him Sam. He run this place all by himself? No, there's his wife, Inez. She's usually around. Just these two around the place, I know. Yeah, that's all I know about. It always seemed to me that Inez was really the brain. She was always telling Sam what to do. Hmm. How'd you find out about this place, Doug? One of the kids at school told me about it. He took me there one night. Then after he introduced me to Sam and Inez, I started to go there by myself. What's it like inside? They have a bar or anything like that? Oh, yeah. You walk into the living room and there's a big bar along the right wall. All chrome and leopard skin. Real nice. There's a few tables around and a record player. Mm. They sell anything else in this place besides liquor? I don't think I know what you mean. You know what we mean, Doug. Yeah, I guess I do. Well, how about it? Well, yeah, you can buy tea if you want it. Mm -hmm. This $5 routine, what happens to it? Well, drinks are six bits a piece. Sticks are a buck and a half. If you want to give them the five as you come in, you can have as much as you want. Otherwise, you pay for each thing as you get it. You ever smoke marijuana? Well, almost all the kids there do. How about you? If you don't, the other kids call you a coward. Well, you still haven't answered the question. Yeah, I've smoked it a couple of times. Can you give us the names of the other youngsters who go to this place? Well, wait a minute. I'll help all I can, but I'm not going to be a squealer. I don't think it's squealing, Doug. Yeah, well, you don't have to give the names. Why not look at it this way, boy? You got trouble because of this Sam and Inez. Now, the same thing could happen to one of the other kids that go to this place. You want that to happen? No, but... Well, the best way to see that it doesn't is to tell us all you know about the place. Isn't that right? I guess so. I'll give you the names. Do they allow girls in this place, too? Yeah, as long as you know the $5 bill gimmick, anybody can get in. They allow adults? No, if they figure you're over 18, they won't let you in. Especially at the Saturday night parties. What kind of those? Every Saturday night, Sam and Inez throw a party. For five bucks, you get all you want to drink and smoke. Sam told me once it's a good business. Makes for better customer relations. Mm -hmm. You ever see any other narcotics on the premises? I've never actually seen any myself. I've heard that if Sam or Inez know you real well, you can get a pop of heroin. But like I said, I've never seen it myself. Most of the kids that I know, the ones from school, just go there for drinks. Anything else you think we ought to know? No, nothing that I can think of. How about these two? Either of them drive a car? Yeah, Sam has a little Nash Rambler, dark green. Once in a while, when we stay over at lunchtime or when we're late getting home, he drives us home or back to school. All right, Doug. Your mother ought to be here by now. If we need your help in getting Sam and Inez, we can count on it, huh? Yeah, I'll help all I can. Okay, son. Let's go. Just say, Sergeant. Yeah? I'm sure sorry about the way I acted. Really made a fool of myself. I hope you'll forgive me. That's all right. But you'd think there'd be an easier way, wouldn't you? What's that, son? To grow up. We checked the names Sam and Inez through R&I and, and came up with a Sam and Inez Bailey. Both of them had long records for contributing to the delinquency of minors. Both had served time in the county jail. Douglas Lambert was shown mugshots of the couple and identified them as the owners and operators of Sam's Club. We checked with Captain Stein about picking them up, and it was agreed that the best way would be to catch them in the act of selling liquor and narcotics to juveniles. We talked to the Lambert boy, and he told us that it was the custom of the Baileys to hold a party every Saturday night. He told us that most of the youngsters who frequented the place would be there at that time. He put in a call to the house, but there was no answer. 6.15 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the place. It was a small cottage on the back of the lot. The landlord occupied the house in front. We rang the bell to the manager's house. Yeah? Mr. Halsey? Yeah? Police officer, sir. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? I'm Mr. Halsey. Want to come in? Well, it might be better, sir. We'd like to talk to you about the Baileys. Worst tenants I ever had. I knew they'd end up with the police. Why do you say that, sir? Well, I just do, that's all. They got a lease on the house. And if I could figure a way to get them out, I sure would. They're always causing trouble. Uh, all those kids. Yes, sir. Do you have any idea where they are now? Why, are you going to arrest them? I hope so. Maybe I can break the lease that way. You know where they might be now, sir? No, I don't know. I shoved off this afternoon. They didn't say where they was going. They just left. I wonder if you could let us see their house, sir. Why? Well, we'd like to look it over. Sorry. 
Well, I don't know. What, what do you want for? We think they're selling liquor to miners. Yes, they do a thing like that. The noise they made, the neighbors on both sides have been screaming. Can you let us into their house? You just bet I can. Wait, I'll get the key. Mm-hmm. Here's some place. But, uh, put in one of those little key rings. You know the kind with the rabbit's foot? Yes, sir. Sorry to keep your officers waiting. I know I'm always away. If you want something, you, you can always lay your hand right on it. And then when you're looking for it... Oh, here it is. See, the rabbit foot. Yes, sir. Well, you can go out the back door this way. All right, fine. Well, uh, what are you looking for? What do you figure you'll find back there? We're not sure, sir. Frank. Yeah, Joe. You want to stay out here and let us know if they come back? Yeah, I'll wait in front of the house. All right. You know, it's funny about them. What's that, sir? Well, when they first moved in, they said they wanted the locks on the door changed. I told them it would be okay, but they'd have to give me a key to the place. I had quite a ruckus about it, but I stood in my ground. They wasn't going to buffalo me, no, sir. Here, I'll, I'll get the lock. All right. Okay. Gee, smells like they haven't had a window open in a year, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look what they've done to this room. They built a bar and everything. You sure were right about them. I think I can break the lease on this, I'm pretty sure. It says in the contract that they can't do any building without my permission, and I certainly didn't give them any okay on this. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. This is the dining room? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Just pull those doors back. What's that smell, Sergeant? I'm not sure, but I think it might be narcotics. Drugs. I knew it. I knew it all along. Oh, just wait till you get back. I'm really going to tell them. I really am. Rather you didn't do that, sir. What? Rather you didn't let them know that we were in here, that you know anything about this. Well, why? You're going to arrest them, aren't you? You're not going to let them get away with this. No, sir, but we understand they've got a party planned here tomorrow night. If we wait until then, we can make a charge stick. Oh, you mean they're going to have a drunken brawl? The kids here smoking marijuana, taking heroin and stuff like that? Well, we're not going to let them go that far, sir. We're going to need your cooperation here, Mr. Halsey. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, sir, we want to install listening equipment in here. We'd like to use your house. You mean you're going to bug the place? Well, yes, sir. We like to put in microphones. Well, will it hurt the property? I mean, would you have to put nails in the walls, you know, stuff like that? No, sir. I don't think so. Oh. Well, then, then you can do it. Yes, sir. I want to help, Sergeant. That's the trouble with people nowadays. You know, they don't want to help. You just go right ahead and put your, put your microphones in just as long as you don't have to nail anything in the walls. <sighs> all right, sir. If we could go back to your house, I'd like to use the phone if it's all right. You bet. Closing that so they won't know anybody's been here, huh? Yes, sir. Uh Uh-huh. Don't guess if I leave any fingerprints on the door, it'll hurt. No, sir, I don't think it will. No. Can't be too careful, though, you. But then I guess you know all about things like that. Yes, sir. I'll go around front and get my partner. Yeah, sure thing. You fellas all work in teams like this? Yes, sir, most of the time. Well, I never knew that before. Do you have any idea at all where the Baileys might have gone? Did they give you any indication at all, sir? No. No, I saw them leave this afternoon. Just got in the car and left. Did they take any luggage with them? Suitcases, would you know? Not that I could see, no. Uh-huh. Ah, you find anything? Yeah, the bar's in the living room. Oh, then what the Lambert kid said was true, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Tell them about the dope in the dining room. How you open the door and smell the fumes. I want it? Yeah, it smelled like that. <laughs> find it? No, I didn't go over the place too good. I thought if we were going to wire the place, we'd better get on it. Yeah. If we could just use your phone, sir? Oh, yeah, you bet. Come on in. Right there, on the table in the hall. Oh, thank you, sir. Isn't a toll call, is it? No, sir. Well, of course, not to make any difference. Just thought I'd ask. Yes, sir. You think you're uh, still getting one of those detective magazines? Well, I don't know, sir. We've got nothing to do with that. Well, you know, of course, I didn't figure that you did, but if it, if it does, I hope they spell my name right. It's S-E-Y. Uh-huh. Yeah. Some people forget the E, you see. Uh-huh. Spell it with just a Y. 2838, please. Asdale, it's Joe Friday. I want to install a dictograph at 825 North Lucerne. Yeah, 825 North. Mm-hmm. Right away. Yeah, well, you know better than I do. When you see the place, you can figure it. Yeah, the house in the front of the lot. What? Oh, maybe 30, 35 yards? Yeah, okay. Right away. Yeah, good. We'll be in the house in front. Yeah, all right, we'll see you then. All set? Yeah, Asdale's coming right out. Good. You say, Sergeant... Yes, sir? I just uh, happened to think of something. Might not mean anything. What's that, sir? The other day, I think it was Monday. Yes, yes, I'm sure it was Monday because I I just come back from the laundry. You know, I always pick up my stuff on Monday. Yes, sir. Well, when I came back, I met Mr. Bailey. He was 
putting around with the car. I asked him if he was going to take a trip. He said no, but he said he might get out of town for a little bit. I asked him if I knew anything about the roads. What roads, Mr. Halsey? Down to Mexico. <laughs> are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. And now, a report every smoker should hear. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report ever published about any cigarette. And it applies only to Chesterfield. A responsible consulting organization has reported the results of a continuing study by a competent medical specialist and his staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfield cigarettes. A group of people from various walks of life was organized to smoke only Chesterfields. For six months, this group of men and women smoked their normal amount of Chesterfields, 10 to 40 a day. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields continually from 1 to 30 years, for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and at the end of the six-month period, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including X-ray pictures, by the medical specialist and his assistants. The examination covered the sinuses, as well as the nose, ears, and throat. The medical specialist, after a thorough examination of every member of the group, stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Remember this Chesterfield report. It's the first such report ever published about any cigarette. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. Buy Chesterfield either way you like them, regular or king size. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. <laughs> The men from the crime lab arrived and installed the listening equipment. A stakeout was placed on the house, but the Baileys failed to return that night. At 8.46 a.m. Saturday morning, the men covering the house called to say that the Baileys had just driven in. Frank and I got in touch with Douglas Lambert and his parents. With their permission, we laid out the plan for that night. It was agreed that the boy would arrive at the house at about 8.30 p.m. When the other youngsters had been served drinks, he would give us a signal by starting in to cough. When we came into the house, he would try to secure as many of the drinks as possible for evidence. We told him that there would be officers all around the house and that at no time was he to place himself in jeopardy with Sam, Inez, or any of the other youngsters. 7.30 p.m., Frank and I took up our positions in the back bedroom of the owner's house, turned on the dictograph, and waited. The Baileys were discussing the party. Sam was talking about how he watered the whiskey. At 8.27 p.m., four youngsters arrived. They rang the doorbell, and when Sam opened the door, they displayed the required bill. He nodded and ushered them into the living room. Well, they did a good job in there, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Really hear it. Mm-hmm. Lambert boys should be here pretty quick. Yeah. Doesn't sound like they're starting anything in there yet, does it? No. How long do you figure we wait before we go in? Well, as soon as he starts to cough. You check with the other men? Yeah, Turner and Brown are covering the back of the place. Oh. Lindsay and Carter and a couple of police women are parked down the street. You can see the car down there. Yeah. Wait a minute. Huh? Looks like the Lambert kid now coming up the walk. Yeah, it is. I sure hope everything goes all right. All right. Let's turn it up a little more, huh? Is that better? Yeah. I'll get it, honey. Change that record, will you? I heard it four times. Yeah. Oh, hi, Doug. Come on in. Thanks, huh? Wasn't sure you'd be here tonight. What made you figure that? You know, I wouldn't miss one of these. I just figured you might have gotten a little bit of trouble with everything. No, it's all right now. Yeah, well, take it easy tonight, huh? Sure, Sam. Good night. Doug Lambert. Hi, Doug. You have any trouble with that McLean kid? No, I was telling Sam the cops talked to me for a while. They didn't have anything on me, so they had to let me go. You didn't tell him anything about this place, did you? Well, of course not. You know I wouldn't do that. He wouldn't, I As I told you, Doug's all right. We can trust him. Ah, yeah, this thing's worrying me. The cops get wise to this place, and we really got problems. Oh, honey, I tell you, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's get on with the sociable. What do you have, Doug? Whiskey, I guess. Good deal. You want a stick? Got some fresh stuff in real good. Yeah, sure. That's my boy. You know, Doug, I like you. You're a good kid. Some of the other guys come in here. I guess Inez is right about them. They're jerks, but well, I feel I can trust you. Oh, excuse me. Well, you've got to fix the other kids up. Okay, with the be? <coughs> <coughs> well, kid, you got something in your throat? I don't know. I just started the Come call. on, Mike.
door's locked. Let's hit it. What's going on? Uh, who are you guys? Police officers. You're under arrest. What for? What are you trying to pull? Hold it, everybody. Right where you are. Did you hear it all, Sergeant? Yeah, Doug, we did. Hear what? You in on this, Doug? I told you not to trust any of them. I told you, but you wouldn't listen. You want to kill the phonograph, Frank? I got Where do you get the marijuana, Doug? Out of that drawer. There in back of the bar. Yeah. There's nothing there. Right here, Doug? It was way in the back. Shut up, you. Al, what about these, Sam? I don't know what you're talking about. I never saw those before. All right, mister, let's go. I'll get Turner and Brown. They can take care of the kids. Right. You and your ideas. I told you we shouldn't have come back. I told you. Oh, knock it off. Shut your mouth, will you? I told you last night we should have kept driving, but oh, no, you figure we got a sweet racket here. You don't want to change it. It's good, you said. Yeah? How does it look now? Look, I'm telling you, take it easy. All right, let's go, huh? It's the way it is, Sergeant. Try to make a living for a woman, make things nice. The first time something goes wrong, she starts to squawk. Never failed. You're riding high, everything's fine. Him and his living, always trying to build something up, always trying to figure out a way to beat the game. One big deal, one big thing to set him up for good. Yeah, well, I think he made it this time. Let's go. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, as you know on Dragnet, we've always tried to emphasize the importance of facts. And when we talk to you about Chesterfield, we give you the facts. You heard the report George Fenneman read earlier. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. That's the first such report ever published about any cigarette. Remember that report and make Chesterfield your cigarette. Get them, regular or king size. Chesterfield, the best possible smoke. Much milder. <laughs> Samuel G. Bailey and Inez R. Bailey were filed on under the Health and Safety Code, Section 11,500, Possession and Sale of Narcotics, and found guilty on one count. They were found guilty on two counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Violation of Section 11,500 of the Health and Safety Code is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than five years or imprisonment in the county jail. Contributing to the delinquency of a minor is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not more than one year. The boy, Douglas Lambert, was made a ward of the juvenile court. Ladies and gentlemen, where the community chest is at work, red feather services like youth programs and clinics, hospitals, and the USO give direct help to two families out of five every year. And indirectly, everybody benefits. Because community chest services make America's cities and towns healthier, happier places to live. So give generously to your community chest. Pledge enough for all the community campaigns that are united under the Red Feather banner. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Sam Edwards, Vic Rodman. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Tomorrow, sound off for Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. 
Naval intelligence tells you that two Marines have been picked up by the shore patrol. They are reported sick. One is in critical condition. Foul play is suspected. Your job? Investigate. Here's what leading tobacco publications have had to say about king-size Chesterfield. U.S. Tobacco Journal, Atlanta, Georgia. Chesterfield king-size is going strong. One jobber reordered twice this week in addition to his regular order. And the Chicago Weekly, Tobacco Leaf, reports more calls for Chesterfield king-size cigarettes than for most brands being marketed. The reason for king-size Chesterfield's amazing success is this. All king-size cigarettes give you quantity, but only Chesterfield king-size gives you quantity plus quality, premium quality. That means Chesterfield king-size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. The same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. Enough more of this tobacco to give you over a fifth longer smoke. So remember... Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Buy them either way you like them. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, July 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. It was 7.58 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Morning, Joe. Hi. Just get in? Yeah. Anything in the book? I'm looking. What's the matter? Are you hacked about something? No, no. Why do you ask that? Well, figures you're sore about something. What do you do, take a sour pill? You keep this up, you won't be asked to post toothpaste ads. Well, now, that's funny. All right, Joe. Tell your Uncle Dudley. What's the matter? Not if that court deal yesterday was miserable. Mm. Thing you and Gaffney been working out? Yeah, the white glove band. It came up while you were out on vacation. Spent over a month on it. Covered it from every angle. Yeah. It looked like we had the guy any way he turned. We had an idea how much he'd taken on each job. Lee thought he traced him on every movie made on each of the deals. We figured we really had the guy. DA's office thought so, too. They quit him? Yeah. Let him walk right out. Twelve men, good and true. Let that cheap hoodlum walk right out on the street to free man. Well, that's the way it goes sometimes. Mm. Is there Mr. Friday here? Yes, sir. I'm Friday. Is something I can do for you? Well, I'm Richard Houston, Naval Intelligence. Deputy Chief Brown directed me to you. I see. Well, it's my partner, Frank Smith. Lieutenant Houston. Hello, Hello Houston. Smith. Why, sit down, sir. What is it we can do for you? Well, we got a weird one. That's why we thought your department ought to be in on it. About all I can tell you is just the skeleton of the thing. We don't know all the details. We haven't gone into it completely yet. We figured you fellas would like to be in on it from the beginning. Looks like it's going to be a police investigation. Yes, sir. To begin, I should go back three weeks ago and tell you the story as near as we've been able to reconstruct it. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Well, a couple of Marines left the base. They'd just gotten back from Korea, both on a 48-hour pass. We figured they came up here to L.A., they had a lot of back pay in their pockets. We don't know where they started, but they ended up in a cheap hotel. We got a call from the shore patrol early Monday morning. They'd gotten a complaint that the two boys were causing a disturbance in the hotel. They picked them up and found they both were in a pretty bad way. They had them shipped to the naval hospital down at Long Beach. By the time they got there, they were really rocky. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but I don't quite see just how we're connected with this. Well, I'm getting to that. I'm sorry. All right, I'm a little long-winded. Anyway, last night, the boys had been AWOL for over two weeks. They were brought into the hospital, like I said. Doctors did what they could, but it was too late to help. One of the boys died late last night. We're not sure about the other one. That's where you come in, sir. They were both poisoned. Nine oh six a.m. Frank and I talked with Captain Lorman, then we checked out a trip car and left for Long Beach. When we got there, we talked with a doctor in charge. He told us that it would be later that night before the boy would be completely out of danger. He said, however, that we could talk to him if we phrased our questions so that the answers could be kept fairly brief. We looked over the boy's record. His full name was Jack Wayne Walker, age 24. He'd enlisted in the Marine Corps on January 14, 1950. He'd spent almost a year in the Far East, and his service record had been good until this time. The record of the victim, PFC Edward Monahan, was pretty much the same. The boys had both come from the same town in Arkansas. The date of their enlistment was the same. 
they'd served overseas the same time. At 3.48 p.m., the doctor ushered us into Jack Walker's room. Who are you? Police officers, Jack. We'd like to talk to you. Well, what's it about? I haven't done anything. At least I don't think I did. No, it's not that. We'd like to find out what happened while you were up in L.A. Well, I killed my buddy up there. That's what happened. You heard about that, didn't you? Yes, we did. That's what we want to talk to you about. Poor Ed. Year in Korea. Guys taking pot shots at us. Cold, mud. And we got to come back here to get it. I didn't trust that little crumb. I knew we shouldn't have had anything to do with it. Well, you shouldn't have trusted who, Jack? Stubby. You know the rest of his name? No, just Stubby. I just can't believe it about Ed. We shoved off for L.A. going to have a last fling. Ed was getting married as soon as we got home. All right, if you could just start right at the beginning. Oh, sure. Well, first, we both had a 48-hour pass. We figured to go to L.A., like I said, for last fling. A few drinks, look at some of the lights, have a little fun. Sort of a bachelor party for Ed before he got hit, you mm-hmm. know? Well, we pulled into town. Let's see, uh, I think it was Saturday morning. Uh, a couple of buddies told us about a joint up there where we could have some fun. Yeah. Well, we head up there, and nice little place that hour of the morning, I guess about... Uh, 10, 10.30. Well, we start in to drink. It gets pretty foggy after that. Like little parts in a jigsaw, you know. You sort of see a little bit of everything, but the whole picture ain't there. Yeah. Well, I remember we hung around the place for two days, and then it all really goes black. The next thing I remember, we woke up in some flea bag. I remember looking at the calendar on the wall. We was already a couple days AWOL. Ed and I talked about what we should do. Mm-hmm. And then we... Get to trying to think up an excuse for the CO for being AWOL. Well, with our CO ain't easy. He's had experts try it. Ed says he figured out something, so we start for the bus depot, get back to base. On the way, we pass this bar, and Ed says, well, maybe we ought to stop and have one more for the road, so we do. And I don't remember much for a couple more days. Mm-hmm. And I remember once we stopped and watched a guy get tattooed. Ed and I got talking about it, you know, whether or not we should have it done. Finally, figure it was kind of kid stuff, so we didn't. I remember that because it was right after we left the tattoo place, went to this bar, we met Stubby. Well, this is the fellow that you were talking about? Yeah, it's him. And you met him in a bar? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Ed and I were sitting there trying to figure out what was going to do, you know. We were pretty broke by this time, and then two weeks, over two weeks, they were all. Anyway, he sliced it, we had big trouble. Yeah. Well, we walked into this place. It was about 4.35 in the afternoon. At least near as I can tell, that's about what time it was, Uh, whole deal gets kind of foggy. We sat down at this bar and ordered a drink and just sat in there minding our own business trying to figure what we ought to do. And then this stubby joker comes up, sits down next to Ed, brings his drink with him. He was in the bar when you came in, is that right? Yeah, well, at least I think so. I didn't pay much attention, but he had a drink when he came up to Ed and me. Yeah, go ahead. Well, he got to talking about the core, and next thing we know, he's setting up the drink. Mm-hmm. The way we was fixed, as long as he wanted to buy, we wasn't going to argue. Mm-hmm. Did they seem to know this stubby in the bar? Yeah, the girl that waits on tables called him my name. All right, you want to go ahead? Yeah, well, this stubby kept going on about how he liked the core and how he'd won a whole flock of citations in Korea. Told us all about the time he'd spent in Japan. First, we thought he was just throwing a bunch of coconuts at us, but we'd ask him about places in Korea and things you could only know if you was there. He'd come up with the answers all right, but... Even with all that, there was something that just didn't ring true with it. Yeah. Anyway, long about 8 or 8.30 that night, Stubby got in a thrash with the bartender, something about the price of the drink, so he suggested we go up to his place and get a jug, you know, and drink up there. Well, I wasn't too hot for the idea, but Ed said we had nothing to lose. And we didn't have a sack for the night, and there wasn't much dough left, so we shoved off with him. Where did Stubby live? A hotel down on 5th. I'll tell you how to find the place. Same place you were picked up in? Yeah. We got the address then. Oh, okay. Well, what happened when you got Stubby's room? Well, we cracked the jug, sat around drinking for a while, and then Ed and I went to sleep. Mm-hmm. I tell you, the next morning we had the biggest hangovers in the entire United States and Canada, both of us. We felt miserable. Ed started beefing about the cheap booze Stubby had rung in on us. That's when he tried to tout us on them pills. What pills are those? Oh, them things supposed to relieve hangovers. Oh, you mean the kind they sell in drugstores? Oh, no, not them. Uh, Stubby told us about that one. Uh, he'd come back to the States. He'd stood some duty in the hospital and said that while he was there, he got them pills. Said there was a special prescription that they was great for head shrinking. He wanted us to try them. Well, did you? Well, no, not right away. He kept after us, though, kidding us about being big, tough Marines with a hangover. And then he took one of the pills, leastwise we thought he did. So Ed and I figured then we didn't have anything to lose. You took one of these hangover pills then, did you? Yeah, we both did. Mm-hmm. What happened then? Well, nothing right away. Stubby said take a little time for it to take effect. 
We got up and started to get dressed. And Ed and I thought we'd better get back to the base, you know. We'd probably be in enough trouble as it was without worrying about a hangover. Yeah. And you left the room? No, we was just getting our stuff together and Ed took sick. Said he had an awful pain in his stomach, like a cramp, you know. And we asked Stubby if the pill could have caused it. He said no. It must have been the booze. Yeah. Well, right about then, I was getting ready to mop up the place with this Stubby. I figured sure he'd given us a Mickey. I couldn't figure why, though. And then it hit me. That pill, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Real bad cramps in my stomach. I got real dizzy. The room started to go around. And we asked the Stubby to call a doctor, and that's when we knew he was really in trouble. How's that? Well, we knew then he was nuts off his trolley. And neither of us could walk. Ed doubled up and passed out, and I could hardly keep awake. We both just lay there on the floor. I kept asking this bum to get us a medic. Mm-hmm. Did he? No, he just stood there and laughed at us. Laughed like a crazy fool. He kept saying we was big, strong Marines. We should be able to take a little stomach ache without running to do a doctor. At no time did he make any attempt to get your medical help? No, no it's just like I said, he just stood there and laughed at us. Then he got real mean. Got crazy leer on his face. Said he'd show us that he'd fix us up good for what we'd done. Well, what do you mean by that? I don't know. All I thought about was getting Ed and me to a doc. About this time, I didn't much care what the little screwball did. And then he really started hopping on how he's getting even with us. I tried to get at him. I'd have killed him if I could have. I, I tried to get at him, but I fell and went out, I guess. And that's when he said that thing about that we wouldn't be the last ones he'd get. What? Huh? Well, he said like this, you guys are the first, just the first. But there's going to be more, a lot more. <laughs> continued to talk to Jack Walker. He gave us a complete description of the man he'd known as Stubby. And going over the story again with him, there were a few changes in it, but none that couldn't be accounted for by his condition. We got the address of the bar where he'd met Stubby. We checked with the doctor, and he told us that both boys had been given a powerful corrosive poison. He went on to say that it was a miracle that Jack Walker was still alive. 9.26 p.m. Frank and I drove back to Los Angeles. We checked into the office and ran the name Stubby through the moniker file in R&I, but we found nothing. We got out a local and an APB on the description and the name. The stats office started to run on the M.O. Frank and I checked the hotel on 5th Street, and the manager showed us the room, but he said that it had been cleaned and occupied since the two Marines had left. Leighton Prince went over the room but failed to come up with anything. We took the hotel registration card and booked it in as evidence. The man had signed his name as Alton Richards. The manager gave us the same description as the one we'd gotten from the Marines. We ran the name through R&I, but we failed to come up with any new lead. There'd been no replies to the broadcast, and the staff's office had finished the run and had come up with four possible suspects. These were checked out, but they let us nowhere. 2.30 a.m., we checked the bar, but we found it was closed. Wednesday, 8.14 a.m., we briefed Captain Lorman on the developments, and then we went over to again check the bar where the two Marines were supposed to have met Stubby. The place was deserted except for one man drinking a beer. The waitress was sitting in a rear booth, filing her fingernails. Frank and I went back to talk to her. Yeah, something you want? Well, police officers, miss. We'd like to talk to you. Cops, huh? Yes, ma'am. This is my partner, Joe Friday. My name's Smith. Yes. <laughs> Boy, does that sound phony. Here's my ID card. Yeah, it's Smith, all right. What do you want? Do you mind if we sit down? No, go ahead, Liv. Thank you. What's this all about? Do you work here steady? Yeah, most of the time. What's your name, miss? Vera. Vera Gay. Well, Miss Gay, were you working here around the 8th, and 9th, or the 10th of July? Yeah, and you can make it Vera. Mm-hmm. You know most people who come in here regularly, do you? Yeah, I suppose so. I wonder if you look at this description and tell us if you know the man here. W-M-A. What does that mean? White male American. Yeah, W-M-A. 36 years, 5 feet 7 to 5 feet 9, 155 pounds stubby. Yeah? Yeah, I know him. Comes in here all the time. Nice guy. Loud when he gets drunk. He's always nice to me, though. Tells me I should be in pictures. You know, the movies. Yes, ma'am. Have you seen him today? No, he hardly ever gets in before maybe noon, one o'clock. He just doesn't bother you, does it? Am I following my nails? Not at all. He does bother some people, you know. Mm-hmm. Like running a piece of chalk down a blackboard. Miss Stubby, does he have any other name? Would you know it? Yeah, Paul Rogers. That's another one, Joe. Yeah. And you want to go ahead, miss? Yeah, I went out with him a couple of times, finally gave it up. I couldn't go that route. What's that, ma'am? All he talked about was either him and the Marine Corps and what a big hero he was or else... How he was going to get me in pictures, you know, movies. Yes, ma'am. I didn't come out to California to get in the movies. Well, I came out to be a private secretary, only those jobs are a little hard to get, so I work here. Make enough for coffee and cakes. And when a job comes along, I'll take it. Work in a big office, nice boss. Who knows, he might even marry me. 
Well, that movie hokum for me, no, sir, and not your little Vera. Did you work on the night of the night? It's night before last. Let's see. Yeah, I was in. You happened to see the stubby Rogers that night? Well, I gotta think about that. Let's see. That was the night we had the fight just before closing. Yeah, he was in earlier. You happen to notice if he was with anybody? What's it all about? He'd do something you want him for? No, we just like to talk to him. Yeah. Well, if he did anything, we had nothing to do with it. This is a good place. We got nothing to do with the people who come in. We got the price of a drink, they get served. We don't ask for trouble. Oh, we aren't going to cause any trouble, miss. We just want to talk to this Rogers. Yeah, well, as long as we aren't running into it. Do you remember if he was with anyone? Yeah, he was with a couple of Marines. Left with him, had a beef with Sam. He's a night bartender. Complained that the drinks were too high. I don't know what he was crying about. He's been drinking here a long time. Never had problems before. You saw him leave with these two Marines then? Yeah, three of them walked out. I think actually they sort of floated out. The two kids were really boiled. You remember what time it was when they left? Oh, that'd be kind of hard to tell. We were pretty busy. It was pretty important, miss. No, let me think. I guess maybe around 8, maybe 8.30 around in there. It's just a guess, though. Do you have any idea where this Rogers lives? Yeah, I've been there a couple of times. Hotel on South Hill. Mm-hmm. Can you give us the address? Yeah, I got it in the first. Yeah, I should have known he was a phony. All we'd say on his eye, he could get me in pictures, you know, in movies. Yes, sir. Mm, don't come that way. Of course, you understand I didn't come out here to get in pictures. I came out to be a private secretary. Here's the address. Here, keep it. I won't be using it anymore. All right, thank you, Miss Kay. Here's our card. If you think of anything more you think we ought to know, we'd appreciate a call from her. Yeah, thanks. Sure appreciate your help. Well, you never know. Maybe I'll need your help sometime. Matter of fact, you might be able to lend me a hand. What's that, miss? You know any picture producers? You know, movies. Frank called the name Paul Rogers into the office and a supplementary broadcast and an APB were gotten out. A stakeout was arranged on the bar. We went back to the city hall and a check through R&I on the name Paul Rogers netted us nothing. We drove over to the hotel on South Hill. The manager told us that Rogers was not in his room. He went on to say that Rogers had not been using his room regularly for the past week or so, but that he had been in a couple of days before in the company of a soldier, and that as far as he knew, the soldier was still in. In the company of the manager, Frank and I went upstairs. The manager unlocked the door and we went in. Minimum, Frank, there's someone in bed. Yeah. Come on, you. How about it? Just a minute. How about it, Joe? I don't know. He's dead. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. And now a report every smoker should hear. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report published about any cigarette. A responsible consulting organization reports a study by a competent medical specialist and staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfield. For six months, a group of men and women smoked only Chesterfield, 10 to 40 a day, their normal amount. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields from 1 to 30 years for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and end of the six months, Each smoker was given a thorough examination, including x-rays, and covering the sinuses, nose, ears, and throat. After these examinations, the medical specialist stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six-month period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Remember this report, and buy much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size. Wednesday, July 11th, 12.40 p.m. We called the coroner's office, then we got in touch with the crime lab and the photographers. After the pictures had been taken, the body was removed. The victim was a soldier in his mid-thirties. On the nightstand beside the bed, we found an empty pill bottle and a suicide note. The note was booked as evidence and turned over to Don Meyer for comparison with a handwriting taken from the hotel registration card that Rogers had signed. The men from Leighton Prince went over the place thoroughly. They came up with several classifiable prints. Fingerprints found on the bottle belonged to the victim. There were several other sets in the room which were not identified. The crime lab went over the room, then they went back to the lab to make their analysis. All officers in the area were alerted to be on the lookout for Rogers. Frank and I talked to the manager of the hotel, a Henry Corey. He told us that Rogers had lived in the hotel for the past four and a half months. He said that Rogers was quiet, kept pretty much to himself, 
and for the most part was a good tenant. He said that on several occasions, Rogers had gotten behind in his rent, but that he'd always managed to come up with the money. The manager told us that in the conversations he'd had with Rogers, the main topic had been the Marine Corps and the suspect's record overseas. Rogers presented himself as an armchair general, constantly calling down the way the situation was being handled. He would refer to his own exploits, but when questioned about his leaving the service, he became vague and evasive. Additional handwriting samples were obtained and sent to Meyer. The manager told us that the latest victim had come in with Rogers the night before and that at the time he'd been pretty drunk. They'd gone upstairs, and when Rogers had left in the morning, the manager had assumed that the soldier had gone the night before. 3.20 p.m. Frank and I went back to relieve the steak out at the bar. Back again? Yes, Miss Gay. Sit down. Thank you. It seems like every time I see you, I'm doing something with my nails. This morning, filing them, now I'm filing them again. I'm going to put polish on them after this. I guess you think I'm pretty vain. No, not at all, miss. New color called Frosted Rose. and pretty? Uh-huh. Kind of iridescent, what the label says. To sprinkle your nails with stardust. Yes, ma'am. It's a pretty bottle, too. They sure put things up nice nowadays. Uh-oh, here comes your boy. That's Rogers. Yeah. Yes, Stubby, well it be? Bourbon Coke. How's it going, Stubby? Same old six as before. Yeah, pretty dull. Yeah, you're doing a great business. Ah, oh, it's early yet. Here's your drink. It'll be four bits. There you go. All right, thanks, good. All right, Frank, let's go. No trouble now. Not unless he makes it. Hi, fellas. Something you want? You Paul Rogers? Yeah, who are you? Police officers. We'd like to talk to you. I don't want any trouble in here. No, there's not going to be any trouble. Always fights. Why is it everybody comes into a bar and starts fights? Ain't there someplace else to be? All right, come on, Rogers. Or four. You got nothing to hold me in. We'll talk to you about that, too. Well, let me finish my drink. No, afraid not. Let's go now. Look, I said I was going to finish my drink. Don't lean. Let's can it, mister, and go. I said I was going to finish my drink. All right, mister, on your feet. Nothing on him. Let's take him to the office. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Thanks. Sure appreciate it. Well, what's that? Thought for a minute there, you are going to have a fight. We took the suspect back to the city hall, then we checked the name through the Marine base in San Diego. Lieutenant Richard Houston called back to say that Rogers had received a court-martial and a dishonorable discharge in January of that year. He'd been tried by a military court on the charge of stealing alcohol from the hospital pharmacy and selling it to the patients in the hospital. We stopped in handwriting analysis, and Don Meyer took an exemplar of the suspect's writing. When we checked by the office, there was a message from Sergeants Bill Cummings and Harry Hansen stating that their investigation had shown that the death of the soldier in Roger's room was suicide beyond any doubt. 7.46 p.m. Frank and I talked to the suspect in the interrogation room. Terrible thing, treating a veteran like this. All right, let's save it, Rogers. There's a few questions we'd like some answers to. I got nothing to hide. All right, what were the conditions of your discharge from the Marine Corps? What do you mean? Did you get an honorable discharge or a dishonorable discharge? I had a little trouble. Lousy officers never did understand what the problems of the enlisted man were. What do you do for a living, Rogers? I work. Where? Around. You have a steady job? What do you mean, steady? One you've held for, say, more than six months? Haven't been out of the service that long. Where'd you serve in the Corps? Japan, Korea. How long are you there? About four or five months. Why'd you come back? I was wounded. How? What do you mean, how? Just that. How were you wounded? Well, I wasn't exactly wounded. I had my feet frostbitten. Mm -hmm. According to this here, you went AWOL and got lost. When they found you, your feet were frozen. Is that right? What's that you got? Your record in the Corps. You got a lot of nerve digging into that. That's what you got me in here for anyway. I done nothing that puts me in line for this kind of treatment. You know a couple of Marines named Ed Monahan and Jack Walker? Monahan? Walker? No, I don't think I know. You ever register in a hotel on 5th Street? No, I live over on Hill. You know a soldier named Marty Wilkin? What's he got to do with it? We found him dead in your room. You're cracking up. Yeah, sure, Rogers. We just dreamed we found that body. Had nothing to do with him. Met him in a bar. He said he wasn't feeling too good. Said he didn't have a place to sleep. I let him have my room. Something wrong in that? Be a little kind, and now even that gets you in trouble. You sure you don't know a Marine named Ed Monahan? Positive. There's something wrong, Rogers. Girl at the bar says she saw you leave the place with two Marines. They could have been Monahan and Walker. Well, maybe I know them. I might and still not know their names. You didn't take them up to a room you'd rented in a hotel on Fifth Street? No, I told you once I never lived on Fifth. Checked with our handwriting man. He says your writing matches some samples we found on the hotel register. Maybe I write like somebody else. No, we don't think so, mister. How about Jack Walker? Maybe you know him, you just didn't remember him. No, I keep telling you, I don't know them. Vera says you do. Well, she's lying. Is she? Sure she is. She's trying to save her own skin. From what? She doesn't want to stand a rap for murder, can't you see? Yeah, go ahead, Roger. I'm saying nothing until I see my lawyer. You sure you don't want to tell us why I did it? I got nothing to say. Makes it tough, Roger. 
What do you mean? Just makes it rough, that's all. Looks like you're going to have to stand a murder rap. Yeah? It's the way it looks. Well, I didn't mean it. I didn't. I just wanted to get even, that's all. Just get even. For what, Roger? For the way the court treated me. Kicked me out. I didn't do anything really wrong. Cop a little alcohol, that's all. No harm done. They look at it a little different. Yeah, that's a trouble, stinking brass. They're all alike. They don't care what happens to us, the guys in the field. I tried to get a job. I looked everywhere. I just didn't fit. Seemed like everywhere I went, I got into trouble. I wanted like it was when I first went in, like it was after boot camp. Walking down the street, girls looking at you, a Marine, a big man. They took that away from me. They wouldn't let me enlist again. I tried, but they wouldn't let me. You can understand what that would do to a guy, can't you? I don't know. Well, it tore me apart. Right then, I decided to get even with all the stinking gyrenes in the world. They wouldn't let me in, and I hated them. Yeah. Remember what happened the day you gave the two boys the pills, do you? Sure, remember all of it. Oh, they cried for a medic. They weren't big men then. No, sir, they sure weren't. All right, Rogers, we'll get a stenographer. Tell me, Sergeant. Yeah. Did I get both of them? No, Walker's going to be all right. He the young one? That's right. A real nice kid. Lucky, too. Is that right? Yeah, no worries. Really got it made. Uniform, that's what does it. Uniform makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, well, don't worry, you'll get one. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 13th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. In modern crime detection, the working detective depends on scientific research. He relies on the services of trained experts in ballistics, communications, fingerprints, to name just a few. He's interested only in facts. And as a smoker, you should be interested only in facts. That's why the report you heard earlier is so important to you. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfield. First such report ever published about any cigarette. Remember it. And next time, buy Chesterfield. Regular or king-size, premium-quality Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Paul M. Rogers was tried and convicted on one count of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them. Regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. You receive a call that a fatal accident has occurred at a Hollywood motion picture studio. Your job? Investigate. Here's what a leading tobacco publication and the nation's press have had to say about king-size Chesterfields. U.S. Tobacco Journal, Atlanta, Georgia. 
Chesterfield King Size is going strong. One jobber reordered twice this week, in addition to his regular order. And the Herald Tribune reported, King Size is a sellout. Extra supplies of Chesterfields rush to dealers here. The reason for King Size Chesterfield's amazing success is this. All King Size cigarettes give you quantity. But only Chesterfield King Size gives you quantity plus quality. Premium quality. That means Chesterfield King Size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. The same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. Enough more of this tobacco to give you more than a one-fifth longer smoke. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Buy them either way you like them. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder. <laughs> The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Friday, August 5th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. It was 2.25 p.m. when we got to the Winton Picture Studios. Stage two. Better check the guard over there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Police officers, about the accident, where do we find Mr. Adams? Oh, yeah, I said look for you. Let's see, I saw him around here a minute ago. Mm. Oh, there he is, over there by that office set. See him, the one in the blue suit? The one with the gray hair? Yeah, that's him. Thank you very much. I know, you can check with the office. If they can come up with an idea, I'll go for it. All I know is that we got to have this turkey finished. Yeah, yeah, something you want? Yes, you Gerald Adams? That's right. Police officers. My ID card. Oh, yeah. You're on Friday, huh? Yes, sir, it's my partner, Frank Smith. Yeah, how you do? Hi. Uh, how much you know about this? Well, doctor down at Georgia Street told us that uh, uh, Henry Wilson had an accident, is that right? Yeah, yeah, he was a director. At least he thought he was. I wonder if we could see where the accident happened. Yeah, sure. Over in stage one, just across the way. Hold on a minute, will you? I'd like to talk to Sam for a minute, try to get things organized here, get things moving. You know. Yeah, go right ahead. Just wait here. I'll be right back. Okay. Quite a place, huh, Joe? Yeah, a lot of room. It's a big stage in there. Yeah. You know, all this, the average person doesn't stop to think about it. What's that? You know, a fellow lays out 85 cents to see a movie. Never thinks about all the people, all the equipment that goes into making it possible. Yeah. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. Terrible thing. We're 12 days behind schedule now. This will probably knock a couple more days off. The exec's going to scream like an eagle when he sees what this office is costing. Here, right through the story. Right. right. One's right over there. Yes, yeah, sir. I wonder if you'd mind filling us in on this thing. Yeah, sure. What can I do to help? Well, if you can tell us how the body was found, who found it, how the accident occurred. Well, as near as I can figure, it must have happened about 12.10, 12.15. Food broken for lunch. Most of them were over at the commissary. I came down from the office and wanted to talk to Henry about tomorrow's schedule. I wanted to try to change some of the shots, you know, make it more simple. He wasn't in the lunchroom, so I went ahead and had lunch. Uh-huh. About, uh, let's see, I think it was about 12.40, Al Evans, the greenery man, came in and told me he'd found Henry's body. A lamp had fallen on him. Darn fool yelled it so loud that everybody in the place heard him. I see. Hmm. Well, I came right over. First, it looked like Henry was dead. He'd lost a lot of blood. Felt his pulse. Found out he was still alive. That's when I had the ambulance called. Uh, here we are. Good idea. Thank you. Over here by the house set. Yeah. At the time, those big doors were open. The green men were putting in the shrubbery here. After I found out about the accident, I had the doors closed so people wouldn't be roaming in and out. Are the doors usually left open? Usually are. When there's no shooting on the stage, when we're using it, they're closed. Mm-hmm. Now, right here is where he was found. You can see the lamp, but the sun arc must have hit him right about here. Hmm. Poor guy. Yes, sir. Is that where the lamp fell from up there? Yeah. Yeah, there you can see on the scaffolding where it was. Between the babies, there's space there. Uh, who puts the lamps up there? Well, it's in the gaffer's department. He's in charge of them. What if we could talk to him? Yeah, sure. He's over on two. I'll call him. Thank you. Big lamp, huh? Yeah. Sure smashed up in it. Gee, that thing must weigh a couple hundred pounds. Yeah, look up there. It's quite yeah. a drop. I figure it's about 40 feet up there. What do you think? Oh, yeah, that anyway. He's on his way over. 
What's your position here, Mr. Adams? I'm production supervisor, unit manager, a lot of names for it. I try to take care of the running of the company as far as this one picture is concerned, make out the budgets, work on the schedule, the director, things like that. Mm-hmm. Really hard to say just what my job is, so I do a little of everything. Yes, sir. You fellas from Homicide? Yes, mm -hmm. sir, that's right. You think that there's something wrong here? Maybe Henry's accident wasn't an accident or something? Well, it's just that in any death where there isn't a doctor in attendance at the time of death, we have to look into it. It's just routine. Well, I thought for a minute you might think there was something fishy about this. That's all we need. To have murder on the set. Might as well fold up. Oh, hi, Jerry. You want to see me? Yeah, Dick, these uh, officers like to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. This is Mr. Friday, Mr. Smith, Dick Patterson, our gap. How are you? Hi, hi Mr. Patterson. Uh, what do you want to know? Well, Mr. Adams here tells us that you were in charge of installing those lamps. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Are you trying to say I had anything to do with causing Henry's death? Oh, no, sir. We didn't say that. Well, then what are you saying? Well, we're just trying to get the facts straight. No need to get upset, Andy. Well, what are you talking about? These cops come in here and try to make out I didn't put those lamps in right? That's not what they said. Well, don't you think I feel bad enough? Henry was a good friend of mine. We've been together a long time. I don't know how the lamp got loose. I wonder if we could look at its mounting. Sure. I've wanted to get up there anyway look at it myself. But Jerry here said not to touch anything until you guys got here. Okay, how do we get up there? There's a ladder back here at the rear of the stage. All right. I can't understand it, Mr. Friday. I've been hanging lamps for a long time. It's going on 20 years. First time anything like this ever happened. Oh, here it is. Just going up. Okay. Hey, watch your step. Yeah, go, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can get there down this way. They use these walks to hang the lights on, do they? Yeah. You got to be awfully careful, though. You watch your step. It's a long way down. Yeah. Uh, once in a while, if you want a real high shot of the scene, we lift the camera up here. Mostly, though, it's used just for lights. Uh, here it is. Now, uh, you can see there where the light was. Yes, sir. I oh, appreciate it if you didn't touch anything. You would just stand back there. Sure. Now, the base of the lamp went through this hole there, huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, look at the one over there, same way. Yeah. Do you have anything else uh, securing the lights once they're tied down? No, sir. Once they're in place, the weight of the thing itself will hold it. Mm -hmm. In other words, you drill this hole and you place the lamp in the hole and mm. it could... Well, it doesn't look like the wood is chipped, does it? No, these scaffolds are pretty new. This stage hasn't been up more than a year. Mm -hmm. Well, from what you can see, Mr. Patterson, can you figure out how the lamp might have fallen? How it could have broken loose? Well, I'll tell you, officer. Bob, that's my best boy. Bob and I were over here last night checking the lights on the set. Now, I didn't actually get up here myself, but Bob did. Now, he's a good boy. He's been around a long time, doesn't make mistakes like this. Mm -hmm. He secured this lamp himself, and I know it was right. Well, then, have you got any idea how it might have fallen? None at all. Matter of fact, I don't think it did. Sir? I don't think it did fall. I think it was dropped. Three fifteen p.m., Frank and I went back to stage two. We talked to Bob Murphy, the best boy, and got the same story from him. He said that he'd secured the lamp in position himself and that as far as he was concerned, it could not have fallen. He agreed with Dick Patterson that the lamp must have been removed from its place and either dropped or was thrown at Wilson. At this point, there was the possibility that the death was not an accident. We asked the unit manager to assign one of the studio police to guard the scene of the accident, and then we called the crime lab. Dean Bergman lifted several clean prints from the broken lens of the lamp. Bob Murphy's fingerprints were taken, and they matched those found in the lamp. There were no other prints on the glass. The men from the crime lab found a small piece of blue cloth on the mounting of the lamp. Lee Jones put it in an envelope and gave it to me. At 4.20 p.m., we talked to Gerald Adams in one of the portable dressing rooms. I just can't believe it. There were a lot of people in town that didn't like Henry, but I don't think there was anyone that would kill him. Was there anyone in the company that he had any disagreements with, would you know? What do you mean? Well, anyone he had quarrels with, arguments, would you know? Well, I guess Sam would be the most likely. They argued all the time. Sam? Yeah, Sam Phillips. He's the first assistant director. Real talented guy. Been at it a long time. He and Henry worked together for a long time. They were always arguing. I guess if you didn't know him, you might think they were serious. But here in the company, we all knew. We understood. Understood what? Well, Sam's been in Hollywood almost since it was. He began as a prop man, worked his way up to be a cutter. Then I guess about 15 years ago, he went into directing. Mm-hmm. He's going to get a picture of his own pretty soon. He'll do well, too. Real talent. Well, about these arguments, Mr. Adams, between Wilson and Phillips. Well, to understand him, you'd have to know Henry. He was one of the first directors in pictures. He came out here from New York even before Sam did. Really old school. He drove special cars, most of them pure white. Had all his clothes designed and made. He wore a cape while he was on the set, you know. Referred to himself as Wilson. You know, Wilson thinks this, Wilson thinks that. 
If you didn't know him, you'd take him seriously. Once you did that, you were in trouble. Mm -hmm. Were you ever present when one of these arguments took place? Yeah, a matter of fact, they had one yesterday. That's so? Yeah, over in the commissary. I thought for a minute it was going to be pretty serious, and then I realized it was all a gag. Everyone else did, too. Well, what was it about? Well, like I told you, the picture's 12 days over now. A lot of tension on the stage. Everyone's pretty edgy. Yeah. Well, Sam's great practical joker, you know, always trying to cook up something. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, the jokes do the job. They give everybody a laugh. They all feel a little better. Well, the day before yesterday, Sam got one of the set dresses and took a cement deer. You know, the, the kind people used to have on their front lawns? Yeah, yeah, I think I know the kind you mean. Well, the two of them carted this deer down the parking lot and put it in the back seat of Henry's car. He planted it so the deer was looking right at Henry when he got in the driver's seat. The thing weighed about 250 pounds. Once they got it in, Henry couldn't get it out. He tried that night. He couldn't make it. He didn't think it was very funny, did he? No, no. He had to leave it in the car all night. Drove home with it. Next morning, when he checked in the lot, he tried to get it out again. While he was trying, the horns on the thing tore up the upholstery in his car, really ripped it up to pieces. Oh, I'll be darned. Well, finally, Henry got a hammer and broke the thing up. Smashed it in little pieces and threw them all out of the car. Left them right in front of the scene dock. Yeah. Was that when he and Phillips had the argument? No, no. Yesterday morning, when Wilson got on the set, he wasn't saying anything to anybody. All the crew knew about the deer, and they were all waiting for him to say something about it. But he didn't. He, he just drove the crew through the morning setups. The argument took place at lunchtime. Yeah. Henry waited until the whole crew was having lunch, and then he stormed into the cafe. He walked over to Sam, really read him off, called him a child. He said that if he'd spend a little more time doing his work and less time playing around, the picture wouldn't be so far over scheduled. Really made him look like a fool. The argument went on for about 15 minutes. Well, what was Sam doing all this time? Well, he just sat there, and then finally he got up and grabbed Henry, kind of shook him. Said he'd never been talked to like that before, and it wasn't going to happen again. Said that he'd kill Henry the next time he did it. Mm -hmm. Well, Henry looked pretty scared. Sam's a big man, you know. I, I think if he made up his mind to do it, he could have broken Henry in two. Mm -hmm. Sam looked at Henry for a minute, and then he laughed. Then Henry started to laugh, too, and then the whole place. I, I guess it's like laughing at a horror picture, anything to break the tension. Looked real tight. Even I wasn't sure it was a joke, you know. You said that Sam lifted this deer into the car by himself? Well, I don't know if he did it by himself, but I know he could lift it without help. How much did you say that that deer weighed? More about 250 pounds. Why? Well, I was just thinking. That's about what that big lamp weighed, isn't it? Three forty-five p.m. Frank called the office and had R&I run the name Sam Phillips and Henry Wilson. Sam Phillips had been arrested once for disturbing the peace. He'd gotten drunk in a nightclub out on Sunset Boulevard and gotten into a fight. The report said that it had taken both of the arresting officers to subdue him and take him into custody. There was no record on Henry Wilson. We continued to talk to the crew. Each one of them told us about the arguments between Phillips and Wilson. But most of the people we talked to didn't share Adam's idea that the arguments were just a joke. The script girl told us that on at least three occasions, members of the crew had had to keep the men apart and that Sam Phillips had said he'd kill Wilson. We asked each of them if they'd seen anyone enter or leave the stage at approximately the time of the accident. None of them had. They explained that Wilson had been trying to pick up time and that as soon as they'd finished one shot, he was yelling at them to get ready for the next one. 4.22 p.m. We talked to Sam Phillips. Sure, we had some beefs. None of them were serious, though. So. Well, how about this fight you had in the commissary yesterday? You mean the thing about the deer? Yeah. Well, that didn't mean anything. Oh, I admit I was pretty sore for a minute, but right away I knew Henry wasn't serious. Even if he was, I guess I can understand it. Must have made him pretty sore to see his car ripped up. Did you left that deer into Wilson's car by yourself? Yeah, I had one of the set dressers with me. He kind of steered the thing in. Sure looked kind of funny. Mm -hmm. You sure you weren't over on stage one today? Positive. You got any idea of how that light got loose and fell? No, I've been in the business a long time. That's the first time I've ever known a lamp to fall. They've been tipped over when on a floor stand, and I've seen them broken when a set has moved. I've never seen one drop like that. Do you have any idea how this could have happened then? Not the slightest. Your first assistant, is that right? Yeah. How long you been in this job? Oh, I guess about 15 years now. I was a cutter for a while. Took a big cut in salary to go into directing. Figured it'd be a way to get a picture of my own. A lot of directors come from the cutting department. That's so? Yeah, they do. I didn't care much for it, though. I like to be on the set. See things happen. I like the activity. Mm -hmm. Did Wilson know that you wanted to be a director? Yeah, he said that if I stayed with him, he'd try to get the producers to give me a picture. Matter of fact, I kind of thought I might get this one. Is that right? Yeah. When I was in the pre-planning stages, they hadn't assigned a man to it yet, and Jerry and I both wanted it. Jerry? You mean Adams? Yeah, he wants to be a director, too. It's funny, I guess everyone wants to be a director. Jerry's been trying for a long time. I don't think he'll ever make it, though. All right. Yeah, he's too valuable as a unit manager. Yeah. Was Adams very upset when he didn't get this picture? No. I was pretty sore. I told Jerry about it. He just sat back and said that's the way things are and that it doesn't pay to fight the front office. Mm-hmm. 
Did you say anything to Wilson about how you felt? Yeah, I told him. Said I thought it was real unfair. Said I thought he could have done something about it. Well, what did he say? He told me to be patient. My time would come. Do you know if there was anybody on the lot who might have wanted to kill Wilson? No. Oh, there might have been some people who didn't like him very much, but you run into that in almost every picture. You know, little jealousies. that right? Yeah. You really think he was killed, huh? Well, it could have been, yeah. Sure hard to believe. We've been making pictures about this for a long time. You know, murders. And now that it's right here, really on the set, it makes you feel that you can just check ahead in the script and find out who the killer is. Read about the ending. Kind of seems just like another picture. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had somebody here with you, officer. I'm sorry, Mr. Patterson. What is it? I wonder if I could talk to you. Sure. Well, it's kind of private. Well, if you're through with me, I'll get back to work. No, you just wait. I'll be right back. Here, we can step out of here. Okay. Now, what is it, Mr. Patterson? Well, I feel like a real idiot. I should have remembered it when you talked to me before. What's that, sir? Well, I remember just before the company broke for lunch, uh, Sam gave me a note. Said I should give it to Wilson. Mm-hmm. Did you see what it was? No, it was folded up. Had Wilson's name on it. Uh, I didn't pay much attention to it. What, did you give it to him? Yeah, he read it, and then he said he had to leave the set for a few minutes, said he'd be right back. He left the stage then? Yeah. Where was Sam at this time? Well, I don't know. You see, he gave me the note just outside the door to the stage. I was bringing in some more lights, and right after he handed it to me, he left. Uh Uh-huh. Headed for stage one. You are listening to Dragnet the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield was first to name its ingredients. Ingredients that give you the best possible smoke. Now Chesterfield is first to give you scientific facts in support of smoking. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report published about any cigarette. A responsible consulting organization reports a study by a competent medical specialist and staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfields. For six months, a group of men and women smoked only Chesterfield, 10 to 40 a day, their normal amount. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields from 1 to 30 years for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and end of the six months, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including x-rays and covering the sinuses, nose, ears, and throat. After these examinations, the medical specialist stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Remember this report, and buy Chesterfields either way you like them, regular or king size. Premium quality Chesterfields, and much milder. <laughs> We talked to Gerald Adams and had two of the studio police start a search for the note. Frank called Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and asked if the note had been found on the body of Henry Wilson. The doctor told us that he didn't know and that the dead man's personal effects had been turned over to the coroner. We called them and they told us that there was nothing of that description found. While the search for the missing note went on, we continued to talk to Sam Phillips. The whole idea is crazy. I told you I wasn't near stage one at all this morning. How about the note? I don't remember any note. Well, the gaffer says you gave it to him. Told him to give it to Wilson. He's crazy. If I had a note for Wilson, I'd have given it to him myself. I'm with him all day. I've got no reason to have someone else deliver messages for me. Well, then you deny giving him the note. Is that right? Well, certainly. All right, mister. We'll let you know just how you stand. We got a witness who says you were seen going to stage one. A couple of minutes later, a man is killed on the same stage. You admit that you've had arguments with Wilson. Seems like you might have had a motive for killing him. I told you I didn't go near the place. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? I know what's happened. What's that? Well, when Dick told you he saw me heading for stage one, he probably saw me heading for the office. I have to pass near the stage to get there. Matter of fact, I even cut through it once in a while. Did you happen to cut through it today? No. At least I don't think so. That's pretty important that you remember. I'm trying. Let's see. I know what you guys think. I don't know how to show you that you're wrong. Well, can you come up with an explanation for the note? Well, I'm trying to tell you I don't know. Yeah, that's what he's talking about. What? I did give Dick a note. Yeah. I told him to give it to Henry. What was in it? Well, I don't know. I didn't even read it. Well, then you didn't write it? No, I found it in my desk when I was up in the office this morning. I figured that someone had put it there thinking I'd see Henry and give it to him. What time did you find it? I see, I guess it was about nine or so. I guess I put it in my pocket and then forgot all about it. And just before I went up to the office to tell him that we were breaking for lunch, I remembered it. 
I gave it to Dick and told him to hand it to Henry. That's what the note's all about. Right after that, I went upstairs. Hmm. Do you always tell the office that you're broken for lunch? Yeah, most of the time I phone, but today I went up myself. I've been kind of expecting a letter from my family back east, and I thought it might be in, so I wanted to check the morning mail. Got any idea who might have put the note on your desk? No, I just found it, you know, tucked away in the corner of the blotter. I really didn't look at it. I was in a hurry. Wanted to finish lunch so I could get back on the set. We have a lot of work to do this afternoon. Did you see Wilson after you left the stage? No, I looked for him at the commissary, but he didn't show up. And the greenery man came in and said that he had the accident. Uh Uh-huh. You recognize the handwriting on that note? No, all I saw was the name, that it was for Henry. Come to think of it, though, I do kind of remember that it was familiar handwriting, thinking I'd seen it someplace before. Do you remember where? No, I wish I could. Have you found it yet? No. Wilson must have dropped it someplace here, though. It wasn't on his body. I wonder if you'd take a look at this. What's that? Well, the crime lab crew found this on the stage, caught on the lamp that killed Wilson. Hmm. Looks like the material they make suits out of. Yeah, from inside the cuff. See? See the little zigzag mark where it's been cut? Mm Mm-hmm. You ever see this type of material before, Sam? Let me see. Looks like it came from a blue suit, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Good material. Sure an odd color. Yeah, I think I've seen a suit like this. I think I saw it this morning. Yeah? Oh, yeah, sure. Jerry Adams was wearing it. Six thirty p.m. We call Gerald Adams into the dressing room. Were you on stage one at all before the body was found? No, sir. Why do you think I had something to do with this? Well, we're just trying to get the facts here. Well, I want to help, but it seems to me that you'd spend your time a little better if you talked to Sam, the note and all. Still deny giving it to Henry? No, he says that he gave it to him. Well, then there you are. I guess that argument was a lot more serious than we thought, huh? That's a nice looking suit you got on, Mr. Adams. Uh, new? Yeah, this is the first day I've worn it. Hmm. Present from my wife. Pretty blue. I don't usually care for blue, like brown, gray, mostly. Wife's been trying to get me to wear blue, so she got this suit for me. Yeah, looks like it's made pretty well there. Yeah, it is. She had my tailors put it together. I didn't even go down for a fitting. Needs a few things done to it, like the shoulders pulled in a little. I don't much care for padding in the shoulders, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. You mind if I look at the cuffs? I've always had trouble with the cuffs on my suits. You can see here how they've worn. Must be in the way they're made. No, I don't think so. That looks like it came from your shoes rubbing against it. You mind if I look? No, no. Here. Yeah, it sure is beautiful material. Yeah. Yeah, she's sure got good taste. Uh-huh. Of course, it should be. She paid 180 bucks for it. Wow. You got a little tear here on the cuff. Inside. Have you noticed that? No. Hmm. Let's see. Right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. How about that? I got to get that fixed. A little piece torn right out. Huh? Uh-huh. What did you do when you found Wilson's body? No, I mean... What were your movements? Well, it'll be kind of hard to explain. If you want to walk over there, I can show you. All right. Let's go. Company's broken. I told him to wait up in the office. Figured you might want to talk to him some more. Fine. Here, I'll get the door. It's sure a beautiful night, huh? Yeah, it is. Best time of the day in the valley. After the sun starts to go down, everybody's always kidding about the cool breeze that comes up, you know. Really does out here. I know the wife and I practically live out of doors during the summer months. Is that right? Yeah, we both love the valley. All right, here we are. Just the work lights on. You want me to get the others? No, no, there's enough light. Okay. Now, if you show us just what happened when you found the body. Well, uh, I came in that door, the big one there. It was open. Was there anybody on the stage then? No, no, not right away. The greenery man came in right after me and then jacked the guard from the other stage. Uh-huh. And like I said, the body was lying about here. And, uh... The lamp was there. You saw that when you were here. Yes, sir, we did. Did you go near the lamp, touch it in any way? No, no, I didn't. The only concern was Henry. That's all I thought about. I knelt down to feel Henry's pulse, and then I told Jack to go and phone the ambulance. Yeah? And then I had the doors closed. I waited until a lot of policemen got here, and then I went back to the other stage. Mm-hmm. Our crime lab found a piece of cloth caught on that lamp. It matches the tear in the cuff of your suit. I can't understand how it could have gotten there. What if we could look through your pockets? Why? What's that going to prove? We just want to take a look. It won't hurt anything. Well, maybe it won't, but I don't see why you're asking me all these questions. Seems to me that Sam's your killer. Why don't you talk to him? Make him tell you why I did it. All right, come on. Let's see what you got in your pockets. Take everything out and put it on the table. All right. Here's my wallet. Well, you better take the money out of it. Okay. Now, let me see the wallet. All right, here. Just a second, Mr. Adams. What'd you drop over there? Right there. Mm-hmm. Looks like the note we've been looking for, Joe. Mm-hmm. What's it say? Uh, Wilson, 
I have to see you. Something's come up. Meet me on one when you break for lunch. It's private. Signed, Jerry. How about this, Adams? Oh, I don't know anything about it. Well, maybe we better talk downtown, huh? What's going on in place with you? Watch him, Joe. He's going up that ladder. All right, give it up, Adams. There's no place to go up there. Stay away from me. Come on, Adams, give it up. He's not coming down. Well, he can't stay up there long. Why don't you shoot me? I'm not going to do what you say. Go ahead and shoot me. What for? You're not going anyplace. How about it, Adams? Why'd you do it? He had it coming. All his life stepping on people. This picture was mine. They told me it was. And he took it away from me just because he wanted to be a big man. This was my picture. He took it. All right, come on down. I'm going to stay up here. Well, you suit yourself. we got lots of time, Adams. Can't you just go away and leave me alone? You know better than that. You killed a man. Now, come on. You either come down or we'll come up. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, give him a minute. He wants to be a director. Yeah. Let him figure out the ending. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 17th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Friends, in a sense, every smoker is his own judge and jury when it comes to selecting a cigarette. Now, you've heard the facts in our case for Chesterfield, and I'd like to sum them up for you. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield the first and only cigarette to name all its ingredients. And now, Chesterfield gives you scientific facts in support of smoking. You heard the report read earlier. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report ever published about any cigarette. Consider these facts carefully. I'm sure you'll want to change to Chesterfields. Regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. And much milder. <laughs> Gerald S. Adams was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Whit Connor, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the nation's headquarters for election news. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. You get a call that the body of a dead woman has been found in a closet. There are no leads to her identification. The identity of the killer is unknown. Your job? Investigate. Here's what a leading tobacco publication and the nation's press have had to say about king-size Chesterfields. Tobacco leaf. 
more calls for Chesterfield king-size cigarettes than for most brands being marketed. And the Cleveland Press reported, dealers everywhere report the big pack sale phenomenal. Last week in Cleveland, some areas reported the long-size Chesterfield outsold all other brands. The reason for king-size Chesterfield's amazing success is this. All king-size cigarettes give you quantity. But only Chesterfield King Size gives you quantity plus quality, premium quality. That means Chesterfield King Size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. The same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. Enough more of this tobacco to give you more than a one-fifth longer smoke. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you Premium quality in both regular and king size. Buy them either way you like them. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, April 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 11.36 a.m. when we got to the Greenleaf Apartment Hotel. Apartment 406. Yes? Police officers, ma'am. Oh, yes, come in. Thank you. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. How do you do? How do you do, ma'am? I'm Lorraine Holden. I'm the one who called you. Terrible thing, just terrible. Yes, Miss Holden. If you just tell us what happened, if you could. Well, Georgia, she's a maid. Well, Georgia was cleaning up in here. She'd finished the apartment, and then she thought she'd check the coat closet right here. Mm-hmm. She opened the door, and there she was on the floor. Ma'am? Dead woman. You can see for yourself. She's right there on the floor. Just terrible. Where is this Georgia now, Mrs. Holden? She's downstairs in my place. She's pretty broken up. Must have been a terrible shock to her. She let out a scream that must have had half the neighborhood on edge. I live down on the second floor in the rear. I thought at first that something had happened to Georgia. Oh, that girl's got a powerful set of lungs. Yes, ma'am. Who rented this apartment from you? I knew you'd ask that. I've got the receipt book right here on my apron. Just a minute. All right. I'll put a pencil on the page. Let's see. Yes, here it is. Raymond Bartley. That's what he said. Bartley. You know where this Bartley is now? No, I don't. And that's another weird one. You know what I mean. Ma'am. Well, look in the closets. Look around the places. None of his clothes. Nothing that even tell you he was still here. He's got another week to go on his rent. Hmm. How's that, ma'am? Well, moved in a week ago. You can see here on the receipt, Wednesday, April 9th. Mm-hmm. Paid me two weeks in advance. And you look around this place, and it don't look like he's going to be around here anymore. Mm-hmm. Do you have any idea where he might be? Oh, not the slightest. Did it give you any indication that he was planning to move out? Not the slightest, no, sir. I don't even have an inkling. I'll call the coroner, Joe. Okay. Better get in touch with the crime lab, too. Have them come out. Okay. You mind if I use the phone, Mrs. Holden? Well, not at all. It's right there back in the hall. A little shelf on the wall. Thank you, ma'am. You think Mr. Bartley did it? you think he killed the woman? Well, we don't know, ma'am. Did Mr. Bartley rent this room by himself? What? I don't understand. Well, did he register as Mr. and Mrs.? Oh, no, sir. Just plain Raymond Bartley. Do you have any idea who the woman might be? Oh, not the slightest. I never saw her before Georgia screamed and I ran in here. Mm. Did you touch anything at all in the room here? No. No, I know how policemen work. I've heard all about that. Don't touch anything department. No, sir. I didn't touch anything. Uh-huh. They're on the way, Joe. All right, fine. Miss Halden, have you ever seen the woman before? No, sir, I haven't. Never saw her before. Just took a quick glance. Terrible, just terrible what they did. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could give us a description of Mr. Bartley. Well, that'd be kind of hard. Like I said, I don't pay a lot of attention to the people who live here. I just collect the rents and let it go with that. Once in a while, when George is sick, I come in and clean up. Those times I talk to him a little bit, but I, I'm not the nosy type. You know what I mean. Could you tell us about how tall Bartley is? Well, I have to think about that, too. I guess he was about as tall as you, maybe a little one way or the other. How much would you say he weighed? Well, he was kind of a heavy-set little man. I I guess he weighs about as much as my husband. That would be 200 or so. Mm. How about his coloring? Would you know? Oh, there it goes again. I I tell you, officers, I can't tell you too good. Mr. Bartley was kind of a crowd melter. I beg your pardon? A crowd melter. You you know, you put him in a crowd and he just melts away. You never pay any attention to him. You know what I mean. Yes, ma'am. 
You know, as I can remember, he had kind of brown hair and, and blue eyes, I guess. Mm. Was there anything peculiar about him? Did he have any scars, any marks, anything at all about him that would make you remember him, make him a little easier to... No, no, nothing. How about the way he talked? Could you tell where he was from? No, he was just kind of an ordinary man, nothing special. Well, when was the last time you saw Mr. Bartley? Well, let me see now. I think it was, um, yes, Monday night. I, he was coming in. I was just coming back from the grocery. It was about, uh, oh, 6, 6.15. I said hello, and then he said the same hello. And, and then he went on upstairs, and I went to my apartment. That was the last time. Did Mr. Bartley have any close friends in the building, you know? No, not that I can think of. Well, did he ever say where he worked or what he did for a living? No, not that I remember. Well, how about references? Did he have any? No, I didn't ask for any. You know if he drove a car? <laughs> it seems so stupid... Seems like I don't know the answer to any of your questions. I don't know about if he drove a car or not. We don't have any garages in the building. He might have, and I wouldn't know it. I just didn't pay any attention. You know what I mean. Well, did he get any mail while he was here? Would you know that? No, sir, not a thing. Uh, we'd like to talk to Georgia if we could. Sure, I'll ask her to come up here. Poor thing's so upset. It's terrible. It's the first time anything like this has happened to me. First time anything like this has happened in the place. I don't understand it. I never bothered the tenants, never caused them any trouble. I don't even know this, Bartley. Why do you have to do a thing like this to me? Why me? Well, I don't know, ma'am. Why her? The crime lab crew got there and went over the apartment. Photographs were taken of the room and of the position of the body. In going over the room, the crime lab came up with a probable murder weapon, a cast-iron poker standing in the fireplace rack. Brown hair, similar to the victim's, was found clinging to the metal. Dean Bergman lifted several partial and some full fingerprints from around the apartment and from the poker itself. He compared them with fingerprints of the maid and eliminated her as a suspect. He rolled the prints of the dead woman. Hers were eliminated from those found in the apartment. We talked to the maid and got the same story that we'd been given by Mrs. Halden. She was unable to add any information to what we already had. We talked to the neighbors in the building. None of them had had any dealings with the missing Ray Bartley. The woman in the apartment next to his told us that on the previous night at about 10.45, she had heard a woman's voice and a loud argument coming from the murder apartment, but she said she hadn't paid any attention to it. 2.42 p.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. I'll call Bergman, see if he was able to identify the woman or make the other prints. Yeah, right. I hope he's done some good. Yeah. Dean Bergman, please. Hi, Dean. Frank Smith. Uh, you been able to make those prints yet? Uh -huh. Well, how about the ones in the poker? Yeah. Well, that's the way it goes, huh? Uh-huh. Right. Nothing on either the woman's or the ones he lifted from the poker. Well, that helps, doesn't it? He's sending them both on to Washington, see if they have anything. Yeah. Anything on him in R&I? Well, I called down there. They're checking him now. I can't understand it. What's that? Well, how you can rent an apartment to somebody and not know what he looks like. Well, like she said, the manager's probably minds her own business. Yeah, well, I get it. Homicide Friday. Oh, yeah, Lee. Mm-hmm. Now, how about laundry marks? Uh, yeah. Now, how about the poker? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, well, that figures, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, Lee, thanks a lot. Anything? Well, he's pretty sure the poker was the murder weapon. Anything to identify the woman? No, nope, not a thing. Whoever did this sure knew what he was doing. Removed everything that could possibly tell us who she was. That puts us in a good position. Yeah. An unidentified body and an unknown killer. The report came back from R&I. There was nothing in the records on a Ray Bartley of that description. Three other teams of men were assigned to assist in the investigation. We talked with everybody in the neighborhood around the apartment building. None of the storekeepers had noticed the missing man. None of them could give us any further information. An APB was gotten out carrying the name and description that we'd obtained. An APB was also gotten out on the dead woman. We checked with missing persons detail for a possible missing report on the victim. They said they'd let us know. The newspapers gave us their help, and in the following editions, they carried pictures of the woman and requested that anyone knowing her identity should contact the police department immediately. Two days passed. During this time, several people came in and said that they were sure that they knew the dead woman, but they were unable to identify her. Other leads were checked out, but led us nowhere. The manager and the maid came in and went through the mug books. No results. Monday, April 21st, 9.27 a.m. Ready? Yeah. Oh, hi, John. Hi, Frank. Hi, darling. You guys getting anywhere in this closet murder? No, not a thing. Well, I got a hunch. Maybe it won't go anywhere, but I thought you guys might want to check it out. What's that? 
We got a mission report from San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. A man up there said that his wife had come down here to see her sister. Said she never showed up. Yeah. We went out and talked to the sister. At the time, she wasn't too cooperative. You know, like, like uh, she knew where her sister was all the time. I checked this description on the APB. Seems to me to match the description we got from both the husband and the sister. Yeah. Like I said, it's just a hunch, but I thought you might talk to this woman. Might be able to come up with something. What's her name? Let's see. Um, Allard, Mara Allard. Lives out in Hollywood Boulevard. You talk to her. See if you don't come up with the same thing we did. Yeah, what's that? She doesn't care if her sister's dead or alive. Frank and I drove out to see Mrs. Myra Allard. She told us that her sister had written and said that she'd be down for a visit. On the day that she was supposed to arrive, the sister had phoned and told Mrs. Allard that she wouldn't be out that day, but that she'd met some friends on the train and that they were all going out on a sightseeing tour of the city. In talking to her, we got the same impression that she'd given John St. John of missing persons detail. We asked her if she'd go with us to see if the dead woman might be her sister. At first, she appeared reluctant, but when we gave her a full description of the body, she agreed to accompany us. She looked at the dead woman and burst into tears. Half an hour later, after she recovered from the shock, we talked to her in the interrogation room at the city hall. It's Alice. There's no doubt about it. It's just terrible. My own sister dead. Now, if you try to take it easy, would you like another glass of water, Miss Allard? No, thank you. It's not just finding her dead. I guess I always knew that Alice would end up like this. I never wanted it this way, but I always knew it in my heart. How's that, ma'am? Well, to understand that, you'd have to know Alice. She was a beautiful girl, a wonderful person. Mm Mm-mm. Now, you said that you heard from Alice when she got here in L.A., is that right? That's right. She called right after she got off the train. Mm-hmm. What'd she say to you then? Well, as I told you, she said that she'd met some friends on the train and they were going out to see the town. Uh, did she say who these friends were? No, just said that they were going to pick up Ray and then go out in the town. Ray? Yes, Ray Fletcher. Mm-hmm. I tried to call him when Alice didn't show up, but there wasn't any answer at his apartment. Where does he live, ma'am? Out in Hollywood. I, I think it's on Selma someplace. I have the address. Mm-hmm. Who is this Fletcher? Well, that's something I'm not very proud of. Well, why is that, ma'am? Well, he's a friend of my husband. Well, not not really a friend in the real sense of the word. Sort of sort of an acquaintance. Mm-hmm. Well, why do you say that you're not very proud of it, ma'am? I don't understand. Well, I sort of feel that it's all my fault. Well, I still don't think I understand, ma'am. The divorce. Oh, Alice and Tom were on the verge of separating. Mm-hmm. Tom said that he'd come to just about the end of the line. Alice told me that they used to have terrible fights. Anyway, she was down here one time. Let me see, I, I think it was about about three months ago. She was terribly depressed, said that she and Tom had been fighting for several weeks. A couple of times he'd hit her. Can't understand it, I really can't. I told Alice I didn't believe it. Yes, ma'am. She showed me the bruises all across her back and shoulders. She said that one night they were going over the bills and Tom just seemed to go crazy. Started to rant and rave about how much they were in debt. Of course I knew why. I told Alice so. I said that it was her fault for driving him, always asking for something new, something else. Uh Uh-huh. She said that she told Tom that if he couldn't afford to keep her the way she wanted to live, that then she'd just have to find somebody who could. That's when he hit her. She left that night to come down here. Didn't hear her terrible. I don't agree with her, but I don't think any man has the right to hit a woman. Yes, ma'am. Well, she moped around the house for a couple of days. Said about how she was never going back to him. I felt kind of sorry for her. Even though I don't agree with her. After all, she was my sister. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Well, that night my husband came home and he brought this Ray Fletcher with him. Met him down at the office. Ray I mean, works... what'd you say, madam? Down at the office. Oh, Ray works for the same company. He's a steward on the ship that travels up the coast from here to Washington. Anyway, my husband brought him home for dinner. Ray said that we should all go out to eat, so we did. We had dinner and a few drinks, and then Ray brought us home, and he and Alice went on. Alice didn't get in until almost 3.30 in the morning. Oh, I see. That night, Ray was here again. He and Alice went out that night, and for the next four nights in a row, every night out until all hours. Hmm. I finally had a talk with her about it. Told her I didn't think Tom would like it, and that I wouldn't have her doing things like that while she was under my roof. That's when she told me that she was going to divorce Tom, that she and Ray were going to get married. Uh-huh. I told her I thought she was crazy. She didn't know what she was doing, but there wasn't any talking to her. She saw Ray every day... Then she went back up north to get things straightened out. I see. Well, did she follow through with her divorce plans? Well, as far as I know, she did. She wrote me and said that she talked to Tom about it and that they'd reached an agreement that he'd let her have her freedom. Well, how did he seem to take all this? Well, he called me one night and asked if I knew why Alice was leaving him. He didn't know about Ray. I told him all about it before. I thought that maybe Alice hadn't said anything about it. Mm, what was his reaction to it? I almost went crazy on the phone. Tom's a real jealous man. 
he could have gotten through the phone wires, I think he'd have taken my head off. He screamed that I'd influenced his wife, that it was all my fault. Well, why didn't you tell the officers from missing persons all of this when they were out there, ma'am? I didn't want my husband to know about it. Then, too, I thought that it might be better if Tom didn't know where Alice was. After what he said, I thought it would be better if he never saw her again. What's that, ma'am? That night, we had the argument on the phone. He said that she'd never leave him. Mm-hmm. That he'd see her dead first. The description of Ray Fletcher Mrs. Allard had given us tallied closely with that of Raymond Bartley. She also gave us his address and phone number. It was an apartment house in the southwest section of the city. Frank and I drove over but found that he'd moved and left no forwarding address. We checked the apartment, but it had since been cleaned and occupied. Again, we ran into the same problem. No one could give us any information as to his whereabouts. We went back to the city hall and ran the name Ray Fletcher through R&I. There was no record on anyone answering his description. We contacted the shipping line where he was employed, and they told us that they'd pull his employment record out of the files and call us back. We contacted the San Francisco Police Department, gave them the full details of the case, and had them check on the movements of the victim's husband, Tom Hudson, as a possible suspect. 4.52 p.m. Frank and I checked back into the city hall. Hudson sure got a motive. Yeah. Well, we'll know more when we hear from the San Francisco Department. Huh? Here we go. I'll check the book. Right. Anything? Yeah, there's a message from the shipping company Fletcher works for. He wants us to give him a call. Okay, what's the number? You got it there? Yeah. Hollywood 26709. Okay, I'll call it. Hollywood... Two, six, seven... Oh, nine. Oh, nine? Yeah, ask for Mr. August. August. Mm. Mr. August, please. Oh, my name's Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. Oh, Police Department, yes, ma'am. Yes, he asked me to call. Mr. August, this is Sergeant Friday. You asked me to call you? Yes, sir, that's right. Raymond Fletcher. Mm-hmm. When was it? Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much, sir. If you think of anything else, we'd appreciate a call. Yes, sir, Michigan, 5211. Right. Homicide, huh? Right. Thank you, sir. Bye. Well, we're doing real well. What do you mean? Fletcher sailed for Canada this morning. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. These are the reasons thousands are changing to Chesterfield and why you should change to Chesterfield. Only Chesterfield gives you premium quality in both regular and king size. Only Chesterfield names all its ingredients. And only Chesterfield gives you scientific facts in support of smoking. First such report ever published about any cigarette. A responsible consulting organization reports a study by a competent medical specialist and staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfields. For six months, a group of men and women smoked only Chesterfield, 10 to 40 a day, their normal amount. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields from 1 to 30 years, for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and end of the six months, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including x-rays, and covering the sinuses, nose, ears, and throat. After the examinations, the medical specialist stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Of course, these cigarettes were Chesterfields. Remember this report and buy Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size. Premium quality Chesterfield and much milder. <laughs> We contacted the San Pedro office of the shipping company and made sure that Fletcher was on board the ship when it had sailed. The management of the shipping line told us that it would take about 24 hours before the tanker would make its first stop at San Francisco. We got in touch with the San Francisco Police Department and talked to Inspector Charles Sutton. He told us that they'd place a stakeout where the ship was due to dock and that they would await our arrival. At the same time, Sutton told us that they had conducted an investigation of the dead woman's husband, Tom Hudson, and that as far as they could find out, he didn't have the opportunity to kill his wife. They said that the records at the steel mill where he worked showed that he'd been on the job every day for the past month and a half. Questioning of his neighbors showed that he'd spent his time off working around the house and was seen each evening. 
Inspector Sutton stated that when Tom Hudson was told of his wife's death, he broke down and said that although there had been some talk of divorce, none of it had really been serious. And that this trip that his wife had taken to Los Angeles was to straighten things out with Fletcher. Hudson flew down to Los Angeles and gave a positive identification of the body. We got in touch with the captain of the ship that Fletcher was on and filled him in on what had happened. He told us that he'd place the man under arrest and hold him in the ship's brig for us when they docked at San Francisco. Tuesday morning, 7.30 a.m., Frank and I checked out and flew up to San Francisco. We met with Inspector Sutton and Inspector Jules Zimmerman. They told us that the ship was expected to dock the following morning at 10.36 a.m. We were waiting when the gangplank was lowered. You are the officers? Yes, sir. I'm Inspector Sutton, San Francisco Police Department. Here are my credentials. These are Detectives Joe Friday and Frank Smith. They're from Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. You're the ones I talked to. I'm Captain Jackson. Oh, hey, there, nice Captain. To know you. Uh, down the break. He's been there since I got your message. I wonder if we could see him. Yeah, sure. We can go down this way. All right, bye. You sure Fletcher's the man you want? Well, we're not sure, sir. It looks that way. Hard to believe. Why is that, sir? Well, Fletcher's been with us for several years. Good man, hard worker. I know he's been studying for his papers. He wanted to be an engineer. Oh. I used to go by his room late at night on my way to the bridge. He'd be there, reading and working on the papers. Sure is hard to believe. Here we go through here. Okay. Yes, sir. Of course, I knew something had to be wrong. Sir? Well, once in a while, he used to get together with Fletcher on shore. We'd talk about what he was studying. I'd try to help him with his seamanship. This trip, I called him. I'd met an engineer that I thought Fletcher would like to talk to. I'd known the guy for years, just back from the Orient. Anyway, I called Fletcher. He told me he'd moved out, hadn't left any forwarding address. Uh-huh. I didn't hear from him at all. Then he called me and wanted to know if he could stay at my place for a few days. Said he had some trouble at the new place. He was living landlady, giving him a bad time. Uh-huh. You say where he'd been staying? Yeah, the, uh, uh, Broadleaf, something like that. Could it be the Greenleaf, sir? Yeah, that's it, Greenleaf. Said the landlady was a real prune, called her a miserable woman. Old Fletcher looked as if he'd been tying one on for about a week when he checked into my place. His clothes were a mess. Come on, it's down here. Okay, fine. When I told Fletcher about this, he was real arrogant. Said he didn't want to talk to anyone. Never seen him run like this before. Uh... All right, Fletcher, police officers are here. Come on out. Come on, Fletcher, let's go. I'll go in. How about it, Joe? Room's empty. A blockade of the dock area was set up immediately in the event Fletcher had escaped from the ship. All officers in the area began a search. A search of the ship was started. A check of Fletcher's cabin turned up several letters from Alice Hudson. In the letter, she told Fletcher that she was going back to her husband. We talked to the members of the crew who had been in the vicinity of the brig. From one of them, we found that Fletcher had been in custody as the ship entered the harbor. On the floor of the brig, we found a small strip of metal that Fletcher had used to pick the lock of the door. The search of the ship went on. 11.47 a.m. One of the seamen found Fletcher's coat on the forward part of the deck. It had been wedged in behind a lifeboat chock. The search of the dock netted us nothing. All we could assume was that Fletcher had escaped from the brig, jumped overboard, and then tried to swim to shore. Inspector Sutton got in touch with Captain Cornelius Murphy, skipper of police boat D.A. White. Captain Murphy and his crew began a search of the bay from the dock area to Land's End. All police officers in the bay area were notified of the escape. Captain Jackson furnished us with a good snapshot of Fletcher. Seven hours passed. The search continued. Apparently, Fletcher had made good his escape. Wednesday morning, April 23rd, we got a report from an officer in the search party that the body of a man answering Fletcher's description had been found out near Seal Rocks near the Golden Gate. Sutton, Zimmerman, Frank, and I drove out to Land's End. We got out of the car and walked the rest of the way. Watch your step, Frank. Yeah. Every time one of those waves breaks, it makes this ledge like glass. Sutton? Yeah, Joe. You see anything yet? No. Wait a minute. I'll see if I can yell to Zimmerman. He can see it from there. Maybe he can tell us if we're getting close. Yeah. Zimmerman? How are we doing? You hear what he's saying? Ah, wind's carrying his voice away. He's waving his arms, pointing down below us. Now, wait a minute. Watch it, Joe. It's a long way down. Yeah, you don't have to tell me. See anything? A little after this next wave breaks. Yeah, there he is. You see? Wedged in down here. Yeah. Looks like him. Hard to be sure with all this water, though. Yeah, I'll go down a little further. 
Take it easy, Joe. Yeah. Just take a minute. Watch it. I'm all right. How about it? Yeah. It's Fletcher. Well, I'd better get the crew up here and pull him out. Yeah. Must have been carried this far by the current, huh? Yeah, that's right, Joe. They get mean this time of the year. Well, that does it. Huh? Yeah, it looks that way. What's the matter, Joe? I was just thinking. Yeah? It's a rough way to die, isn't it? Sure is. You'd think he'd have known, wouldn't you, Joe? About those currents out there from Alcatraz to Angel Island. Some of the meanest currents in the world out there. Yeah, I know. You'd think a guy like Fletcher would have known better. Working on a ship, he should have known about that water. Well, maybe he did. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 23rd, an examination was held in the office of the coroner of the city and county of San Francisco. In a moment, the results of that examination. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, I just want to leave you with one thought tonight. Chesterfield is the first cigarette to give you scientific facts in support of smoking. Remember the study made by a competent medical specialist and staff. They examined a group of people who smoked only Chesterfields. After the examinations, the medical specialist stated, quote, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided. End of quote. Of course, these cigarettes were Chesterfield. Remember these facts and buy Chesterfields, either way you like them, regular or king size. Premium quality Chesterfields, and much milder. Upon completion of the autopsy, the body was identified as Raymond S. Fletcher. The identification was made by his personal effects, fingerprints, and the personal identification of Captain James R. Jackson. Further investigation showed that the suspect had rented the apartment where the body was found and that he was guilty of the murder of Alice Hudson. His fingerprints were checked and found to be the same as those on the murder weapon. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Peter Leeds. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a narcotics detail. You get a report that high-grade heroin is being sold in your city. The key men in the operation are well hidden. You have no leads to their identity. Your job? Stop them. These are the reasons thousands are changing to Chesterfield and why you should change to Chesterfield today. Only Chesterfield gives you scientific facts in support of smoking. Only Chesterfield names its ingredients. Ingredients that give you the best possible smoke. Only Chesterfield gives you premium quality in both regular and king size. That means king size Chesterfield contains tobacco of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. It's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. And there's enough to give you more than a one-fifth longer smoke. 
Yes, more than a fifth longer smoke from king-size Chesterfield. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. Buy them either way you like them. Premium quality Chesterfield. And much milder. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of narcotics detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. It was 9.37 a.m. when we got to the main jail. Felony section. Hi, John. Friday, Smith. Who do you want? Anderson, 302. Anderson, 302, interview. How's he feeling this morning, John? I don't know. I just checked in a while ago. I heard he gave the fellas some trouble early this morning. Guess it's pretty rocky. Hi, Anderson. What do you guys want? Want to talk to you. Down this way, Anderson. Hope you guys know I don't feel so good. Terrible night. I hope I never have to go through any more of them. Yeah. You gonna do something about it? What do you mean? You gonna get me out of here. Let me shove off. You know better than that, Anderson. Yeah. Should have known. You guys don't care. You just don't know. I didn't hear. Sit down. You guys got to do something for me, though. I can't take much more of it. Can't you talk to the doctor? Have him give me something. He's got it. Just a little bit. I tell you, I'm sick. We'll have the doctor give you some medicine, Anderson. A couple things we want to check with you. You know what I need. It ain't medicine. Can't we do this later? I tell you, I don't feel good. Can't you talk to the doctor? Your book is Fred J. Anderson. That's your true name? Yeah. Fred J. Anderson. What's the J stand for? You have to know. We do. Jeremiah, my father's name. You have any other names? What do you mean? You use any aliases? No, not. Any nicknames? No. You drive a car? Yeah. 49 Ford Convert. Who holds the pink slip on it? I do. You own it outright? Yeah, look, do we have to go through that whole thing? Can't you ask me later? You guys don't believe me, but you're going to find out when I keel over. You'll know that. What color is the car? Maroon. You know the license number? No. Where have you lived before? Before what? You gave the address of 10624 Ivorine Avenue. That's what we have here. Hollywood, is that right? Yeah, that's where I live. You belong to any lodges, anything like that? No. You ever in the armed services? No. No serial number, no branch. Now, look, how about knocking this off? I'm getting tired of you guys leaning on me. You drag me in here, ask a lot of questions. I tell you I don't feel good, you don't believe me. Leave me alone. Let me go back to my cell. Huh? As soon as I feel better, I'll answer all your questions. We got a job to do, Anderson. We didn't build this thing. You knew what had happened when you started. Now, what's your draft number? I don't know. Did you register? Sure. Draft card in your wallet? Yeah. And we can get it. You married? No, not now. You were, though, huh? Yeah, a couple of years ago. It didn't work. Claude well, was too nosy. Always wanted to know what I was doing. Always asking questions. Have any kids? No. What's your wife's name? Adelaide. How do you spell that? Uh, A-D-E-L-A-D-E. Adelaide Morton. Lousiest two years I ever spent. Where'd she live? I didn't know. Lost track. Where did she live? Same place up on Ivory. And I moved out when we got the divorce. I haven't seen her since. May still be there for all I know. How about your nearest living relative? Yeah, how about him? Maybe you got things wrong, Anderson. You're booked in here on a narcotics charge. That's pretty serious. This isn't the game. The sooner you realize it, the better off you're going to be. All right. Nearest relative. My brother lives in St. Paul. I don't know the address. I got it at home. We don't agree on a lot of things. I haven't seen him for a year or so. What's his name? Henry Alton Anderson. That's your nearest relative? That's what I said. Anybody else? No. How about your friends? Who are they? That's the line. What? That's where I stop answering these questions. You can maybe tie a bum rap on me, but you ain't going to get my friends mixed up in it. No, sir, that's where I draw the line. All right, suit yourself, Anderson. We've got a lot of time. Got a cigarette, Joe? Yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Anderson? No. Thanks. Yeah. Why do you have to know who my friends are? For a lot of reasons. 
I don't want to embarrass him, that's all. I don't want him to have to answer a lot of silly questions. You can see that, can't you? Can't you? Yeah, Anderson, we don't need to embarrass anybody. We just thought it would help here. Well, I won't tell you. I don't feel well. I don't feel well at all. I'm not hooked anyway. You got no right to say that. Look at your arm. I ain't gonna try to cut you. Sure, I, I tried this stuff once or twice, but that don't mean I'm hooked. A couple of pops, that's all. Just a couple of times. That's not the way your arm makes it look. You've almost run out of places to put that needle, haven't you? So maybe I was wrong. Maybe it was a couple of more times than I thought. All right, now look, Anderson. I'm going to lay this out for you. We know there's a lot of H floating around. Has been for the past three months, and it's high grade. We know that you and the bunch you work for aren't too choosy who you sell it to. Now, we want the names and where you're getting the stuff. You say you're sick now. Wait a few more hours. Wait till your stomach starts to turn over. Wait till you can't make your hands do what you want them to. Wait till your head starts to crack open. You'll feel different then. We can wait. Well, let's take him back, Frank. Come on. Wait a minute. Yeah? You gonna take me back to the cell? You called it. I don't want to go back in Well, that's where you're going. You gonna call the doctor, tell him to take care of me? He knows already. He'll do what he can. I can't go that route. You know that. Iron Cure, I couldn't take it. It'd kill me. You should have thought of that a long time ago. Yeah, you can say that. You ain't got the habit. It's easy for you to say that. You don't know. All right, let's go. No, I want you got to do this. I told you we'd do what we could. That ain't enough. It'll have to do. I, I told you, help me out. Give me a hand, then I'll get over on your side. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. All right, tell us where you're getting the stuff. Can't you help me out first? The doctor will see you. Okay. Where do you want me to start? Where do you get the stuff? From a guy. What's his name? Paul. Paul what? I don't know what his last name is, just Paul. Where do you meet him? Hollywood. That's a big place. Where in Hollywood? Different places. Sometimes the corner of Hollywood and Vine, sometimes at Highland, once at Cherokee and Sunset, different places. How do you know where? He gets word to me. How? Guy tells me Paul wants to see me, that's all. What does Paul look like? Big guy, real big. What's he look like? How tall is he? Six, two or three, maybe 250. What's his coloring? Dark. Looks like he's just come back from the beach. Looks real tan. You guys are going to help me out, aren't you, after all I've done? What color is his hair? Black, curly black hair. How about it? You going to do me some good? Any marks or scars on him? Huh? This Paul, any marks or scars on him that'll make him easier to spot? Yeah, he's got a scar across the bridge of his nose right here. How old is he? Oh, I guess about 38, maybe 40. Drive a car, do you know? Never saw one. He always walked up on me. Is he a user? I don't think so. Maybe Joy Pops once in a while. I don't think he's on his study, though. Is he the boss? Huh? He the head man in the operation? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I think he's just one of the guys. Where'd you meet him? Bar, downtown. Were you introduced? No, he just came up and started to talk to me. We got along, made a deal. I was around trying to make a buy, get a connection. All right. Why don't you look at some pictures? See if you can point this fellow Paul out for us. Look, I've done my part. I told you, now you guys got a chit to pick up. When do I get to see the doctor? When are you going to fix me? We'll up? talk to him. That wasn't a deal. We made no deals. You said you'd give me a hand. We will. The doctor will do everything he can for you. We can't promise you any more than that. Not much. That's the way it is. Lousy deal. Everything's on your side. You know it and you sure right it. Someday I'll learn it. Just don't pay. Yeah, what's that? Never scratch a cop's back. Ten forty-six a.m. We returned Fred Anderson to his cell and called a doctor for him. For the past four and a half months, an organized gang had been selling high-grade heroin. From our informants, we learned that the drug was being made available to anyone who could pay the price. When we tried to stop the activities of the gang, we found ourselves up one blind alley after another. None of the buys we arranged took place. Meets with the higher-ups failed to materialize. When Fred Anderson was picked up, the narcotics found on his person was of the same quality and type that was being pushed around town. 2.34 p.m. We picked up Anderson and took him to the city hall to look at the mug books. He failed to identify any of the pictures. We checked the description of Paul against the people known to have dealt in narcotics, but failed to come up with an identification. Anderson was returned to his cell and held pending trial for violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony. 4.17 p.m. We check back into Captain Kearney's office. That's it, Skipper. We're right back where we were four months ago. Nothing at all on this Paul, huh? Well, if there is, we haven't been able to find it. You think Anderson's telling everything he knows about it? Oh, I doubt it. No, that description would fit a hundred guys. You got any ideas of where we go from here? Well, yeah, maybe. It might not work, but it's someplace to start. Well, let's hear it. All right, can we take a look at the map over here? From the information we got, the main operation must be taking place someplace down around here, around the harbor area. Yeah. From what we hear, the stuff's there, all right. Problem is how to find a connection. Well, maybe if we just lose a man down there, we thought. Put a man down there and let him work on his own. He might be able to come up with some answers. Pretty risky, Joe. It's a rough place. I wonder if it'd be worth risking a man down there. I don't think we got much of a choice, Skipper. No. Well, we figured that maybe if I went down there and let it get around that I wanted to make a buy, a big one, maybe they'd come to me. 
Why you? Why not let me handle it? Well, I thought that's the way we figured it. They know you down there. You used to work that area. You're not in any better position, Joe. Fellas walking the streets down there that you've tangled with, they're not about to form any fan clubs for you. Well, we've tried every other way. Informants, leads, every known pusher's been talked to. Still, the stuff keeps coming in, being sold. Where we sit, this looks like one way to get them. All right, how are you going to work it? Well, I figure maybe I'll check into some hotel down there, eat in the places in the neighborhood, be seen around the bars, let it get around that I'm here from San Francisco, want to make a buy, and see what happens. You know anything about San Francisco? Well, I know the place pretty well. I spent a couple years up there when I was in the Army. I still don't like this idea of not being able to tag you, though. Well, there's no other way. I suppose so. How are we going to know how you're making out? Well, I'll get word whenever I can, let you know before the buy, tell you where and when. All right, Joe, you bought a piece of it. I'm not going to tell you what to do, you know, but take it easy. Don't make a target out of yourself. Remember, keep in touch with us. Right, Skipper. Let us know as much as you can, huh? Yeah. Take it easy, huh, Joe? Don't want anything to happen to you. Yeah, well, I'm on your side there. August 4th, 8.35 a.m. Frank and I had identification made up bearing the name Joe Arnold. After a final talk with Captain Kearney, I went home, got my car, and left for San Pedro. 6.42 p.m. I checked into a hotel on 6th Street. The hotel, according to the information we had obtained, was near the narcotics distribution center. 8.12 8.12 p.m. I went next door to the bar. Yeah? Give me a beer, huh? Eastern? I don't care. Okay. That'll be 30 cents. All right. There you go. Thanks. Not much doing, huh? No, it's pretty early yet. That's a little frantic later. Mm-hmm. You're around here, aren't you? Yeah, I just down from San Francisco. Mm, nice town. I was up there a couple of years ago. Spent a week. Sure like it. Yeah, it's a good place to live. Mm, sure seems to be. You know, if I could get a job up there, I think I'd move up. Yeah? Hey, slide down, huh? We can talk while I clean up these glasses. Well, that is, if you don't mind. Talk. Oh, it's all right. Glasses. Seems like you never get them done. Yeah. You down here on business? Well, I guess you could say that. Uh-huh. Sort of combined, huh? Eh? Yeah. And now look at that. What's that? I spent half the day slicing these oranges for old-fashioned and then people don't eat them. <laughs> Not a waste of motion. Yeah, I guess you do. Uh, what line of business you in? Nothing special. Just moving around. Wherever I can make a buck, I stop. They should have to call me a promoter, I guess. Is that what you put down your income tax returns? What? You know, when you fill out your income tax... It says there how you make your living. Where do you put that? Business management. That's good. Business management. Whose business you manage? Mostly my own. It's a pretty good idea for everybody, isn't it? Three weeks passed. I spent some time in most of the local bars and eating places. On occasion, I'd see other officers from the narcotics detail up in L.A. On each of these meetings, I'd have to pass them by and hope that they wouldn't show any evidence that they knew me. During the three weeks, I became friendly with the bartender, and in the course of many conversations, I let it be known that I was in town hoping to make a substantial narcotics buy. At first, he appeared only mildly interested, but then he began to ask more and more questions about my background and about the people I knew in San Francisco. Friday, August 27, 9.31 p.m. All right, Joe, how goes the battle? I'm moving around. That's about all I can say. You want a beer? Yeah, fine. Here's your 30 cents. Well, not tonight, Joe. It's on the house. Why? What's the occasion? I got some good news for you, Joe. Yeah? Yeah, I got a friend I want you to meet. I think he can help you make a connection. Yeah? Where is he? No, look, I'm not promising anything, Joe. The guy knows some people and might be able to help you. Well, why are you so interested? Well, I figure maybe I can make a buck or two. Mm-hmm. All right. Is the guy here now? Yeah. He's back there in the end booth. See? With the other guy? Uh, well, that helps. Which one is your friend? The big one. You know, the fellow with the gray suit on. Scar over his nose. Gray suit, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I see him. Come on, I'll take you back. All right. Nice guy, Joe. You'll like him. Well, what'd you tell him? Well, just that you were here from Frisco. Said you were interested in the connection if the deal was good. Uh-huh. You make your own deal now. Look, I got nothing to do with that. You'll really like him. Paul? Yeah? This is the guy I was telling you about. Joe Arnold. This is Paul Ginner. Oh, hi, Joe. Sit down. Bring us another round, will you? Yeah, right away, Paul. You know what you want? Make it snappy, huh? Yeah, right away. Beer, scotch, and soda, and old-fashioned Irish whiskey. Yeah, that's right. Leave the garbage out of the old-fashioned. Yeah. Here, sit down, Joe. Yeah, thank you. 
Just Jack Potter. You two all know each other. All right. Yeah, he's from Frisco, too. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Now, a report every smoker should hear. Only Chesterfield gives you scientific facts in support of smoking. First such report ever published about any cigarette. A responsible consulting organization reports a study by a competent medical specialist and staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfields. For six months, a group of men and women smoked only Chesterfield, 10 to 40 a day, their normal amount. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields from 1 to 30 years for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and end of the six months, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including x-rays and covering the sinuses, nose, ears, and throat. After a thorough examination of every member of this group, the medical specialist stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Of course, these cigarettes were Chesterfields. Remember this report and buy Chesterfields, either way you like them, regular or king size. Premium quality Chesterfield and much milder. In normal undercover work, the police officer is in constant touch with the men working with him. This is done either by one officer trailing the undercover man or by phone calls to a fellow officer at appointed times. Rarely does the working detective put himself in the position where he doesn't have constant contact with the men he works with. However, in this instance, it appeared to be the only way information and evidence could be obtained. Friday, August 27th, 10.46 p.m. The bartender brought the drinks. Paul Ginter and Jack Potter started asking the questions. From Frisco, huh? Yeah, I'm from San Francisco. Jack and I do some business together, real estate. That's so? Here you're in the management business, huh? The bartender talks a lot, don't he? He knows who to talk to. Tells me you're down here on business. Yeah. Where do you live up north? Hyde near Taylor. I used to live around there. Is that right? Yeah. Have you ever finished that work they were doing at the corner of 3rd and Market? What's that? And the construction they were doing at 3rd and Market. You know, that new dime store, they get it finished? Yeah, they got it finished. It's not at 3rd and Market. Now, what's this all about, Ginter? What are you trying to prove? What? You got any questions to ask about me? Ask me. Don't ask your boy to do it here. You want to check up on me? Talk to somebody who's in San Francisco now. Have them check around. It's all there. I got no worries. When you two get tired of playing games, let me know. I got no time for them now. I'll see you around. Sit down, Arnold. Yeah. Now read it any way you want. You say you want to do business, I'm your boy. We gotta be sure. Can't take any chances. Cops are dying to find out. Can't let that happen, you know. Yeah, well, if you're ready to talk a deal, let's get to it, huh? You figure to do this business in Frisco? San Francisco, yeah, that's where I figure to work. You're out of your mind. That town's tied in a drum. Nobody can get under the lid. Now, you look, I don't ask you where you get your real estate. Don't tell me how to manage my business. I want to make an investment for a client. I got ten grand. That'll buy a whole tract of your lots. Now, are they for sale or not? It's that simple. Well, now, you're in kind of a hurry, ain't you? I've been here for three weeks. I don't want to spend any more time than I have to. When can I make the buy? Tell you what, let's take a tour of the town, meet some friends of mine, and then we can talk about it. No need to be in a hurry. I got to see it first. I want to make sure it's the same stuff I heard about. Where'd you hear? A few rumbles around. High-grade stuff. That's what I want. Let's go. Can't you call this friend? I don't want to go traipsing all over town. He moves around. Sometimes it's kind of hard to find. Besides, serves two purposes. What's that? Give you a chance to meet some people. Once you get to know the town, you won't be in such a hurry to get away. There's just one thing. Maybe I won't like your friends. More important. Yeah. Maybe they won't like you. For the next three hours, Ginter, Potter, and I visited almost every bar, nightclub, and coffee stand in the area. At each of the places, Ginter would ask for a man named Ainley. When he was told that Ainley wasn't in, we'd sit and have a drink. Ginter would call as many people as he knew over to the table, introduce them to me, and then before we left, he'd hold a conference with them at their tables. At several of the places, I saw men who I knew were involved in the narcotics trade, but none of them happened to be close to Ginter. It was obvious what Ginter was trying to do. He was checking me with the people in the business to see if any of them could recognize me or could give them any information about me. Saturday morning, August 28th, 3.14 a.m. We stopped for breakfast. Hey, you want some sugar? No, I take it by. Okay, how about you, Jack? Yeah, thanks. Looks like it might have been a wild goose chase, huh? I don't know where Ainley could be. Why don't you come off of this, Skinner? Yeah, what do you mean? I'm not a new boy. You're about as subtle as a bulldozer. What's the scoop here? Your friends tell you anything about me? I don't know what you're talking about. 
Just looking for Ainley. It's as phony as that look you got on your face now. How about it? Do I make the buy or don't I? All right, you make the buy. When? You got the money? I'll have it when the buy comes off. Ten thousand. That's right. Okay, you can pick up the stuff tomorrow night. Four thirty a.m. Getter outlined the plan for the buy. At seven thirty that night, I was to meet him on the corner of Lebanon and Spring Streets. He'd take me to Ainley, who had the plan. Five twenty-nine a.m. I drove back to Los Angeles. I put in a call to Frank Smith at his home and filled him in on the developments. It was arranged for me to be spotted when I got to the corner and then to be followed until the buy was made. At that time, Frank and the other officers working with him would move in and take Ginter and Ainley. I told Frank that I'd leave my car at the corner of 6th and Spring at noon that day. At that time, he would place a briefcase on the back seat of the car. In the briefcase would be packages of cut newspaper with a few $10 bills attached to each stack on the outside. I checked into a hotel down on 5th and got some sleep. At 7.30 p.m. August 28th, I was at the corner of Spring and Lebanon. Hi, Arnold. Hello, Gerard. Where do we go? You got the money? In this case here. Where's your car? A lot around the corner. We have to drive to the meet? Yeah. Come on, this way. My car's just around the corner. Don't worry. We'll take mine. All right. No problem. Makes it nice. Yeah. Want to slide in this side? Be quicker. All right. Where do we have to go? It's not far. Well, how come we didn't make the deal in Pedro? Hainer likes to do the big business up here. More people, easier cover. Mm-hmm. When we first pulled away from the curb, I thought I could make out Frank and Captain Kearney in back of us. We drove for about an hour. Ginter cut down every side street in the area. Every place he drove, he kept his eye on the rearview mirror. I was afraid he'd make the tail. He drove out Sunset Boulevard and back down Wilshire, down Spring and over to Hope Street. Along the way, I lost sight of Frank and Captain Kearney. Finally, at 8.36, we pulled up at the corner of Spring and Lebanon. What's the deal, Gitter? This is where we started. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we didn't have a tail. Are you satisfied now? Yeah. Come on in here. This hotel here? Mm-hmm. Ainley do business in a rat trap like this? He works where he has to. Come on, it's on the second floor. We can walk. You sure this is the same stuff that I heard about? You'll see. Understand, I'm not buying any junk. Don't worry. What we got's good. It's down here. Come in. Hello, Mr. Ainley. Mr. Jenner, this the young man? Yes, sir. This is Mr. Arnold, Mr. Ainley. How are you? Do you have the money, young man? Yeah, it's in here. You got the stuff? I have, here in this case. Looks like a doctor's bag. It's a good place to carry it. Doctor's bag. Here, open a bill yourself. High grade, best we can get. Yeah, it looks all right. Fine. Now, if we could have the money. Here you are. Now, if it's all right with you, I'll get out of here now. We'd like you to wait until we count the money. It's all there. I don't doubt it, young man, but just to make sure so there'll be no repercussions later, you understand? Mm-hmm, everything looks in order. What are you trying to pull? What do you mean? What is this, Ginter? What's the matter? There's nothing but paper, plain newspaper. All right, Arnold, make a move or kill you. Let me see. What are you trying to pull? All right, you're under arrest, both of you. Cop, lousy cop. That's right. You got the shoe on the wrong foot, cop. I'm telling you what to do. There's men all through this building. You won't make the front door. How about it, Mr. Ainley? Let's take him down to Pedro. We can get rid of him there. It'd be better. How about the rest of them? He's bluffing. You made sure you weren't followed, didn't you? Yeah, I think so. Did you or didn't you? Yeah. Then there's nothing to worry about. Let's go. Well, you heard him, Arnold. Whatever your name is. Yeah. Let's walk down. Not too fast. I'm parked out front. Good. Hey, this is far enough. Come on, don't stall. Don't cause any trouble. You won't make it. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Come on. Now move, move. All right, down these stairs. Smith, cover the other side. Yeah. Walker, block off that end of the hall. Right, Captain. You all right, Friday? Yeah, fine. Watch that guy, Frank. I got him. Hold it up, mister. You're not going any place. Fool, you stupid fool, Ginter. Can't even lose a tail. Okay. Both of you. Hands behind your back. I told you to make sure you weren't followed. I told you. I lost them. I know I did. I tell you I lost them. All right, let's go. Come on, let's move. You didn't lose them. It's an up talk. Come on. Those guys never learn, do they, Frank? What do you mean? Well, they keep lying right up at the finish, don't they? How's that? Well, get her and there. They'll be arguing all the way downtown about them losing you when you were tailing us. Shouldn't be any argument, Joe. We lost you someplace along Wilshire. 
But you got here, all right. I thought this is the way you played it. No, we just took a guess you might come back to your car. Yeah, well, it's a pretty good guess for me, anyway. Why, we'd have gotten him sooner or later. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 9th, trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Veneman. Friends, I have just enough time to remind you that Chesterfield is the first cigarette to name all its ingredients. First to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. And first to give you scientific facts in support of smoking. I believe you should change to Chesterfields, either way you like them, regular or king size. And do it today. Paul Robert Ginter and James Arthur Ainley were tried and convicted of violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony. They received sentences as prescribed by law. Violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony, is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than six years. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next seven years of bigger and bigger enrollments, America's grade schools will need nearly a quarter of a million extra teachers besides those to fill normal vacancies. This great need, plus the growing public interest in education and improvements in schools, make elementary school teaching a more rewarding career than ever, a career that high school and college students should certainly consider. Education holds America's future, perhaps your future. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Whit Connor, Harry Bartell, Lee Marvin. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield. The only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call that the body of a man has been found in an alley. He's been strangled with his own necktie. The body has been robbed. There's no lead to the killer. Your job, find him. Thousands are changing to Chesterfield, both regular and king size, because Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both sizes. That means King Size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. It's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. And there's enough to give you more than a one-fifth longer smoke. Yes, more than a fifth longer smoke from King Size Chesterfield. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Buy them either way you like them. Premium quality Chesterfield. And much milder. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. 
From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, February 10th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We'd gotten the call at 8.36 a.m., and it was 8.49 a.m. when we got to the corner of 18th and Winfield, the back alley. Must be it there. Yeah. Yeah, there's Harper. Sergeant, back here. Hi, Friday, Smith. Harper, Hi. where is he? Back here. Who found him? The fellow gives his name is Alexander Jones. Where's he now? Al's got him out in the car. Figured you'd want to talk to him. Pretty bad off. Yeah. Must have had himself a real time last night. He's seeing things this morning. We picked him up just coming out of the alley. Stopped to talk to him. It looked like he was having a real rough time. Jones, huh? Yeah, probably not his real name. I've seen him around here before. There's the body. Uh-huh. Uh, Strangle. Yeah, ambulance is here. Here's a slip. He was DOA. Yeah. See how the tie is pulled up out of the shirt? Looks like he was robbed. Pockets all turned inside out. Uh-huh. Want to call the crime lab, Frank? Yeah. Found a couple of footprints over here in the gutter. Heel indentation looks pretty good. Yeah. Put this box over them. I don't know if they'll mean anything. Thought I'd better keep them for you, though. Mm-hmm. Looks like the body was dragged back here, doesn't it? Marks in the dirt. Yeah. How about the neighborhood, Harper? Anybody around here see anything? Well, I don't know. There wasn't anybody on the streets when we picked up this Jones guy. Haven't had a chance to canvass the area. Didn't want to leave here, you know. Yeah. Well, we better call the office head and send out a couple of men. Call Lee. He'll be right out. Got him at home. He's sound asleep. Said he'd call the lab and have Alan bring the stuff out and Lee'd come right here. How about the corner? He's on his way. Well, I want to call the office, Frank, and get some help checking the stores around, see if anybody heard anything. I used the phone in the cigar store on the corner. Guy on there said he opened up about 7, 7.15. Said he didn't know anything about it. Store's back door is right there. See the one with the cigar posters on it? Yeah. All right, come on. I'll call in and then we can check some of the other places, huh? All right. I'll wait here, Sergeant, until the rest of them come. Fine, thanks, Harper. We'll be in the stores around the street side there. Okay. Let us know when Lee gets here, will you? Yeah. What do you think, Joe? Well, I don't know. The way he's dressed there, good clothes. Looked like he had money. Doesn't figure, does it? Yeah. What was he doing down here? a.m. I called the office and two teams of men were sent out to help us canvass the area. Frank and I checked with the owner of a liquor store who was getting ready to open for business. He told us that he'd come in early that morning to clean up his store and that he'd taken a load of trash out into the alley at about 8.25 a.m. But at that time, he hadn't seen the body. He went on to say, however, that it was possible that it might have been there and he just didn't notice it. 9.26 a.m. Sergeant J. Allen and Lieutenant Lee Jones from the crime lab arrived and began collecting the physical evidence. The body and the surrounding area were photographed. Photographs were taken of the footprints that Officer Harper had found. They were compared with the shoes worn by the victim, but they didn't match. The coroner went through the dead man's pockets but found nothing. Everything had been removed, all his personal effects, if any. The crew from the crime lab went through the alley and found a wallet behind the garbage cans at the rear of the liquor store. There was no money in it, but other papers hadn't been disturbed. Driver's license, social security card, and several business cards in the wallet bore the name of Arthur McKinley. The description on the license matched that of the victim. Comparison of the thumbprint on the driver's license with those taken from the body matched. McKinley's home address was listed as 9722 Willetta Street in Hollywood. The coroner removed the body. 10.52 a.m., Frank and I talked to Alex Jones, the man who had been in the alley where the body had been found. We had him take everything out of his pockets. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't kill anybody. We didn't say you did. All we want to know is what were you doing in that alley? I went there to get away. From what? People. They're no good. None of them. No good. You got a job? Yeah, I work. What do you do? Wash dishes sometimes. Pearl diver? No, sir. No pearl diver. I'm a bartender. I don't feel so good. You got anything to drink around here? You know better than that, don't you? I didn't mean booze. Something cold. Feels like somebody's closed a valve in my head. Feels like it's going to blow apart. Isn't there something, anything, as long as it's cold. How about a Coke? Yeah, be fine. I'll get it for you. Want one, Joe? No, no, thanks. Mind if I go with you? Kind of stuffy in here. All right, come on, we'll all walk down. You ever been arrested, Alex? Yeah, a couple of times. Picked me up for being drunk. What's your real name, Alex? Stafford. Alex Stafford, that's the truth. Where are you from? Kansas. Mm Mm-hmm. What are you doing out here? 
Figured that when I got out of the service, I'd come out here and go to work. Yeah? Got out here, spent a couple of days looking for a job, had my muster and out pay about 400 bucks. Figured I didn't have to go to work right away. Uh -huh. All right, just a second. All right, here you go. Thanks. You want one, Frank? No, thanks. I want to check R&I and I see if they finished the run on McKinley yet. It's sure cold. Tastes good. Feel better. Well, that's fine. All right, let's go. Frank, see you back at the interrogation room. Okay, Joe. Want to stop at the office, give the coroner's office a call? Yeah. Like, like I was telling you, I, I figured that I didn't have to come up with a job right away, so I started to see the town. You know, try to find a place to work where I could maybe do some good. Right. Where I, where I could do some good. Where the tips would be good, you know, nice people. Mm -hmm. Well, I went around to the bars, talked to the bartenders, checking around. Each of, each of the places I'd have a drink, you know, just, just to be sociable. Yeah. It wasn't long before my dough was gone. I was flat broke, kicked out of my room. We can't blame the landlady. She carried me for a couple of months. Finally said I had to go. All right, go ahead. Well, what do you mean when you said that you were running away from people? I, I got a job yesterday washing dishes in a restaurant down on Spring. I worked like a dog. When I left last night, they paid me. I guess the boss knew I didn't have any money, no place to sleep. Yeah. I started to find a bed. And then I got to thinking that a drink might make me sleep better. So I stopped at a bar and had a couple. I had a couple more. I guess I fell asleep. Yeah. And anyway, I went into the alley. That one where you found the dead man. And I sat down and I went to sleep again. When I woke up, I was walking out when a cop in the car stopped me. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I didn't know the man was in there. Honest, I didn't. Now, you got to believe me, because somebody's got to believe me. I didn't know he was there. Anything? Not on McKinley. Found Alex record. Yeah. Like you said, a couple of drunk arrests, that's all. I told you. Didn't I tell you that? I got nothing to hide. I didn't even know the man was there. All right, take it easy. Anything from the corner? Yeah, Joe, I call. Fixes the time of death at about 11.30 last night. Body hasn't been posted yet. All right. You prove where you were at 11.30 last night, can you, Alex? I don't know. I was someplace. Yeah, we know that, but where? Well, I got a thing. 11.30. I was, I was still working. I was washing dishes in the place over on Spring. You can prove that, can you? Yeah, yeah, sure. The boss, he'll tell you. He saw me. I didn't leave until 12. That's when I left the place. 12 o'clock, he'll tell you. 12 midnight. All right, Alex. Can I go now? Well, we got to put in a call first. Maybe it might be better if we held you over a little while. Why? I haven't done anything. Well, it's against the law to be drunk on the streets. You know that, Alex. Yeah, I guess I do. You going to put me in jail? No, we're going to have to book you. The judge will decide where you're going to go. Probably be the county work farm. Yeah. Well, it's probably better that way. Give me a chance to get off the booze. Boy, I had it this time. Seeing those things. Just one thing, Sergeant? Yeah. I want to make sure you understand that, that you really believe me. What's that, Alex? I'm not a dishwasher. I'm a bartender. Twelve eighteen p.m. We had Alex Stafford booked at the main jail on a charge of violation of four one two seven LAMC drunk. We called the place where he'd been employed and found that he'd been telling the truth about the time he had left the restaurant on Spring Street. One thirty six p.m. We drove out to McKinley's home in Hollywood. It was a small stucco cottage set into the side of a hill. In front of the house, there was a boy's bicycle and a smaller child's wagon. Frank rang the bell and we waited. Yes? Miss McKinley? Yes, that's right. What do you want? Police officers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. It's about Arthur, isn't it? Isn't it? It might be better if we talked inside, Mrs. McKinley. All right. Come on in. You have to excuse the way the house looks. I haven't felt like cleaning it up. I've been so worried about Arthur. That's quite all right, ma'am. Now, what is it you want to tell me about him? He's dead, isn't he? You don't have to lie about it. I know he's dead. I spent the whole night thinking about it. You can probably tell I haven't gotten any sleep. I don't want you to lie about it. I want the truth. Arthur's dead, isn't he? Yes, ma'am, he is. I'll have to sit down. 
Well, something we can get for you, Miss McKinley? Water, something like that? No, nothing. Why do you say you knew your husband was dead, ma'am? I just knew it, that's all. I can't tell you how. I can't put it into words, but I just knew it, that's all. When he called last night, I knew. What time was that, ma'am? About 6.30. He said he was just leaving the shop and that he was on his way home. It was his birthday. He's going to stop and get some beer and a couple of bottles of bourbon. Mm-hmm. We're having some people in. He said he was going to stop for some things. And then he said he'd be right home. Yes, ma'am. Well, the children waited up for him till 10 o'clock. That's way past their bedtime. I, I let them wait up. They, they had some presents they wanted to give their father. Arthur Jr. had made a wallet and handcraft class at school, all tooled and carved and everything. It's on the table there. Mm-hmm. Little girl got him an ashtray. She picked it out by herself. It's on the table, too. Guess maybe you'll never get it now. I wonder if we could call your family doctor, ma'am. You don't look like you're well. No. I just can't believe it yet. But I know it's true. That's funny, isn't it? I know it's true, but I don't believe it. <laughs> No, it's true, and I don't believe it. How did it happen? Was it an accident in the car? No, ma'am. He was murdered. Arthur. Arthur, he was murdered? That's right, Miss McKinley. Miss McKinley. There's no Mr. McKinley anymore. He was murdered. I think maybe you better let us call a doctor for you, ma'am, get you something. No, there's nothing a doctor can do. Nothing anybody can do. Nothing. Who did it, you know? You know who killed him? No, ma'am, we don't, not yet. You said your husband called you from the shop, ma'am. What shop would that be? That's the floor shop. Our shop. We owned it. He called me from there about 6.30 and said he'd be home. He was going to stop for some things and then he'd be home. But he wasn't. I knew it. I knew it all night. I thought and I thought of what I'd say, what I'd do, how I'd feel, but now none of it fits. None of it seems to matter. Nothing matters much. Nothing. He said he was coming right home. Who's your family doctor, ma'am? Hmm? What'd you say? Your family doctor, ma'am. Who is he? Dr. Simpkins in Hollywood. Dr. Simpkins, Hollywood, 27083. You want to call him? Yeah. He said he was going to pick up a few things and come right home. My husband, Arthur McKinley. You know that, do you? Ma'am? There is no Mr. McKinley anymore, is there? We called the McKinley family doctor. He arrived and gave Mrs. McKinley a sedative. Frank and I talked to her before it took effect. We asked her about her husband's friends, his business associates. She could give us no new leads. She told us that her husband usually brought the weekend receipts from the store home with him on Sunday night so that he could make out the deposit slip for the bank. She said that he usually had about three to four hundred dollars on Sunday night. She gave us the name of the liquor store where he did business. 2.47 p.m., Frank and I drove out to the store. Gentlemen, what can I do for you? Mr. Kennedy? Night. Police officer, Mr. Kennedy, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Sure, I ain't help the police. Nothing that I've done, is it? No, sir. It's about Arthur McKinley. He get home last night? His wife called, seemed pretty upset. Nothing wrong, is it? Was Mr. McKinley in here last night, sir? Yeah, he was. Let's see, I guess it's about a quarter to seven. Come in, got a case of beer, a couple of bottles of bourbon. Uh-huh. Was there anybody with him when he came in? No, no, there wasn't. Did he seem all right to you when he was here? What do you mean? Well, was he in good spirits? Did he act like anything was wrong? No, of course that don't mean anything. Sir? Well, even if there was anything wrong with Arthur, you'd never know it. <laughs> always laughing, always had a joke. He had a great one last night, real funny. Yeah? He told the one about the two musicians that were walking down the railroad track, and one of them said to the other, Boy, this is the longest stairway i ever been down. Well, yes, sir. And then the other musician said, I don't mind that, but these low banisters are killing me. <laughs> low banisters. <laughs> Hey, what's this all about, anyway? Something happened to Arthur? He's been murdered, Mr. Kennedy. Arthur? Arthur McKinley? You sure? Yes, sir. We're sure. How about that? Only last night I saw him laughing away. He was killed. You know who did it? No, sir, not yet. How about that? I bet his wife's pretty upset. Well, do you know anyone who might want to kill him? No, not Arthur. Anybody in the neighborhood he had quarrels with? Any disagreements? No, not I can think of. Well, has there been anybody new, anybody you don't know, hanging around the neighborhood lately? Anybody who could have known about McKinley's carrying that money around with him? Well, let me think. Yeah, come to think about it, there is a fella. 
Seen him around the last couple of days. Matter of fact, I saw him last night when I helped Arthur carry the beer out to the car. Sure, that's where I saw him. Sir? He was in the car with Arthur. February 10th, 3.50 p.m. We continued to question John Kennedy. He told us that when Arthur McKinley had left the liquor store, he had carried a case of beer out to the car for him. Kennedy said there was a man waiting in the car. The liquor store owner told us that he had seen the man in the neighborhood on several previous occasions. That the man had talked to most of the shopkeepers in the vicinity asking for odd jobs. Kennedy went on to say that he had hired him himself once to wash the front windows of the store. He gave us a complete description and Frank called it into the office. A local and an APB were gotten out on him. Kennedy was unable to give us his name or tell us where the suspect might live. He agreed to go downtown to the city hall and look through the mug books for us. He called his brother down to take charge of the store, and as soon as he arrived, Kennedy was taken down to the office. 5.17 p.m. We drove back to the McKinley home. Mrs. McKinley had recovered from the initial shock of finding out that her husband was dead. We asked her if she knew where her husband's car was, and she told us that as far as she knew, he had driven it the night before and that she hadn't seen it since. She gave us the description and license number, and we called it into the office. A broadcast was gotten out on it. We asked Mrs. McKinley to go with us to her husband's store, and she agreed. On a table in back of the store, we found two empty beer bottles and a couple of glasses. Leighton Prince was called, and they came out and lifted two sets of fingerprints from the bottles and the glasses. Crime Lab came out and photographed the place. There was no sign of a struggle, but there was evidence that there had been a party there the night before. We drove Mrs. McKinley back to her home, and at 8.13 p.m., Frank and I checked back into the city hall. Long day, huh, Joe? Yeah, I'm getting a little tired. What do you want to eat tonight? Doesn't make any difference. Go ahead. I get it. Homicide, Friday. Yeah, Dean. Mm Mm-hmm. They did, huh? Who? Oh, let me get that. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Okay, thanks, Dean. Yeah, you bet. Good night. It was Bergman. They made the prints on that bottle and glass. Yeah. A fellow named Fred Gerard did time for armed robbery. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. We like to give you the facts about Chesterfield so you can be your own judge. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality... In both regular and king size. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to tell you what it's made of. The world's best tobaccos. Kept tasty and fresh by pure and costly moistening agents. The best that money can buy. And Chesterfield cigarette paper is of the highest purity. Now, Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to present this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of ten years. He reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Sunday, February 10th, 8.30 p.m. Frank and I pulled a package on Fred Girard. He'd been arrested in 1942 on a charge of violation of 211 P.C. He'd been convicted and had served five years in the penitentiary at San Quentin. We checked back with John Kennedy, the man who had seen Arthur McKinley leave the liquor store in the company of the man we figured to be the murderer. When we entered the mug room, he was talking to Sergeants Joe LaMonica and Danny Galindo. They told us that so far he had been unable to identify the man he had seen with McKinley. We showed him a mug shot of Gerard, and he positively identified it. Kennedy went on to say that as far as he was concerned, there could be no mistake, and that as far as he knew, Gerard was the last man seen with the victim before his death. McKinley's car had been found two blocks from the alley where we'd found the body. In the back of it, the officers found the remainder of the case of beer and the two bottles of bourbon. Leighton Prince went out and dusted the car. They came up with one good set of prints other than the victim's. When these were checked, it was found that they matched the file copies of Gerard's fingerprints. 9.46 9.46 p.m. We drove out to the address listed in Gerard's package. His landlady showed us to his room. It was evident that he hadn't been in it the night before. Frank and I waited for him to return. 10 p.m. 11. 11.30. What are you doing here? You Fred Gerard? Yeah, that's right. Who are you? Police officers. 
Oh, cops, what do you want with me? You know a man named Arthur McKinley? Why? You know him? Yeah, I know him. Anything wrong with that? When did you see him last? Last night. Where? At his store. I came by about 6.15. We talked for a while, and then he closed the store. He said he had to get home for a birthday party, something like that. We went down the street to Kennedy's to get some beer, and then he went back to the store. I heisted a couple, and then I left. What time was that? Well, I guess about 8.30 or so. I had to meet a guy out in Santa Monica, so I left. You left McKinley at his store? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what's this all about? What are you giving me problems for? I haven't done anything. All right, take everything out of your pockets. Put it right down here. Well, if you got no right to barge in here and tell me what to do, I'm clean. Then you got no reason for not cooperating now, have you? Well, I suppose not. Then take everything out of your pockets. All right. Yeah. All right, Keith. Your money in your wallet? Yeah. How much you got? I don't know. I have to count it. All right, count it. Let me see if... Five, six, seven, eight, eight bucks, I don't know. Fifty, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, eight, nine, 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 two cents. I'm a Canadian penny. Was there anybody with McKinley and you when you were drinking? No, I just went in the back of the store to have a beer, a little talk. We got along pretty good. He used to hire me once in a while, clean up the store, sweep out, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was he feeling all right when you left him? I guess so. I didn't ask him, but he didn't say anything about it. Just said he had to get home for a party. His wife would be hacked if he was late. Like I said, I left at 9.15. You might ask Stu Bennett. He might be able to tell you something. Who's he? Owns a little grocery just down the street from McKinley. You say he might know about McKinley? Yeah, he was there when I left. I was walking out, and when Mr. McKinley opened the door, Bennett was walking by. He said he had some things he wanted to talk to McKinley about. Mm -hmm. And when I left, Bennett went in the store. What's this all about, anyway? Something happened, McKinley? He's been murdered. Oh, no, kid. You're a nice guy. You you figured I did it, huh? That's the way it looked. Yeah. Well, I did some time. I won't try to con you. You'll probably know all about it anyway. I I wouldn't kill anybody, though. I'm going straight. I've been working every day since I got out. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, though. Yeah. You might talk to Stu Bennett. He was with him when I left. Fred Girard gave us a complete description of Stuart Bennett. We called the name into R&I, but he had no record. We checked Bennett's store and found a card on the front door that gave his home address. Frank and I drove out to his house. He lived in a new apartment development in the southwest section of town. Monday morning, 12.47 a.m., we rang the bell to his apartment. He's probably asleep. Yeah. Want to try it again? No. Who is it? Like talk to you. Just a minute. Yeah? Police officers. I'm Frank Smith. This is my partner, Joe Friday. How do you do? Want to come in? Right. Well, what is it you want to talk to me about? You know a man named Arthur McKinley? Do you? I knew you'd find out. I knew it. I knew it right after it happened. I knew it right away. All right. You want to get dressed? Yeah, all right. I came home last night after it happened. I thought about it. I thought and thought. I wanted to go and tell you about it. I knew that I'd done a terrible thing. Killed Arthur. Killed another human being. you got to understand one thing, Mr. Friday. What's that? It's important to me. I'm not a vicious man. Why'd you kill him? Well, I stopped last night to talk to him about all of us getting together as sort of a pool. Hiring Fred to sort of take care of all the stores. That's what I went to see him about. I thought it'd be nice to have someone to take care of the stores, you know, wash the windows, sweep up, and we'd all chip in and pay him. Sort of a pool, like I said. Yeah. We talked. Arthur wasn't too much in favor of the idea. Said he'd been thinking about giving Fred a regular job in the flower shop. Said things were real good with him. He thought he'd take on an assistant. Things were going real fine for him. All right. You better get dressed. We'll go downtown. After I killed him, I took him out of the store and put him in an alley. Yeah? Now, I wanted to come and tell you about it. I went down to City Hall. I walked up the stairs on Spring Street. You know the big ones? Yeah. I was going to give myself up. I wanted to tell you about it. And then when I got there, the doors were closed. The sign said to use a Main Street entrance. I sat down on the stairs. I sat there for a long time. I thought about telling somebody about what I'd done. And then I walked around by the police department on the walk. It goes around. I looked into the window and saw the detectives. I wanted to go right in and tell them about it. All right. Come on. Get your clothes on. Let's go. I should prove it to you. What's that? I'm not a vicious man. The 
story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 5th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, remember now, Chesterfield is first to present this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of ten years. He reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. <laughs> Stuart Carlisle Bennett was tried and found guilty of murder in the first degree. He is now serving his term in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Murder in the first degree is punishable by death or by confinement in the state penitentiary for life. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Eddie Firestone, Carolyn Jones, Herb Bygren. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, more adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. The body of a dead man has been found in the rear of his shop. He has been brutally beaten to death. The killer is unknown. Your job, find him. Thousands are changing to Chesterfield, both regular and king size, because Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both sizes. That means king-size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. It's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king-size Chesterfield is larger, contains so much more of the same tobaccos, it gives more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, more than a fifth longer smoke. So remember... Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Buy them either way you like them. Premium quality Chesterfield. And much milder. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, July 5th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. It was 7.58 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. That you, Joe? Yeah. How's it going? Uh, don't ask me. What's the matter? Went to the beach yesterday. 
got your sunburn. I could hardly sleep last night. Well, I'm just miserable, Joe. It's going to be a week before I can wear a shirt without feeling I got army blanket on. Yeah, well, can't you get something for it? Something to make it feel a little better anyway? Don't bring that up either. What's that? If you've got any homemade remedies for sunburn, keep them to yourself. I've had them for now. Yeah, why? What's the matter? Like I said, we went to the beach yesterday. Beautiful day. They fixed up a lunch, sandwiches, potato salad, deviled eggs, all that stuff. Yeah, I know. We went down to Castle Rock, you know, down the highway? Yeah. Just had a ball. Just great. Kids played in the water, and then when it got dark, we had a few Fourth of July things for them. You know, sparklers, stuff yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. And we got home, and I started to feel it. What, the sunburn? Yeah. Back feels like it's on fire, Joe. Legs feel like I got them in hot oil. Believe me, it's terrible. Took off my shirt, pants at home, just sitting there in my shorts. I was trying to figure out some way to stop the burning, you know. Yeah. Well, it happened. In comes Armand. Well, that's your brother-in-law, huh? Yeah. He's read in some magazine where tea is the stuff for burns. Right away, he starts brewing tea. Tea? Yeah. Can you drink? Yeah. Tells me to lay down on the floor, right? Flat on my stomach. I was feeling so miserable, I'd have done anything to get rid of the feeling, so I did just lay there. And he starts putting tea leaves all up and down my back. Back of my legs. and well, felt real good at first. Kind of cool, you know. Yeah. And all this time you're laying on your stomach there. Yeah. Right in the middle of the living room floor. He put papers down first, you know, so the tea wouldn't drip all over the floor. Well, you brew the stuff first. Yeah. It? And then they put the tea leaves on me. But then the tea leaves started to dry. And they crinkled all up. And the pain came back. Just miserable, Joe. Well, did it do any good at all? I don't know. They finally took it off and put some kind of ointment on my back. Helped a little. I had to sleep on my stomach all night. Mm. Couldn't turn over. I just lay real still. Once in a while, I'd fall asleep and roll over, and wow, I'd wake right up with a pain. I tell you, Joe, I didn't sleep at all. Not a wink. Yeah, I know what you mean. I don't see what you're blaming Armin for. Seems like he did try to help you out, though. Oh, sure, he tried. Whole thing was his fault. If he'd kept his big mouth shut, everything would have been all right. How'd he figure that? A picnic. Was his idea, Joe. Oh, it's a hot shot. I'll get it. What is it? Killing down on Bixel. Eight fourteen a.m. We arrived at the address on South Bixel. It was a small neighborhood pawn shop. A radio car had arrived, and the two officers had cleared the crowd away from the entrance of the store. One of the officers showed us through a curtain into the back room. Everything was smashed. Glass cases were demolished. Clothing from the shelves had been torn down and thrown all over the floor. At one side of the room, a closet door was half open, and in the closet was the body of a man. We started to talk with George Armstrong, the victim's partner. Terrible. I, I don't want to look at him. I, I don't want to believe it. Anybody would do this to Mark. Mark? Is that your partner's name? Yes, sir, Mark Williams, my friend. We've been together the last 15 years. Knew each other for 10 years before that. I, I don't want to think about it. Would you like to step out here, sir? Front part of the store? Well, would it be all right? Yes, it'd be fine. I'll call the crime lab, Joe. All right, good. Where's the phone, sir? Uh, it's back there on the wall. Thanks. I'd like to ask you some questions, if it'd be all right. Yes? You discovered the body, is that right? Well, yes. This morning when I came in, I opened the store like I always do, about, uh, I think, about 7.45, I guess it was, something like that. I see. I opened the front door like I usually do, and then I came in and put the water on for some tea. You can see there, see that hot plate? Mark and I usually have a cup of tea when he comes in. I see. Well, then I went to the back room to hang up my coat. First, I thought that somebody had tried to rob the place. Mm-hmm. The way things, you know, were scattered all over. Then I saw Mark laying on the floor, and I, I called you. They're on the way, Joe. Okay. Did you always open up the store by yourself, Mr. Armstrong? Yes. I, I don't know how it started, but somewhere along the line, I'd open up the place, and then Mark would clean up the shop and close. It's been that way for years. Mm-hmm. When did you last see Mr. Williams? That is, when did you see him alive? Uh, Saturday night. I left about 5.45. He was closing the place up. I, I told him that I'd meet him for breakfast Sunday morning. He wasn't there. I tried to call him at home, but there wasn't any answer. His landlady hadn't seen him. Was he married, do you know? No, he wasn't married. Same thing happened to both of us. Neither one of us was married. What's that, sir? Well, you see, Mark and I are both in love with the same girl when we were younger. We used to take her to the park in the summer, listen to the band, concert... Three of us, we used to go every place together. Like I said, both of us were in love with her. Uh-huh. Well, things went along just fine for a year or so, and then she got married to someone else. Mark and I were pretty sad about it. Couldn't blame the girl, though. The guy she married was rich. He had a big house. It was a good family. And we didn't have much of anything. So, no, neither of us married. Just never seemed to find a girl compared with Kate. Kate? Kate Dillon. She's a lovely girl. 
This meeting you were going to have yesterday morning, was that a regular thing? Oh, yes, it was. You see, about the only relaxation Mark and I had was bowling on the green. Bowling? Mm-hmm. Uh, every Sunday that it didn't rain, we'd meet for breakfast and then catch a bus out to Exposition Park. You know, bowling club out there. Mark and I both belong. Mark was a sort of local champion. Played a real good game. Well, didn't you think that anything was wrong when he didn't meet you yesterday? Well, yes, I did. I did at first. Then I got to thinking about it, and I figured maybe he wasn't feeling too good. Just didn't want to go out to the club. Yes, yeah, sir. He'd get like that, moody. Just for no reason at all. Decided he didn't want to go any place at all. Just sit in his room. Almost always came to work, even when he was in the mood. But now and then he'd just sit up there and look out the window. Was there any special reason for all this? No, not that I know of. He just get like that. No special reason. When he did, you just had to sit and let the mood pass. Nothing else to do. I see. Well, did Mr. Williams have any enemies that you'd know of, anyone at all that might do a thing like this? No, sir. No one. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Was he alone when you left him Saturday night? Yes, he was straightening up the shelves, getting the things in order. But he was all by himself. No one was here. Well, have you ever had any trouble with anyone in the neighborhood lately? Somebody who might have been looking for trouble, maybe? Well, Sergeant, most of our customers have trouble. Well, yes, sir, but... About how much money was on the premises when you left? Mm, maybe $1,500. Where'd you keep the money? In the safe, right there. You can see for yourself it's all right. Would you mind opening it up just to be sure? Well, if you want me to, but I'm sure everything's okay. If you wouldn't mind, sir. Okay. I know there's nothing wrong here. 43. You can see for yourself that everything's okay, can't you? Sixteen left. Yes, sir. We just want to be sure. Right to eight. There. You can see it. Uh Uh-huh. Is the money kept in that strong box? Yes, sir. Who knew the combination to this safe? I mean, besides you. Just Mark and me. We were the only ones. Mm -hmm. There. All the money's there. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else missing from the store? Anything that you can see? Well, Sergeant, look around you. If there was anything, how could I tell? I... I'd have to take a complete inventory. Well, what difference does it make? How's it going to help Mark? Well, it's pretty important we find out why he was killed the way he was, sir. A beating and all. If you'd look around, you might be able to come up with something. Oh, all right, I'll look around, but I tell you, I don't think there's anything gone. All right, if you just do that, we'll look over the back room if it'll be all right. Pretty bad, huh, John? Yeah. Looks like revenge could have been the motive, maybe, from the looks of things here. Yeah, it'd have tell. to be something like that. Terrible beating. The way the place is all smashed up. Yeah. Frank? Yeah? Come over here. Yeah? Look here in the closet. You can see it there under the body. Oh, yeah, looks like a hand axe. Yeah. Might have been trying to defend himself, huh? Well, maybe. Uh, Sergeant? Yes, sir? You were right, absolutely right. What's that, sir? Well, he did steal something. The gun case had been broken into. Yes, sir. Anything missing? A couple of revolvers. Eight thirty-two a.m. The crime lab crew arrived and went over the place. In the back room, under a pile of clothes, they found a ten-inch length of lead pipe. Dean Bergman from Leighton Prince dusted the room, the safe in the store, and the lead pipe. He came up with several clean prints. He rolled the dead man's fingerprints, and then he took Armstrong's. Comparison with those he'd found eliminated all of them except a partial print on the safe. The coroner arrived and removed the body. Frank and I canvassed the neighborhood, but none of the people in the area had noticed anyone suspicious in the last few days. We called the office, and Sergeants Joe LaMonica and Howard Hudson came out to help us in the search of the vicinity. The axe found in the hands of the victim, Mark Williams, had stains on the blade. A closer check of the pawn shop showed that several articles other than the guns had been stolen. George Armstrong gave us a complete list of the missing property along with the serial numbers of the guns. 11.34 a.m. Frank and I checked back into the city hall. Frank, did you get the APBs out? Yeah. Notify the pawn shop detail. Any word from the Monica and Hudson? No, not yet. At least there's nothing in the book there. I get it. Homicide, Friday. Oh, yeah, Joe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, we haven't heard from him yet. No. Where? Yeah. Yeah, well, that figures. Uh-huh. Okay, thanks. It's La Monica. He and Hudson found a blood-stained shirt in an alley behind an apartment house a couple of blocks from the pawn shop. Yeah? Checked the apartment register, and they found a Wallace Holmes listed. Holmes? Yeah, La Monica knows him. Yeah? Just served six months for violation of the Narcotics Act.
12.02 p.m., we ran the name Wallace Holmes through R&I. He had a record dating back almost 10 years. He'd been arrested twice for violation of the state health and safety code and once on suspicion of 211 PC. We talked to the neighbors in the apartment building where he lived, but they told us that Holmes had been in bed with a bad cold for the past three days. Several of them had taken him food on occasion and stated positively that he could not have left the apartment. Bergman checked his fingerprints against those we'd found at the pawn shop. There was no make. A stakeout was placed on the building. 2.15 p.m. We checked by the crime lab to see if Ray Pinker had finished the tests on the physical evidence that he'd collected at the murder scene. Looks like the lead pipe. Can you tell us anything about the killer? Nothing, except he's WMA. Well, how about the other blood stains, Ray? Test out type O, victim's type B. Well, figures that he managed to hit the killer with the axe then, huh? Possible. How about the shirt? Did you find anything on it? We haven't finished the tests on the dust particles we found in the pocket yet. Precipitant test shows it's human blood. Haven't had a chance to group it yet. How about any laundry markings? Anything there, Ray? Uh, I'm just about to check it. Spread it out here. You want to get those lights, Frank? Yeah, I'll go. Turn on this fluorescent. Uh, yeah. Laundry marking here. Yeah. Looks like RJ. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And there's a number there, too. And it's 769-02. Anything else, Ray? Hmm? Huh? Looks like that's about it. What laundry would you know? Yeah, I think so. Markings the same type as Consolidated Central Laundry uses. It's a big place out on Pico. Mm -hmm. Handle cleaning for a lot of small neighborhood places in town. I can give you the address. Okay, anything else? Well, I had a 15 neck and a 33 sleeve. Average size, not much help, huh? Maybe I can give you some more when I get through the dust particles in the pockets. Yeah, okay. Wish we had a little more to go on. Well, you got a piece of lead pipe, a stained shirt, and an axe that looks like it's been recently used. Yep. They all connect somewhere along the line. Yeah, all we got to do is find out where. 2.58 p.m. Frank and I drove out to the Consolidated Central Laundry. We talked to the manager and he looked through the files. He was able to tell us that the shirt had been laundered at a small cleaning place on South Hill. He gave us the address and Frank and I drove over. We talked to the manager of the shop. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's our number, all right. Yes, sir. Would it be possible for you to tell us who owns the shirt? Yeah, I'll look it up in the book. Let's see, R.J. 769-02. Mm-hmm, that's right. Let's see, 642-98-7. Yeah, yeah, here it is. Uh, John Dunlap, uh, address out on 3rd Street. Say, what do you want to know about the shirt for? Dunlap done something? Oh, we're just conducting an investigation here. Oh. I wonder if you'd describe this Dunlap for us. Oh, sure. I've known John for years. Been bringing his things in here for at least uh, eight, maybe nine years. Could you give us a description of him, you think? Yeah, Johnny's about, uh, about my side, maybe 5'11". Weighs about 180. How about his coloring? Huh? His coloring. Is he dark or light complected? Oh, yeah. Well, I guess you'd say maybe sort of medium. Yeah, medium. Do you have any marks or scars on him? Anything unusual about him? Well, if you asked me that yesterday, I'd have said no. How's that? Well, up till this morning... Uh, well, John came in this morning, and there was nothing that made him stand out up till then. He must have had an accident over the weekend, I guess. I don't understand. Came in this morning, his face was all scratched up. You are listening to Dragnet. The authentic story of your police force in action. We like to give the facts about Chesterfield so you can be your own judge. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to tell you what it's made of. The world's best tobaccos. Kept tasty and fresh by pure and costly moistening agents. The best that money can buy. And Chesterfield cigarette paper is of the highest purity. Now, Chesterfield is the first cigarette to present this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over ten years. After eight months, the medical specialist reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. I'd say that means real mildness. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder.
Monday, 5.30 p.m., Frank and I ran the name John Dunlap through R&I. We found no record on anyone answering his description. Meantime, the stakeout on Wallace Holmes' apartment where we'd found the bloodstained shirt continued. Ray Pinker had finished the test on the shirt and found that most of the blood on it was type B. However, there were also small traces of type O. The tests on the dust particles found in the pockets of the shirt netted us nothing. 6.15 p.m., we drove out to the address given us by the cleaning shop. It was a large apartment building. Dunlap was registered in the penthouse. We took the elevator up and rang the bell. Yeah? John Dunlap? That's right. What can I do for you? Police officers. Would like to talk to you? Police? What do you want with me? Just like to talk to you. Well, okay, come on in. You can see you caught me in the shower. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. How you doing? I do, sir. You? Hey, you mind if I go ahead and get dressed while we talk? I got a date and I don't want to be too late. No, that's all right. Go right ahead. Come on in here. What is it I can do for you, officers? Well, I wonder if you could explain your movement Saturday night. Saturday night? Yes, sir. Well, let's see. I played golf in the morning, got back from the club about six, I guess. Miserable game, 102, lost $35. <laughs> sure was off Saturday. Uh, just a minute, sir. You tell us what clothes you want. We'll get them for you. All right, hand me that shirt there, the blue one, huh? Yeah. Sure, a miserable game Saturday. Three putted almost every green. Nice looking shirts, Dunlap. Like them? Well, they're nice looking. Where do you get them? I haven't made. Can't wear store made shirts. Next too long. Collar doesn't fit right. What'd you do after you got home from the golf club? Took a shower, then went out. Had a date. Lousy game room the whole evening. Sir? Well, after that crummy 102, I really played the 19th hole. Got pretty loaded. By the time I got to Alice's, I was in a rare mood. Alice? Yeah, Alice. Alice Miller. Anyway, I was about half hour late, and she was fit to be tied. We are supposed to have dinner out in Malibu. Took us about an hour to drive out there, and Alice kept getting mad as we drove. I guess I didn't help things out any. I was in a foul mood and didn't keep it to myself. Yeah. Well, by the time we got there, really going at it, silly thing, no sense to the argument at all, but it just kept building. Either one of you married? Yes, sir, my partner here is. Well, then he knows what I mean. Well, we didn't get down to the beach till about 8.30 or 9. We got out of the car, and Alice said she wanted me to take her back home. I told her we'd just gotten there. She said she didn't care, wanted to go home. Yeah. I told her if she wanted to leave, it was okay with me, and I turned around to walk down to the house. You know, it's pretty dark down there. Uh-huh. Well, I walked right over the embankment. Must have fallen over about six, seven feet. Didn't hurt myself much, but you can see I scratched up my face. Yeah, we can. Well, the long one, though, I guess it was worth it. How's that? Well, Alice was so scared she ran down to me, and the argument was all over. We went on into the house and had dinner. How long were we there? Well, I guess until, uh, well, maybe two thirty, three in the morning. Got to playing charades. Time just went. You happen to know what blood type you have? What? Your blood type. Do you know what it is? Well, I think it's A, but I'm not sure, though. Uh -huh. You said you had your shirts made to order, huh? Yeah, that's right. Why? Can you tell us how someone else might have gotten one of your shirts? Wait a minute. I don't think I understand just what's going on. What is this all about? You come in here and ask a lot of questions. What's it all for? Just routine. Routine what? It's not routine for me to have policemen come in and ask a lot of questions. Where was I Saturday night? Who makes my shirts? Who might have had them? Come on, what's the pitch? All right, you know a man named Mark Williams? Williams? Uh, no, Tom Williams sells insurance. No, Mark Williams. No, I don't think I know him, Mark. Anyway, what's he got to do with this? He was killed Saturday night. You figure maybe I did? Well, a shirt that belongs to you was found near the scene. My shirt? That's right. Same label. Check the laundry markings in it. Your laundry man said it was your shirt. Said it was your number. You talked to Harry? Yeah, that's his name. I guess we did. Well, I don't understand it. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, sir? A couple of weeks ago, I gave a half a dozen shirts to the woman who comes in to clean up the place. She might know what happened. Let me call her and find out. I got her number here someplace. Yeah, here it is. If anybody knows, she would. A couple of weeks ago, I told her she could have them. I don't know what the matter with them. Hello? Mrs. Lambert in, please? Yeah, thank you. Hello, Mrs. Lambert. This is John Dunlap. Oh, just fine. And you? That's good. No, no, I just want to know what you did with those shirts you took a couple of weeks ago. Well, no, Mrs. Lambert, I did give them to you. I just want to know what you did with them. Uh-huh. I see. Well, can you give me the address? Well, just a minute, I'll get a pencil. You have a pencil, officer? Here you are. Thank you. Now, go ahead, Mrs. Lambert. Uh-huh. Four, seven? All right, thank you. No, no, don't you worry. Everything's all right. Yeah, well, thank you, Mrs. Lambert. Yeah, I'll see you then. Right, goodbye. A real character thought I wanted the shirts back. Did she tell you what she did with them? Yeah, I said she sold them to a second-hand store down on Bixel. Saturday 
7.20 p.m. We drove over to talk to the cleaning woman. She gave us the same story that we'd gotten from John Dunlap. We went over to the second-hand store, but it was closed. The stakeout on the apartment continued. The body had been posted, and the coroner told us that Williams had been killed at approximately midnight on Saturday night. That would allow two hours on either side, making it possible for the murder to take place between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Frank and I checked out of the office and went home. The following morning, Tuesday, July 6th at 8.17 p.m., we checked the second-hand store where the shirts had been sold. The dealer told us that he remembered the shirts. He said that he'd bought five of them and had only sold one. He was able to give us a fair description of the man he'd sold the shirt to. He went on to say that he'd heard that the man was a user of narcotics. We ran the name he gave us, Fred Harris, through R&I. He had a record of violation of the state narcotic act. We got out an APB and a local bulletin on him. We called narcotics division and notified them that we wanted Harris as a suspect. We checked the address listed on his record, but we found that he'd moved and left no forwarding address. Two days went by. We ran down all leads, but we were able to come up with nothing new. Thursday, July 8th, 8.30 a.m., Frank and I checked back into the squad room. Well, there's another one that didn't go any place. Yeah, well, there's got to be some place. I get it. Uh, homicide Friday. Oh, yeah, Joe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, how soon will you be here? All right? Okay, right. Anything? Well, Monica and Hudson, they just picked Harris up. a.m. Fred Harris was brought to the interrogation room. Frank and I talked to him for about an hour, but other than his name, he refused to tell us anything. We tried to lead him out. We talked about his family, about sports, food, everything we could think of. None of it worked. Harris remained sullen and uncooperative. 1.46 p.m. How about some lunch, Joe? I guess so. Harris? No. No, thanks. You suit yourself. What do you want, Joe? Well, ham on rice, all right. Get some coffee, too, huh? Okay. You sure, Harris? You don't want it indeed? No, I told you. Okay. All right, if I smoke? Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you want to talk about it, Harris? About what? Why you killed Williams. Who says I did? That's the way it looks. It looks wrong. Well, you figured for yourself, Harris. When you killed the old man, you weren't very careful. You left a couple of prints around the place. Yeah? Shirt you wore, we got that. Found it right where you dropped it. Ran that down, leads right to you. Got the man who sold it to you. Identifies you. Maybe he's wrong. No, you know better than that. When they picked you up, you were carrying some of the things you stole from that pawn shop. You can't account for your time on Saturday night. I told you, I didn't do it. I didn't kill the old man. I just don't remember where I was that night. Didn't that happen to you? You go someplace and a couple of days later you can't remember where you were. Didn't that ever happen to you? Oh, yeah, once in a while. Yeah, you see? How do you expect me to remember when you sometimes forget? You a user? What are you asking that for? You got the record. Look it up yourself. Roll up your sleeve. All right. You're a user. You work for a living? Yeah, sometimes. What do you do? Whatever I can. When would you last work? A couple of weeks ago. You haven't worked since then, huh? No. Where'd you get that stuff they found on you? I don't know. Must have bought it. Any idea where? No. You bought the stuff and you don't know where. Not what you want me to believe? Believe what you want. I don't care. Well, here's what I believe. You tell me if I'm wrong. I think you went to the old man's pawn shop about closing time on Saturday night. You had a big yen on and no money to make a connection. You tried to rob the old man. He didn't like it and you killed him. You killed him with that hunk of lead pipe we found, the one with your fingerprints all over it. Then you tried to get the safe open and you couldn't. So you wiped it clean, grabbed what you could carry and you ran out of the store. A couple of blocks away, you calmed down and took a look at yourself. You threw that shirt in the ash can, then you went up to Wallace Holmes' apartment to try to make a connection, didn't you? He'd tell you all that? No. Now, come on, how about it? Holmes tell you that? Now, look, you're a little mixed up, aren't you? You just answer, you don't ask. Sure, he told you. You never found out if he did. My big pal, Wallace Holmes. After all I'd done for him, if I had a nickel for every pop I shared with that bum and he cops out on me, blabs everything to you. The one guy I'd have done anything for. Give the guy the shirt off your back, and this is the thanks I get. Well, what's your big trouble, Harris? What do you mean? You ought to hang on to your shirts. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 15th, trial was held in Department 86, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. 
Friends, again this year, Chesterfield has asked me to remind you to see your own neighborhood cigarette dealer first about your Christmas shopping problems. Among many wonderful gift ideas, he's featuring the gift of the year, the Chesterfield Christmas Carton. Now, to my way of thinking, it's the ideal gift because Chesterfield is the only premium quality cigarette available to you shoppers in both regular and king size. Either way, regular or king size, they're a wonderful smoke and they make fine Christmas gifts. Get them from your dealer. Premium quality Chesterfields. <laughs> Richard Harris was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Olin Soule. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfields. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight it's more adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. A string of store burglaries takes place in your city. The thieves work at night. They leave no physical evidence behind. Your job, get them. Thousands are changing to Chesterfield, both regular and king size, because Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both sizes. That means king-size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. The same fine tobaccos as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king-size Chesterfield is larger, contains so much more of the same tobaccos, it gives more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, more than a fifth longer smoke from king-size Chesterfield. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. Buy them either way you like them, regular or king-size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Yes, Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, January 23rd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 10.36 a.m. when we got to the corner of Constance and Westlake. Nichols Dry Goods Store. Yes? Something I can do for you, gentlemen? Yes, ma'am. We're police officers. Oh, yes. About the robbery. Yes, ma'am. Are you Gladys Nichols? Yes, I am. I'm the owner. I found out that the safe had been robbed. I think you mean your safe was burgled, Mrs. Nichols. What? 
Well, you're safe. It's a technical term. We refer to it as having been burgled, not robbed. Burgled. Yeah. Robbed. They took the money out of it. Well, you see, ma'am, a lot of people make that same mistake. A, a safe is burgled and a man is robbed. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I came in this morning. I didn't get your name. I'm oh, sorry. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Well, I'm pleased to meet you. How you do? Like I said, I'm Gladys Nichols. Yes, ma'am. Now, if you just tell us what happened here. Oh, sure. Well, I came in this morning, 8.30, just like I always do. Been doing the same thing for the past ten years. Eight years the old location. Always opened exactly 8.30 on the dot. Yes, Miss Nichols. Miss, Miss Nichols. I took my maiden name when my husband died. I'm sorry. Go right ahead, please. Oh, sure. I came in at 8.30 this morning, opened the door, and came on in. Everything looked just like it should have. Hung up my coat, then I rolled up the shade on the front window. After that, I opened the safe, and that's when I knew that I'd been robbed, uh, burgled. That's right, ma'am. I could tell it right away. Safe was empty. Not a bit of money left. Cleaned it right out. Do you know how much money there was in the safe, uh, Miss Nichols? Oh, yes. $423.76. I know exactly. That's right. Can't understand it either. It should have gone off. Should have worked. Can't understand why it didn't. What's that, ma'am? Burglar alarm. Oh. Yes, not a peep out of it. Nothing. Man that sold it to me said that if anybody so much as looked at something and thought about stealing it, the alarm would go off. But like I said, not a peep. Oh, I wonder if you'd excuse me for a minute. There's Mrs. Johnson, old customer. Yes, ma'am. It won't take a minute. You, yeah, ma'am. Good morning, Vera. Morning, Gladys. I want a pattern and some material. All right. What pattern do you want? Oh, I was over to the Palm Quits the other night. Barbara had made some of the cutest pillows I ever saw. Looked like pieces of fruit. Uh, you know, watermelon, strawberries. Oh, yeah, I know the ones you mean. She said she saw them in a magazine. Sent for the pattern, but I thought if anybody had had it, you'd be the one. Have you? Sure. It's new. I just got it in a couple of days ago. I guess you heard about my being burgled. No. Really? Sure. Last night. Uh, those two gentlemen back there from the police come in to talk to me about it. And you were really robbed? Uh, burgled, Vera. Safe is burgled. A man is robbed. Oh. Now, is this the pattern you want? Yes, that's the one. See there? I want to make the slice of watermelon and the strawberry. Think they'll look real nice on the bench in the parlor. Oh, yes. Yes, they sure would. Faye saw those things. Said she wanted to make some. You see them, Joe? No, no, I never have. They're real nice. Probably not too comfortable, but they sure look pretty. Uh, How much material do I need for just the two? I'm not sure. Have to look at the pattern. You want just the melon slice and the strawberry, that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well... For the melon, you need, let's see. Uh, you want it out of cloth or plastic? What? Cloth or plastic. You can make them out of either. Uh, cloth, I think. Yeah. Faye's going to use plastic. It's better for the kids. Yeah. You'll need three quarters of a yard of red and a quarter yard of green felt for the hull and the stem. Uh, that's for the strawberry. And then for the melon, you'll need a half a yard of white. A half a yard of pink and a half a yard of green. All right. How about embroidery cotton? You'll need four skeins of the six-strand black. I have plenty of that. Well, I'll measure it out for you. Sure had some excitement around here this morning. All those policemen running around looking for fingerprints and clues was real excitement. Mm Mm-hmm. They caught the man yet? No. That's what those two men are here for now. Want to ask me some questions. Certainly don't look like policemen. Now, why do you say that? Well, you know, they don't look anything like they do in the movies. Never do. Now, you will need some muslin for this, too. You want to get it now? No, uh, I'll pick it up later. Got to get some batting, too. All right. That's the stuff that gives Faye trouble. What? Batting. You know, the stuff you put inside the pillows? Faye always has trouble with it. Stuff always creeps down to one end of the pillow. You got one real fat end, and the other one just hasn't got anything in it. Kind of uncomfortable when you sit on it. Yeah. Just put that on the bill, will you, Gladys? Oh, you betcha. Sure hope you get the burglary all straightened out. Oh, I know they will. Thanks for coming in. Now then. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right, ma'am. Uh, about that burglar alarm. Yes? Well, about the switch. Are you sure you turned it on when you left the shop? Sure. You just bet I did. I always do. Right after I pull the shade down, I always switch on the system. It's supposed to ring when anybody tries to get into the place. Didn't work this time. Not even a peep. Well, now you say this time. Do you mean that something like this happened before? Oh, no. No, just a figure of speech. No. Never been anything like this before. Oh, I see. Did you notice anything disturbed in the place when you came in? Anything that made you think something might be wrong? No, not a thing. Came in, rolled up the shade, and then opened the safe. That's the first I knew about it. Somebody opened it up. Must have known the combination. 
Just opened it up and took the money. Well, does anyone else have a key to your front door here? Anyone besides yourself, I mean? Well, there's Alan. Alan? Yes, Alan Hoffman. He comes in, straightens up for me. He's a decorator. Mm -hmm. Or at least he's trying to be one. He likes to come in and putter with the material. He works in some sort of store during the day, and then he comes in here in the evenings and works with the material. You know, tries out different things. Yes, ma'am. Does he have the combination to your safe? Oh, no. I'm the only one who has that. Do you know if he was in here last night? No, no, I don't. But I know that Alan wouldn't do a thing like this. I'm sure of that. How is it you let this Alan have a key to the place, ma'am? Let him... Those uh, mobiles. You know those things made out of wire and plastic? Hangs from the ceiling? Just hang there and go round and round? It's a new art form. Yes, ma'am. I don't understand them myself, but I guess there are a lot of people who do. Yeah. Are you insured against theft, ma'am? I beg your pardon? Do you have any insurance against theft? Sure, I have insurance. By golly, that's the first time I thought about it. I always thought that it was kind of a waste of money. Sure glad I have it now. This whole thing won't cost me a cent. Well, now, outside of this Hoffman, do you hire anyone else in the store here? No. Well, I don't pay Alan anything. He just comes in and putters. But there's no need for anyone else in the store. I have a man come in once in a while to wash the front windows, but no one's steady. Has there been anyone around regularly? Anyone who'd be in a position to learn the combination of the safe, ma'am? Find out where the switch to the burglar alarm is? No. No, not that I can think of. Of course, most of my customers are pretty regular, come in all the time, but I'm pretty sure that none of them would do a thing like this. I wonder if you could give us a list of the people who come in regularly, Miss Nichols. Sure, I can. But I don't want you to go around bothering them, asking a lot of questions, causing embarrassment. I just won't have it. Money just isn't that important. It doesn't make that much difference, especially since I'm insured. Well, we won't embarrass anyone. It's just that we'd like to have the list if we could. Oh, well, all right. What time did you close the store last night, Miss Nichols? 6.10. Same as always. Did you lock the store yourself? Yes, sir, I did. Did you notice anyone loitering around outside? Anyone who might have looked a little unusual, like they were waiting for you to leave? No. I don't think so. If there was anyone, I didn't notice them. Did you leave any sort of a light burning in the place? I beg your pardon? Well, a night light. Do you leave one burning when you close up? Sure, the sure. That lamp on the counter, old coffee grinder. I leave that on. Has a 150-watt bulb. Throws a lot of light. Of course, you can't see anything from the street when I close up. Just a lot of shadows. A big pardon? Well, I pull the shade down when I leave. Once I had some material fade that was in the window. Since then, I pull the shade down. When it's down, you can't see inside from the street at all. Uh-huh. Oh, say, if you don't mind, I'd like to make a phone call. Of course, ma'am. I want to call those people and tell them what I think of them. If they're going to have to make good on that guarantee. Who's that? Ma'am? Burglar alarm people. Thing didn't work at all. Not even a peep. Eleven eighteen a.m. Frank and I checked by the crime lab to see if they'd been able to come up with any physical evidence from the scene of the burglary. As in the previous cases, there was nothing to work on. For the past month, the series of burglaries had been taking place in the same one block area. The M.O. in every instance was the same. Somehow, the doors to the shops were being unlocked, the safes rifled, and then closed up again. In those stores where there wasn't a safe, merchandise was stolen. In all of the burglaries, whoever was responsible for them got away without leaving a trace of physical evidence behind. Store employees were interrogated. Owners were questioned. None of them could give us any leads. The M.O. had been run through the stats office, but they couldn't help us. Stakeouts had been placed on the stores. Extra men were sent out from Metro Division to patrol the streets. The men saw nothing, but the burglaries continued. The thief or thieves seemed to know just what stores were under surveillance and seemed to keep clear of them. Wednesday, 12, 14 p.m. We ran the name Alan Hoffman through R&I, but we got no make. Frank and I drove out to his home address on 9th Street. He met us at the door and asked us in. I'm doing some work back here. Mind if I go on with it? No, sir. You go right ahead. Right back here, Sun Porch. I uh, got a commission to do a place I'm working on some mobiles for. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I think I'll call it Dubs at Sunrise. Well, sit down. Any place. Yeah, thanks. There's just a couple questions we'd like to ask you, Hoffman. Sure, what about it? Were you in Miss Nichols' shop last night? Oh, no, why? Will you tell us where you were last night? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I went to an exhibition of mobile, a place down on Pico. A friend of mine had a one-man show. Great ideas. Bad color, but great idea. You prove you were there? Well, sure, if I have to. What's this all about, anyway? I understand you have a key to the shop, is that right? Yeah, yeah Gladys gave it to me. I go down there and check the material, get ideas for decorating. Where do you work, Mr. Hoffman? Right now in a store out on Beverly Antique Shop. I want to go in business for myself, interior decoration. I've been working for it a long time. A couple of more good commissions, I'll be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Do you work at night down there very often? You mean at Gladys's? Yeah, that's right. 
Maybe a couple of times a week. What time do you usually get there? It depends on what I'm doing before. Usually I have dinner, then go by. Well, what's this all about, anyway? Something wrong? Well, you probably know there have been several burglaries down in that area lately. Yeah, I heard about them. You figure I had something to do with them, is that it? Well, we're trying to find out who's responsible for them. Well, it isn't me. You ever notice anyone around the place when you were there at night? No, not that I remember. Uh, hand me that piece of balsa, will you? This wood here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, here you are. Thanks. No, I've never noticed anyone around there. What time do you finish up at the shop there? Sometimes late as two, maybe three in the morning. Uh-huh. Miss Nichols tell you where the burglar alarm switch is? Sure, I know. Couldn't move around the place without knowing about it. Have half the police force there if that thing ever went off. You got any idea as to how that safe could be opened by someone other than Miss Nichols? No. No, she's so touchy about that safe sheet. Never let anyone get near her when she's opening. Even after she finishes the combination, she twirls the dial so you can't tell what number she stopped on. You've looked, have you? No. I don't like what you're trying to say. Well, we're not trying to say anything, Hoffman. Well, you imply that I might try to knock over that safe. No, we didn't say that. You said the same thing, asking me if I'd try to see the combination. Well, I'll just take it easy, Hoffman. If you haven't done anything, you've got nothing to be afraid of. Mm-hmm. Got nothing to be afraid of. I just don't like your remarks, that's all. You ever been arrested? Hmm? I say, have you ever been arrested? Oh, no, no. A couple of tickets for running red lights, that's all. And give us the address of the place where you were last night? Yeah, I suppose so. You guys really think I had something to do with this, huh? We've got to check everybody out, Hoffman. You came up on the list. Well, that's all it is, huh? That's all it is. Well, I'll give you the address. You can check there. I'll tell you, I was there till about 3.30 this morning, and then well, I went out to get something to eat. I came home about 5 this morning, went right to bed. Anybody see you come in? No, I don't think so. You guys figure it might be an inside job, these burglars? Looks like it might be, yeah. Well, that's the way I've got it figured. From what Gladys tells me, it's almost got to be. Is that right? Sure. Well, hand me that piece of red plastic, will you? The what? A piece of red plastic. This here? Yeah, that one. Oh. Here you are. Thanks. Oh, sure, it's got to be somebody who knows all about the stores. You know, when to hit the safes, when not to. The way they walk into the places, no marks on the doors, nothing broken. You seem to know quite a bit about the burglaries. Well, you know, I heard about them, talked to Gladys. Looks like an inside job to me. Uh, say, officer. Yeah? Uh, would you hand me one of those swivels there in the box? Where? Here? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Now, uh... Clip it on here and hang this thing. You just hang it up like that? Yeah. Uh-huh. There, yeah, finished. Balance is good. Good movement. Huh. Doves at sunrise. That all it does, just hang there? Yeah. Well, what do you think of it? Of course, it isn't as good as war recumbent, but it gets the feeling across, don't you think? Yeah, sure does. Doves at sunrise, huh? Yeah, doves at sunrise. How about that? Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Joe? This is Hoffman. Yeah? Mm Mm-hmm. You get it? Uh, Who? What? Doves at sunrise. Uh, Sergeant Friday. Yeah. It's your office. Oh, thanks, Hoffman. Hello. Oh, yeah, Captain. Mm-hmm. No, we're here now. Yeah. Yeah, well, he seems to. Yeah, who? All right, we'll be right in. All right, we got a call to make. What? Over on Pico? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, right after that. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Wisdom? Yeah, he wants to see us. Yeah? We'll probably want to talk to you later, Mr. Hoffman. We can reach you at this number, is that right? Yeah, either here or at the shop. If I'm not at either, Gladys knows where I am. All right, I wonder if you could give us the address and the phone number of the place where you were last night. Sure. Yeah. I've got a piece of paper here someplace. You never can find anything when you want it. Yeah. Oh, here we go. You, uh, you got to go out there, huh? You can't take my word for it. That isn't the point, Mr. Hoffman. We can't take anybody's word for it. If we don't know it, we've got to check it out, see? I suppose so. Oh, here you are. Ask for Rudy. Uh, he's the one who had the exhibition. He'll tell you. Uh, Rudy, is that it? Yes, that's right. I was with him all evening. He'll tell you. Okay, thanks, Hoffman. Oh, um, say, uh, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could leave me your card, phone number. Yeah, sure. Here you are. 
Uh, thank you. I'd like to give you a call. Sir? I'm holding my own show of mobiles. I'd like to have you two guys there. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I'll be calling you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. What'd the captain want, Joe? Oh, he's raising the roof. Says he just got a call from the corner pocket. They're leaning all over him. Yeah? Says he's tired of answering questions. Says we better come up with some of the answers for him. Twelve fifty-eight a.m. Frank and I drove over to check on Alan Hoffman's alibi. We talked to Rudy Nixon. He told us that Hoffman had been with him until around four thirty that morning. We drove back to the office and ran the name Rudy Nixon through R and I, but we got no make on anyone answering his description. Five forty-five p.m. Frank and I reported for stakeout duty. The night went slow and we came up with nothing. The next morning at eight sixteen a.m. we checked back into the office. You know, as soon as we get this thing over with, I'm going to sleep a week. Oh man, you got company. I'm going to tell Faye to send the kids out of town, and if anybody calls me, tell them I just left for Hindustan by fast freight. Well, how'd it go? Nothing, Skipper. Sat there all night, not a thing. How about the other guys? Anything from them, Skipper? No, I just checked with Metro. None of their cars saw anything. The other men out there came in with the same. No, I'll get it. Burglary wisdom. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Well, what time was it? Right, we'll send a couple of men right out. Here's the address. I hit again. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. But let us give you the facts, and then you be your own judge. Chesterfield is the first cigarette to present this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfield for an average of ten years. After eight months, the medical specialist reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. I'd say that means real mildness. And Chesterfield is the first and only premium quality cigarette available in both regular and king size. So buy them either way you like them, regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Yes, Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> Thursday, January 24th, 8.52 a.m. Frank and I drove out to see the latest victim of the burglars. The crew from the crime lab arrived and went over the place. The M.O. was exactly the same as in the previous thefts. The front door had been unlocked, the safe had been opened, the contents taken, and then the safe closed. There was no physical evidence. However, on one point, the thief had varied his method of operation. The latest victim was the owner of a radio and television store. A check of his stock showed us that an expensive record player and a large stock of records were missing. We checked Metro Division, but they told us that none of their cars had reported seeing anyone on the streets carrying anything that fitted the description of the missing merchandise. The serial number of the set was given to us, and a local and an APB was gotten out on it. We talked to Lieutenant Stevens at Metro, and he agreed to double the number of cars cruising in the area that night. Three more teams of men from burglary were assigned to the stakeout detail. 6.02 p.m. Frank and I checked in for duty. Nothing happened. Two days passed. Still no new leads. All employees of the stores that were victimized were checked and rechecked. Nothing. Saturday, January 26th, Frank and I were assigned to a toy shop in the middle of the block. We waited. 8 p.m., 9, 10.30 p.m. Nothing. Oh, boy, I'm stiff. Yeah. Joe? Mm-hmm. What time you got? 10.46. Uh, I sure wish I could have a smoke. Yeah? I wonder if he's going to show... What do you think? I don't know. Been a long time. Eleven o'clock. We waited. From time to time, we could see the lights of the undercover car go by the front entrance. Midnight. Twelve thirty. Still nothing. Joe? Hmm? Want a piece of this candy bar? No, I'm not hungry. Sure you don't want some? No. I don't know. We've been in every store in this block. 
past months, I don't think the guy's going to show. Mm -hmm. This guy's stale. Wait a minute. What? What's that? Somebody moving something. Yeah, sounds like the ventilator, doesn't it? Hey. Wait a minute, hold it. Yeah, look, see the ventilator on the firewall? Where? Is that moving? Yeah, he's got somebody's coming out of there, see? See, look at that. What did he do? Snapped off the burglar alarm. Oh. He's at the safe. Yeah. He's got it open. Come on, let's take it. All right, mister, hold it right there. Watch it, Joe. He's going for the ventilator. I see him. Come on. You see him? No. He's up in there somewhere. Yeah. All right, come on out of there, mister. Come on out of there, you! There he is, Joe. Gunflash. Yeah, I see him. All right, come on, mister. Throw that gun out here. Get out of here, cop. You come back here, I'll kill you. You got no place to go up there. Now, come on, give it up. I'm telling you, you come back here, I'll kill you. I will. I'm warning you, I'll kill you. Wait a minute. Wait. Don't shoot anymore. Please, don't shoot anymore. Please. I quit. Please. All right, throw that gun out here. Come on. All right. Here it is. There it is. You got it. Now, don't you anymore, huh? Please, Wait, come on out of there. Anymore. Come on out of there. What do you think, Joe? You gonna come out of there? All right, we'll have to go in after him. Uneasy, oh, though. It's smoky in here. It's kind of a tight squeeze in it. Exactly, too. Looks like he's got some kind of a room up there. Can you see? of a room. Yeah. Dug it right out of the earth here. All right, come on. Come out from behind that crate. All right. Get your hands behind your head. I'm, I'm doing like you say. See, I got my hands just like you said. I, I quit. All right, I can shake them down. Yeah. Come Stand on. Stand still. Put your hands against the wall. Yeah, he's clean, Joe. Now, what is all this in here? Where I live. All right, we'll take a look. How about this, Joe? This room must be 20 feet square. Mm -hmm. This all the stuff you've stolen? Yeah, most of it. What's your name? Warwick. Dan Warwick. Well, he had you guys going, didn't he? All right, let's go. Really had you. Couldn't figure it out. I used to watch you sit in the vents and watch you. Used to laugh how hard you were trying. Really had you going. Couldn't figure it out. Yeah, sure. Come on, now let's go. <laughs> really had you going. You never would have found me. Could have stayed here for years. Dug this room myself. Every bit of it, all by myself. Stayed here when you guys were around, except when I watched you, you and the others. Couldn't figure out how I knew about the safes. Used to just sit there and watch them. Watch them open the things. Simple once you know how. Really had you going, all of you. Oh, you bet you did. Running around in circles. Real fun. Yeah, but we knew where we were going. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 17th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, it's getting a little closer to Christmas, and there's a man right near you, your neighborhood cigarette dealer, who has a lot of fine gift ideas. Of course, he's featuring the gift of the year, the Chesterfield Christmas carton. It's the ideal gift because Chesterfield is the only premium quality cigarette available to you in both regular and king size. Chesterfield is the one I smoke, and it's the one I'm giving for Christmas. Regular or king size, premium quality Chesterfields are much milder. Daniel Robert Warwick was tried and convicted of burglary in the first degree, five counts. Said counts to run consecutively. He received his sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next seven years of bigger and bigger enrollments, America's grade schools will need nearly a quarter of a million extra teachers besides those to fill normal vacancies. Education holds America's future, perhaps your future. <laughs> You 
have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Gwen Delano, Paul Richards. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, more adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a narcotics detail. You receive information that a big buy of heroin is going to be made in your city. You know the location and the man who's going to sell it. Your job? Stop him. Thousands are changing to Chesterfield, both regular and king size, because only Chesterfield has premium quality in both sizes. That means king size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. The same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king size Chesterfield is larger, contains so much more of the same tobaccos. It gives more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, more than a fifth longer smoke from king-size Chesterfield. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. Buy them either way you like them, regular or king-size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Yes, Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, April 8th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of narcotics detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. We were on our way to the meet, and it was 9.48 p.m. when we got to the corner of Pico and Clanton, the 617 Club. Let's sit back there, huh? Yeah, it looks all right. What time you got, Joe? 9.49, why? Well, this watch is giving me trouble. Yeah? I guess it's getting old. You had it clean lately? Maybe that's what it needs. Yeah, a couple of years ago. Ran real good right after that. Just been lately, like I said. I think maybe you ought to have it cleaned again. I was reading where they should be cleaned at least once a year. Did you know that? No, this is getting old, Joe. Had it for almost 23 years. Got it when I graduated from high school. Mm, sure looks like it's still good, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir? Coffee for me, Frank. Yeah, please. Two coffees right away. <laughs> I didn't see him when we came in, did you? No, we're early. Meat's not supposed to be until 10.30. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. Drink your coffee. <laughs> Knock it off. Well, first thing you know, you're going to have everybody in the place looking at us. I don't care. Let them look. I never wanted to do it. I never yeah, did. Yeah, okay, you did. And I'm looking to do about it. Stop falling. Hey, what's going on in the next booth? I don't know. I can't see. Easy for you to say you didn't do it. You're going to stop falling? You bring a lot of attention over here. We're both in the staff. I can't help it. Everybody I see it. It's a cop. Yeah, a cop who knows all about it. 
of that cheap booze at Dunning. Every time you get a couple of bells and you start to fall, knock it off. Huh? Knock it off, knock it off. If I had to do it over again, it would have been different. I tell you, it would have been different. What do you think, Joe? <laughs> oh, it sounds like you had too much to drink. I hope they get out of here. I don't want anything to louse up our body <laughs> here. Come on, let's sure, go. you get big, big man. You got no worries. Come on, let's go. You didn't kill the old lady. Not so loud. You didn't kill her. Because of the high booth walls, we were unable to tell who was doing the talking. As soon as the men got up to leave the place, Frank and I followed them. Frank stopped long enough to call our contact and postpone the narcotics buy. We followed the two men from the bar down the street. They walked up to Spring, and then they split up. Frank followed one of them, I tailed the other. He went directly to a hotel on West 6th Street. He stopped and talked with a hotel clerk, and then he took the elevator upstairs. I checked with the clerk, and he told me that the man's name was Sam Allison. The clerk also told me that Allison had been a resident of the hotel off and on for the past 10 years. He went on to say that every so often Allison would pack up and leave, but that he'd always return. He was unable to give me any information as to how Allison made his living or who the other man might be. 12.10 a.m. I called the office. Frank had checked back in. The man he was following had entered an all-night movie, and in the darkness, Frank somehow had lost him. I went back to the office, and we sent a radiogram to Inspector Charlie Sutton up in San Francisco, requesting all information on unsolved murders in the Bay Area in the last few months. We ran the name Sam Allison through R&I, but we got no make on anyone answering his description. 2.15 a.m., we checked out of the office and went home to get some sleep. The following morning, Wednesday, April 9th, 7.58 a.m., I checked back into the office. That you, Joe? Yeah. The message in the book to call operator 18 in San Francisco. Would you put the call in? No, I just got in. Figured I'd wait a minute for you to get here. All right, let's take care of it now. Operator 18, San Francisco, please. Joe Friday, Los Angeles Police Department, Michigan, 5211. Yeah, that's right. Probably Charlie Sutton, huh? Yeah. Yes, ma'am? Oh, Charlie? Joe Friday. Yeah. Uh huh. When? January 15th, huh? So how'd it happen? Uh huh. Can you talk a little louder, Charlie? Any description? Yeah, I see. Mm-hmm. Where? You sent it right down to us, huh? Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, Charlie. No, we don't know. No. Yeah, thanks again. Right, bye. Anything? Yeah, out at Land's End up in San Francisco. The woman was beaten to death. The San Francisco Police Department said that they'd forward all available information on the killing. From what Inspector Charlie Sutton had said, the victim had been robbed and beaten out on the Land's End area. There had been one witness to the murder, and we told the authorities in the Bay City that we would send them stand-up mugs of our suspect, Sam Allison. 9.37 a.m., Frank and I drove over to the hotel on West 6th. We talked to the desk clerk, and then we went upstairs to Allison's room. This must be at 3.05. Yeah. Try it again. Yeah. yeah? Who is it? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Just a minute. Yeah? You Sam Allison? Yeah, that's right. What's the bit? I'd like to talk to you. What about? Might be better if we talked inside. All right, come on in. Well, what's this all about? Want to get dressed? I'd like to talk to you downtown. What for? You got nothing on me. Just like to talk to you. Come on, get dressed. Oh, wait a minute, Joe. Look, you tell me what it's all about first, huh? You've been up in San Francisco lately? Why? Have you? Yeah, so what? When? I don't know. First of the year, I guess. Around there. You narrow that down a little? First part of January, I guess. Where were you last night? Around. Where around? Met a friend, had a couple of drinks, and came home just around. Who's the friend? Hey, look, I'm not going to answer any more of your questions until I know what this is all about. Where are your clothes? In the closet. I'll get them. I'm getting real big, aren't we? You tell us what you want, I'll get them. Who's that pinstripe? You know, the gray one right in front of you. You know, pinstripe? That's it? Yeah. Oh, in that bureau? Second drawer? There's some shirts there. Give me one of the blue ones, will you? One with the tab collar, you know, little round things on it. That's it? Yeah. Here you go. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey, when you guys figure out, let me know what this is all about. What do you do for a living, Allison? Oh, this and that. All right, what's that mean? I work with horses. 
You a trainer, that it? No, not exactly. A tout? No. Say, in that top drawer, there's a little velvet box. You got a collar bar in there. Would you get it for me, huh? Here? Yeah. This the box? That's right. The gold one. Yeah. Know what you want? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I got my shoes. Wait a minute. Which ones do you want? The black ones. It's the only pair. Who were you drinking with last night, Allison? Oh, like I told you, a friend. What's his name? Look, I told you I wasn't going to say anything I found out what this was all about. All right, Allison, I'm going to lay this out for you. We were in a bar last night, a place down in Clanton. You there? Clanton? Oh, you mean the 617 Club? That's right. Yeah, I was there. So what? We were in the booth next to you. Heard you talk about killing a woman in San Francisco. You're wrong about that. Yeah, sure we are. Let's go downtown. No, I mean it. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, sure, I was in the bar last night, but I don't know anything about killing an old broad up north. Who said she was old? Well, you just did. No, he didn't. Said a woman had been killed. He didn't say anything about her age. Well, from the way you said it, I figured she was old. No, that won't work, Allison. Look, you got no reason to think that I did that. No, you got no reason to think that. You admit you were up north about the time it happened. You were in a bar last night talking about it. Now, you seem to know quite a bit about the whole thing for somebody who wasn't involved. Well, maybe I just heard about it, you know. Where'd you hear about it? Well, around. Well, I don't know where, but well, I heard about it. Maybe that's what happened. But you guys know it wasn't me. You know that, don't you? Who were you with last night? He the one that did it? Is that it? I don't know. I don't know if he did it or not. I don't know anything about it. All I know is I wasn't mixed up in it. And I didn't have anything to do with it. Who's Jack Kenton? Kenton? I don't know any Kenton. Well, he knows you according to this postcard in your drawer over here. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Sam, I'll be in town Monday night. Meet you at your hotel. It's signed Jack. This is a return address here in San Diego. Now, who is he? Oh, yeah, Kenton. I forgot for a minute. Well, maybe you forgot that he was with you in that bar last night, too, huh? Well, what happens to me if I do remember? You gonna find out? I don't think so. Was he the man you were with last night? I don't want him to find out. I got big trouble if he does. Is that right? Yeah, he's the guy, but don't tell him I said so, will you? You won't tell him, huh? No, Jack would come after me if he knew. He's really off his rocker. He is, huh? Yeah, and he'd kill me if he knew. You guys are gonna have trouble taking him, you know that, huh? We are, huh? Yeah, he's fallen a couple of times before. Done big time up a queue. Told me a hundred times before. At least a hundred times. Yeah, what's that? He'd kill the first cop that came after him. Eleven seventeen a.m., Frank and I took Sam Allison down to the city hall. He was fingerprinted and mug shots were taken. A pair of stand-up mugs were sent to San Francisco immediately. We contacted the San Diego Police Department and asked them to put a stake out on the address that was on the postcard we found in Allison's room. In the event this Jack Kenton returned, they were to pick him up and call us. While we talked to them, they ran the name through their files and found that he had a minor record in San Diego dating back some 15 years. A check of our file showed that he'd served time in San Quentin for armed robbery at ADW while trying to commit a robbery. We got out a local and an APB on him. We talked to Allison. He told us that as far as he knew, Kenton was planning to return to San Diego on the preceding night. He couldn't give us any information as to where Kenton had stayed while he was in Los Angeles. 2 p.m., we got a call from San Diego that they'd picked up Jack Kenton. 2.30 p.m., Frank and I checked out a trip car and left for San Diego. We checked in with Lieutenant Mort Gear when we got there, and he told us that Kenton had been seen returning to his home right after we'd contacted them. We drove out to his place and searched it, but we found nothing to tie him in with a murder in San Francisco. 8.30 p.m., we left San Diego and returned to Los Angeles. On the return trip, Kenton was sullen and refused to answer any questions. We took him to the city hall. 1.15 a.m. Oh, lousy deal. You guys are trying to tie a bum rap on me, and you know it. Do we? Sure. You ever do any big time, Kenton? No. Ever been in jail, huh? No. That's not what our record says. Well, maybe a couple of tickets for traffic stuff. Book says you served time at Q. How about that? A couple of years, yeah. Don't you figure that is big time? Yeah, I suppose so. Then why didn't you tell us about it? Forgot. You been in San Francisco lately? No. Nope. You sure? I'm sure. We got a rumble that you were up there around the first of the year. That right? Yeah. Well, you tell your pigeon that he's not even a fruitcake if he says I was up in Frisco. A couple other people will say you're up there, too. Yeah, who? A couple of people. Well, they're up there not two if they say that. The officers say so, too. How do they figure that? They got an ident on your picture. I was never picked up in Frisco. They got no picture of me. We got a few. So I done time out of L.A. Yeah, you did. When we get a mug, we ship a copy up north. They do the same. That right? That's right. So maybe I'll be big about all this. Admit I was in Frisco around the first of the year. What's that proof? What'd you do while you were up there? I moved around. Went up for vacation. What do you do for a living? A little of everything. What's that include? Like I said, a little of everything. Mm -hmm. What'd you tell the parole board? I'd tell them I'm a contractor. What do you build? 
Whatever needs building, I'm versatile. You're pretty smart, too, aren't you? Look, I know my rights. I know that you know that I'm an ex-con. You know it as well as I do. But there ain't no PV tab on my card. I don't go around the corner without telling the board. You got nothing on me for that. They know you in San Francisco? Yeah, like I said, it was for a vacation. Where'd you live up there? Around. Hotel down on Geary. How long were you there? Maybe three weeks, month. Got a cigarette? Yeah. Here. Thanks. Thanks. What's this all about, anyway? What's the pitch with was I in Frisco? You remember where you were last night? Yeah, I was up here. I came up to see a friend. Who's a friend? I don't remember. Where'd you see this friend? Bar. Had a couple of drinks, and I went to a movie. What bar? I don't remember. Someplace downtown. Over on Clanton, maybe? Yeah, could be. Like I said, I don't remember. We figure it was the 617 Club on Clanton. You know more than I do. You were there with Sam Allison, isn't that right? Allison? Don't think I know anybody by that name. He says he knows you. Allison? No, I don't think I know anybody. All right, now let's come off it, Kenton. We know you were there. We were in the booth right next to you. We heard you talk about killing the woman in San Francisco. We heard every word you said. Well, you must have been listening to somebody else. You got the wrong pitch all the way around. I wasn't there last night. I don't know any Sam Allison. I didn't kill anyone in San Francisco or any place else. Bartender down there says he knows you. Says you were in the place last night. We saw you there ourselves. You know, you guys ought to lay off that cheap booze. It's beginning to hit your eyes. We got another witness who says you were there. He's willing to swear to it. All right, so maybe I was. What's that proof? Why'd you lie about it? I didn't lie. I just forgot. Maybe you forgot about San Francisco, too. Is that it? No, I didn't forget about it. You said you spent your time up north in the bar. Which bar? Cookies. Where's that? On Kearney. You got any way to prove you were there? This Cookies? Sure. Talk to Cookie himself. He'll tell you. What's his last name? I don't know. You spend all his time with him, you don't know his last name. Cookie, just plain Cookie. That's all you need to know to get a drink. He ever done any time? Not Cookie. He'll do almost anything to make a buck as long as he doesn't have to work for it. But he's never fallen that I know about. He's too busy watering the booze he sells. You ever get down here Fisherman's Wharf up there? Nope. Never left downtown. And you couldn't have been down there on January 12th, now could you? How do I know where I was on the 12th? I said I wasn't near the wharf. That means on the 12th, 13th, 14th, as far as you want to go. I don't know how else to say it. I wasn't down on Fisherman's Wharf. That where this woman got it? Might have been, yeah. Doesn't make any difference, though. You didn't leave downtown, did you? No, never left downtown. Geary Street for the hotel, Kearney Street for cookies, that's all. How about Land's End? Ever get out there? Maybe if I write it out. Maybe then you'll get what I'm trying to say. I was always downtown. I never left it. I didn't go to Land's End. I didn't go to Fisherman's Wharf. I didn't go to the tea gardens in the park. I never left downtown. You're sure about that? I've told you. I've told you every way I know how. That's all I can do. Yeah, well, there's something that doesn't jive here, Kenton. What's that? We got a call from San Francisco. They got a girl up there who was out on Land's End on January 15th. She says that she'll identify you as the man who killed the woman that night. She says she's positive. Oh, that's why all this bit about was I someplace on January 12th, huh? Yeah, that's right. Playing it real cozy, aren't you? Well, it won't work, cop. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm having none of it. Now, you guys go and try to figure some other way. You got nothing on me. Nothing, and you know it. Now, if you're tired of playing games, either give me my walking papers or book me. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. The girl will be here in the morning, Ken. That's swell. I got to get my sleep then. I want to look real nice for her. All right. Let's go. You know, cop, that's one nice thing about the laws in this state. Yeah. I don't have to do a thing. Just sit and watch. You got to prove it. Any way you slice it, you got to do the work. I don't have to do a thing. Yeah, that's right, Ken. There's only one little difference. Yeah. We make you and you got to do the time. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. Premium quality Chesterfield. Yes, only Chesterfield has premium quality in both regular and king size. And only Chesterfield gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. 45% of this group, about half of them, have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over 10 years. After eight months, the medical specialist reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. Those are the facts. I'd say that means real mildness. So buy them either way you like them, regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Yes, Chesterfield is best for you. Three thirty 
9.39 a.m. We took Jack Kenton down and had some stand-up mugs made of him and sent to San Francisco. Kenton was booked at the main jail on suspicion of murder. 5.26 a.m. Frank and I checked out of the office and we went home. The next day at 1.30 p.m., we met with Captain Lorman, a homicide division, and talked over the developments with him. Together, we worked out a plan that we thought might work in getting Allison to admit to the murder. 4.15 p.m., we had Kenton brought from his cell in the main jail to the interrogation room at the city hall. We talked to him for two hours. He'd admit nothing. Where's your witness about the time she got here, isn't it? She'll be here. We should get this thing over with. I'm getting a little sick of playing ring around a rosy with you boys. Maybe you haven't got anything else to do, but I have. All right, right. What's so important, Kenton? Got a heavy date down San Diego tonight. This is Friday, isn't it? That's right. Real doll. Been trying to date with her for a couple of weeks. Finally made it. You guys think I'll be out of here by six? Depends on what the witness says. How about a cigarette, huh? Yeah. Here you are. I got a man. Cops find anything in my house? What do you mean? When they went through it. Look, I've been through this before. I know the bit as well as you guys do. Fellow falls once, does some time. You cops never leave him alone. You drink much, Kenton? Hmm? You drink much. Yeah, I have a highball once in a while. What's the matter? Something wrong with that? You guys going to give me a lecture on the evils of alcohol? No, just trying to figure out what kind of a guy you are when you're loaded. Well, I'm a doll. Living doll. Put on lampshades, tell funny stories. Life of the party, that's me. You ever have a crying jag when you've been drinking? Nope. Sure about that? Yeah. The way we got it, as soon as you get a couple of belts in, you start to ball. Now, how about that? Whoever told you that's lying. Seems pretty sure about it, this fellow. You seem to have a lot of information from this fellow of yours. Who is a guy? He's a friend of ours. Yeah? He sure isn't a friend of mine. Got an idea who it is. Sounds a lot like my friend Sam. That's so. Yeah, old Sam, the working man's friend. Rumble we got says you were with him the night before last. Is that right? Oh, yeah. This is the night you guys were in the next booth and heard all the stuff about me killing the old broad. What's this bit about a rumble? You know it and I do. You picked up Sam, he talked his mouth out to save his own skin. You guys are about as coy as a bulldozer. Why don't you come off it? You're not working with an amateur. I've been around for a long time. I know the angles. You guys got nothing on me. You got nothing because I'm clean. Just want to be big men. Got nothing else to do, so you decided to kill a little time by leaning on somebody. I happen to be around. I got a record, so I fit your program real pretty. Well, get off my back. I've had it. Now, either book me on suspicion and I'll sue you for every last dime you got or let me go. I got a date I want to keep. That's a nice try, Kevin. It won't work. What do you mean? All right, I'll lay out a few things for you. A woman was killed in San Francisco on January 15th. You were in town that day. You got a record for robbery and assault. Woman was robbed and then killed. You got blind one night and you talked all about it. You had a real crying jag, and you got worried. You talked about how everybody you saw looked like a cop. They all looked like they knew what you'd done, and they were moving to nail you for it. You got a real bad case of the bull horrors. We got a friend of yours who says you could have been the guy. We got an identification from a girl who says you killed that old woman. She's on her way down here now. As soon as she sees you and makes it positive, you had it, mister. Now, that's where you sit. You talk real convincing. Makes it sound like you really got something on me. We have, Kenton, and you know it. Let's check and see if that girl's here. Huh? Yeah, I will. Got a cigarette? Yeah, here. Now, what's the matter, Kenton? You figure maybe we aren't giving you a snow job? No, I know where I stand. I'm just getting a little worried that maybe this girl might make a mistake. It could happen, you know. It's happened before. Is that right? Sure, lots of times. You know, somebody watches a thing like this, they aren't sure what they've really seen. Some college back east proved it. Is that so? Had a deal where one of the students pretended he was going to knock off the teacher. After he'd done it, all the kids gave a different story of what happened. It happens all the time. Yeah. Well, if you didn't do it, then you got nothing to worry about, have you? No, I suppose not. She says she saw the guy, huh? Yeah, that's right. Came all the way down here to look at me, huh? Yeah. You figure she's here yet? Should be. Her plane landed an hour ago. Mm-hmm. 
You say she identified my picture? She said I was the guy? I didn't hear if you just came in, ma'am. That's him. That's the man. He killed her. I saw it. I'd never forget him. That's the man. She's crazy. She's wrong. You know that, don't you? She's wrong. Let him touch me. The man's a murderer. He killed the old woman. I saw him. Beat her to death. I saw him do it. All right, lady. We'll be yeah. fine. All right, Miss Carter. You want to step outside? Oh, yes, please. I want to get away from him. I don't ever want to have to look at him again. How about it? I didn't see her. I didn't see her. I didn't know anybody was around. I didn't mean to kill the old woman. I, I didn't. You know that, don't you? Yeah, sure. She wouldn't give me her purse. I followed her from downtown all the way out on the streetcar. I got out and followed her. Right by Sutro's, by the cliff house. Then I tried to take the money. She wouldn't give it to me. It only about 30 bucks. Why didn't she give it to me? 30 bucks, it wasn't worth it to her. For 30 bucks? It would have been all right if that girl hadn't seen. I looked, tried to make sure nobody saw her. I, I didn't see her, I didn't. You want to stay with him, Frank, while I get the stenographer? Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Okay. Did it work, Sergeant? Yeah, it worked fine. It's funny, I was scared stiff when I went in. Wasn't sure I could carry it off. Well, it worked fine. He copped out, admitted everything. Well, if there's nothing else, I'll go on back to work. Thanks, Stella. Look, will you tell Cunningham that I'll give him a ring, will you? Yeah. Say, Sergeant. Yeah. Thanks for letting me help. You know, filing packages in R and I gets a little dull now and then. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 17th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, it's getting a little closer to Christmas, and there's a man right near you, your neighborhood cigarette dealer, who has a lot of fine gift ideas. Of course, he's featuring the gift of the year, the Chesterfield Christmas Carton. It's the ideal gift because... Chesterfield is the only premium quality cigarette available to you in both regular and king size. Chesterfield is the one I smoke, and it's the one I'm giving for Christmas. Regular or king size, premium quality Chesterfields are much milder. Jack Gerald Kenton was tried and found guilty of murder in the first degree. He is now serving a life sentence in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Ladies and gentlemen, until everyone is safe, no one is safe from tuberculosis. Help save lives by buying all the Christmas seals you can and using Christmas seals on all your Christmas mail. Just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles.
for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A series of holdups takes place in your city. The victims are managers of large markets. You've got a description of the suspect. Your job, get him. Thousands are changing to Chesterfield, both regular and king size, because only Chesterfield has premium quality in both sizes. That means king size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. The same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king size Chesterfield is larger, contains so much more of the same tobaccos. It gives more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, more than a fifth longer smoke from king-size Chesterfields. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. Buy them either way you like them, regular or king-size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Yes, Chesterfield is best for you. documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, February 7th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from R&I, and it was 8.42 a.m. when I got to room 27A. <laughs> robbery. Hey, you, Joe? Yeah. Where you been? Down to R&I. Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. No, there's no problem. Couldn't get the car started. The battery was dead. I had to call the gas station and have them get me started. Well, don't worry about it. It's okay. Anything here in the book? No. Checked him when I got in. Had a 211 out in Westwood last night. Same M.O. Might be the guy. Who's checking it? Murph and Creasy. Went out there this morning. Here's the stuff we got last night. R and I went through it. Doesn't look like they got anything. You seen the skipper yet? No, I saw him come in. I didn't talk to him. Came in, went to his office carrying a bottle of milk. Well, that figures. He's like a barometer, isn't he, Joe? When there's no milk on his desk, you know everything's under control. Yeah. As soon as that milk comes out, you know the ulcers are grinding. Yeah, I suppose. That must be real rough on him, though. The way the papers have been yakking about this thing. I saw Captain Jack this morning on the way in. Yeah. He said the corner pocket's leaning all over him. Well, there's got to be an answer someplace. The guy can't just keep walking into the stores and walking out again. He's got to make a mistake someplace. Yeah. What's it figure? Six jobs so far? Yeah, six of them. Every one of them, he's made it clean. Hot shot. I'll get it. Well, those figures were wrong. Yeah? He just made it seven. <laughs> two months, a hold-up man had been hitting markets throughout the central area. In each case, the description of the bandit was the same. His M.O. tallied with that used in other robberies. In each instance, the bandit had been waiting for the manager of the market when the store was open. At gunpoint, the suspect would force the manager to accompany him around the market. He'd push a wire food cart in front of him as they walked. He'd pick up various merchandise and place it in the basket. He'd then force the manager to open the safe, clean it out, lock the manager in a cold storage vault, and walk out of the market pushing the food cart in front of him. Special stakeouts had been arranged at the market. Extra units from Metro Division had been assigned to patrol duty, but the holdups continued. 9.22 a.m., Frank and I got to the address of the latest robbery, the county market at the corner of Olympic and Maryland. A radio car was there when we arrived. Come in. Yes, something you wanted? Police officers. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Hello, I'm Arthur Scott. I'm the manager here. 
You got that man did this yet? No, sir, not yet. I wonder if you could tell us just what happened. Sure. You know where the other officers are, Mr. Scott? Outside someplace. They were talking to the others, getting names and addresses, something like that. You want to check them, Frank? Yeah, sure. Fine. I wonder if you'd mind telling me just what happened. Well, the man was waiting for me when I came in this morning. I don't know how he got in. He just walked up behind me and said that I shouldn't cause any trouble. About what time was this? Do you remember? Well, let's see. It must have been about uh, 7.10, 7.15. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I came in the front door. Everything looked all right. Walked back here on my way to the office. He just came up in back of me. Yes, sir. He had this gun. He pointed at me and told me not to cause any trouble, like I said. What kind of a gun was it? Would you remember? It was just a gun. It pointed right at me. Well, I understand that, sir. Do you remember if it was an automatic or a revolver? I guess it was a revolver, a long barrel. Uh-huh. I could see the bullets in it. I knew it was loaded. I wasn't going to mess with him. Yes, sir. Now, what happened after he walked up to you? He told me that if I went along with him, I wouldn't get hurt. And then he walked me up to the front of the store by the check stands, uh, took one of the baskets, and started to walk along the racks. Made me walk in front of him. Real nervy. Took his time. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, while we walked along, he'd take things out of the displays. Well, what kind of things? Well, you know, uh, different kind of cheeses, uh, caviar, took some special artichoke hearts. Things cost a buck and a half a jar. Expensive. Yes, sir. What did the man look like, Mr. Scott? Can you give us any kind of a description? Well, that's kind of hard. He had on this uh, big overcoat and a brown hat pulled down, and then the black mask over his face. I couldn't get a very good look at him. Well, how old would you say he was? Oh, boy, I'd have to guess on that. Maybe uh, 50, 55. Looked that old anyway. About all I could see was the bottom part of his face, like he was pretty old. Mm-hmm. How about the color of his eyes? Could you see them? Yeah, through the mask, they were blue. Real light blue, kind of watery. About how tall would you say he was? Maybe 5'2 uh, or 3. Short little man. Mm-hmm. How about his weight? Real little, like I said. I, I don't think he weighed more than 130. That'd be outside, too. Was there anything unusual about him? Anything at all that you could remember? No, not that I can remember. Anything in the way he talked? Some accent of any kind? Anything like that? No, nothing at all there. Uh-huh. How about the coat he was wearing? What color was that? Do you remember? It was a dark brown, sort of a herring bone. Looked real old, like it had been worn for a long time, kind of frayed around the edges of the cuffs. You know, around here like this, and, and the buttonholes on the coat were all torn, too. Oh, excuse me. Yes, sir, go right ahead. Scott? Yeah? How much? Yeah, and how much case? Mm-hmm. Nah, that's not too bad. Yeah, well, order 25 cases of it, huh? We'll use it as a loss leader this weekend. Okay. Well, don't bother me about it now. You do what you think. Okay. Seems like nobody can do anything but you. Give people a little responsibility. They hardly ever know how to use it. Yes, sir. Well, if you'd go ahead with your story. Hmm? Well, right after this man picked up the food. Oh, well, at first I thought he was going to take that. And then I got thinking about the stuff in the papers. You know about the black mask bandit? Yes, sir. Well, I got thinking about that, and then I knew who he was. I tried to get as much information about him as I could. Not much, anyway. About this time, must have been uh, 7.30 or so. Jack Thomas came in. He works in the vegetable department. And right away, this guy said for him to get in the back. You mean back here? No, back in the meat department. Put him right in the refrigerator. Well, what about the other employees? What happened when they came in? He'd make them get back in the refrigerator. Cool. People were pretty lucky. Being so it was cold outside, most of them had coats on. Would have froze if they didn't have. I understand. Customers, too. They'd come in. He'd put them in the refrigerator. There was 14 people in there when he got through. A couple of kids, too. Came in with their mothers. I see. Well, then he took me back to the safe. Made me open it. I thought about saying no, but it, it's a little safe. You know, down low? Yes, sir. Well, I knelt down to work the combination. I looked up at him. Had the gun pointed right at my head. I looked right into the barrel, saw the bullets in the cylinders. I was scared, and I opened the safe. He took the money and put it in a paper bag and dropped it into the basket. And he put you in the refrigerator, too, did he? Yeah, that is, he started to when he opened the door. The people in there were all shivering, flailing their arms around, trying to keep warm. It's a little room, not much bigger than this, and there wasn't much room to flail. Anyway, they asked him if he wouldn't let him out. He, he said no, but then he asked me if there was someplace else he could put him. And I, I told him that the only place I could think of was another storage room. We use it sometimes when we got a real big shipment of meat. Don't usually keep it under refrigeration. I see. They let you all go there, huh? Yeah, the darndest thing I ever saw. Fourteen of them. All fourteen herded them just like cattle. Moved them all to the other cooler. They were all so cold they'd have done anything to get out of that one. I tell you, officer, I was scared that one of them might try to be brave about it and cause trouble. I think that guy would have killed him right on the spot. Yes, sir. Well, what did he do then? Well, he locked the door... 
Then, from when I could see through the cooler window, he just strolled out of the store and down the street. He was still wheeling the basket in front of him. Anything, Frank? Yeah, Joe. I checked with Wheelock from the radio car. He said they canvassed the neighborhood, came up with a man who thinks he saw the bandit drive away. Was he able to give us any kind of a description on the car? No. Said he saw this guy walking down the street pushing a basket and thought it was kind of funny. Didn't pay too much attention to it. Saw him get into a late model Ford and drive away. Couldn't give a very good description of the car. Said it was a dark color. Not sure about the year. Uh, the guy still had that mask on? No. Didn't have the mask, but the fellow didn't notice anything about his face. Can't help us much there. He's going to come down and look for the mug books. Oh, that's good. Do you have any idea how much money was taken here, sir? Well, no, I can't tell you to the penny, but I figure about $3,500. You usually keep this much money on hand, do you? No, not as a rule. I didn't get to the bank yesterday. We had an inventory sale going on. I just didn't get the chance. Did the bandit take anything you think might uh, help us identify him? Anything from the safe that you might be able to describe? No, not a thing. Just the money. Of course, that's enough. There wasn't much in there. A wristwatch that was lost here in the store. He looked at that but threw it back into the safe. Was he wearing gloves, do you remember? Yeah, he was. Uh, looked like pigskin, sort of a light tan. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know what you're thinking about, fingerprints. Oh, with those gloves, he wouldn't leave any. Yes, sir. Say, officer. Yeah? You talked to the other officer that was here, the one in the car? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, he was kind of in charge of the people in the icebox, took care of them. Was any of them hurt? No, sir. Some of them were pretty cold, but they were all right. Yeah, we keep that box turned way down to sub-zero. Yes, sir. I wonder if, as police officers, you'd mind talking to those folks. They're all good customers here. I'd hate to lose them to Frenchy's Fine Foods down the street. Uh, where's that, sir? Uh, Frenchy's Market just down the street. He's going to make a big thing out of this. By noontime, it'll be all over the neighborhood. Well, I'm sure none of your customers will blame you, sir. Well, no, officer, it ain't exactly that. That Frenchy's going to make a big reputation on my back. Well, Mr. Scott, markets have been held up before. Yeah, but not with our motto. What's that? We freeze anything. a.m. Frank and I continued to talk to Arthur Scott. We questioned him about the actions of the holdup man, but he was unable to give us any new information. The crime lab came out and checked the store. The M.O. was the same. He'd entered through a rear window. Tool marks were found. Photographs were taken. No other physical evidence was found. 10.14 a.m. We drove back to the office and checked with Captain Didion. Three other teams of men were assigned to help us in interviewing the people who had been locked up in the refrigerator. None of them could add anything to what we already knew. Because of the age of the bandit and the smoothness with which he operated, we had a hunch that he might have served some time in a state prison. Frank and I checked out a trip car and drove up to Folsom Penitentiary. We checked with Warden Heinze and told him what we wanted. For the next two days, we checked the prison files. We got several possible leads, but when we got back to Los Angeles, none of them led anywhere. Tuesday, February 12th, 8.49 a.m. We checked with Captain Didion. Well, you come up with anything? No, not a thing, Skipper. We checked them all out. Nothing. How much longer do you figure it's going to take you to come up with something we can use? We're doing everything we can. We've run down every lead. They all go nowhere. Yeah, I know. I've been telling the corner pocket that all month. It doesn't prove a thing, and they aren't buying it anymore. Well, Frank and I got an idea, Skipper. It's kind of wild, but I might turn it. Well, let's hear it. Well, if you take a look at the map over here. In the last two months, he's hit seven places here. Here... Through here and up and through here. Not much of a pattern, but maybe there's enough to work on here. Mm-hmm. From the way he's worked in the past, he's going to be waiting in the stores when the manager comes in. So the problem is to find some way to check the managers after they first get to the stores. So? Well, so most of the stores open about 8 o'clock. Now, from what we've been able to check out, the managers get in about, oh, 6.30 to 7. We make arrangements for them to call the office after they're in the stores, and they've checked them through. How are you going to work the calling? Well, Frank and I figured that if we could stagger the call so we'd get 